Aspetta. Sì, ok, Bruno. Bruno, vai. Sì. Perfetto, sì. Benissimo. Bene.
Va bene, ci vediamo. Sì. Vai. Cinese, vabbè, andiamo in inglese. Inglese. Va bene. Andiamo a Russia. Sì, sì, sono loro che stanno mandando. Sì, ok, grazie. Sì, il primo russo va bene. Bene. Sì, la banca francese. Sì. Sì, alla fai, da là passa subito al C, facciamo cinese e inglese. Dammi un secondo, tu vai nel cinese, io cambio segnale. So qua.
Gimana? Sí. Sí. Okay, look, the uh, I don't know, you know, the uh, this milk place. Yeah. Big noise, big noise. It's really disturbing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We'll try. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Slightly, slightly better. Yeah, can you ask the people in the milk place not not to shout? Can you request people to keep silent for just a moment? Please request the people not to shout. In the milk place, don't talk, please. During the uh, the during the show. Shumma, back out. Ah, slightly, slightly improved, brother. Okay. But the but the noise master is still. Up to today, ah, ah, hey, I want to talk about something. Yeah, Emun, boy, yesterday hard work too. Today, all the people are asleep. But tomorrow, it will not happen. 
today 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 is market day but on elements yeah. there will be no noise today is market day in this in this place yeah. but sajal you can you, you can request and you can keep two person in two side just just mm -hmm. for just for 5 minutes or 10 minutes when you start uh, okay okay i mean ranjit da ebong arjit ke set korchi ora ie korchi apke rakhte chilo okay boron boron shuru kore na sorry yes slightly improved Yeah. Is it my calendar? Yeah, it's on the calendar starting from 8:30. Hello, shunte pachche shobai? बोलें ओके Uh, uh, there's, okay. there's, there's a separate room, so we are okay. uh, we'll communicate okay. from here. Wow. Okay. Oh, great. Uh, you'll be later. Uh, please take off your mask. Oh, so sure, exactly, sure. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay. And are you ready? And uh, Imanun. Yes, Taka. Okay. Uh, Shaha, Shanas, Shanas, are you ready? Yes, yes, I'm ready. Yes, I'm ready. Can you hear Shanas. me now? Yes, I'm ready. Can you I hear, can hear me? you? You can't hear me. Hello, hello. Shanas, I hello? cannot hear you. Uh, please select the English channel. Yeah. Shanas. Shanas. Ah, okay. 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 Yes. Um, I'm okay. here. I'm Bob. ready. Yeah. Bob, we have to switch to English. Oh, probably the translation to English. <coughs> okay, yes. uh, Chokwad, are you ready? Chokwad, hi. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, I am ready okay. because I have to move here and there two, three places. Okay, so Chokwad, uh, you you can hear the uh, uh, Shana's. Yes, uh, Shanas can hear oh. the uh, floor as yes, well I as can uh, hear. In the APRC, yeah. APRC, uh, and, link. Uh, you you are linked to the APRC link is uh, all set. All set. APRC. One of my colleagues is uh, checking APRC. He can hear only Shanas okay. language. Okay. okay, I don't see the uh, the people from the the, uh, the field, uh, government side. Re what's his name? The Reza. Yeah, we don't see only we see the only pumpkin is coming in, but uh, uh, well, yes, they 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 are they are trying to connect uh, uh, because uh, somebody was confused. Uh, the, is there any new password or new link? No, no, no. So we have communicated. 
Who we told Taka, former me. information, you are working in English channel only? Yes, I'm mean working on English channel only now. Yeah, that's why it is okay. Takar, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, I think it is all set. Okay. But I don't see the uh, the government, the farmers. I don't see government farmers. Yeah, uh, 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 I'm going to link Russian. Only pumpkin plus is there. Okay. Uh, uh, from Cholan. The first item no. is okay. Huh. Way, it may not be pumpkin, it's potato field in Mita Mita Bogor, Bill him. I saw. No, not... is there in pumpkin it's plus? You, you just see the name. Mr. Najmul is there. Pumpkin plus. Okay, excellent. The, the, there is uh, Cholan actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw. I saw. Hmm. Hope other will come. Uh, Shariful PD, that is from uh, Dohar. From uh, Black Bengal Gold, okay. I sent a link again to Kamala Ranjan Das. Okay, sir. okay, okay. That would yeah, be better uh, because over, 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 Anand, just in case, uh, are you ready for the, the old video of the, the government? Uh, yes. Just like I have all this. Good morning, everybody from Indonesia, Irawan. Or a problem, I said. Totokon, that's it. Ivanen. Yeah. Is government five places ready or not yet? I saw only pumpkin plus. You you see only a pumpkin plus. And and goat also joined, which is very full. Hello. How's it going? So two sides joined. Good morning, all. Reza, can you can you confirm the visibility with fog? Is it okay for showing? Yeah, Papa, plus I can. We can hear you well. Acha, apni ki online ashchen? Jungle ke? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Go to go to go go to go to where itai idhar duken. Go to itai. I go to itai dukse. Can you see the visibility because? I was afraid. Yeah, okay. It's okay, uh, Mr. Rajmul. Apnar chubi dakhe yes. jachche, so so apni thik achche. Apni apni nishche to thakar. That's good. Thank you, Mr. Reza. Yes. What is your plan? We don't have the uh, all farmers in the uh, Zoom. What is your plan? Uh, actually, we have we'll start with uh, pumpkin uh, uh, cholen, and then we'll go for. Uh, uh, flower and uh, flower is already uh, i have contacted with them and they are uh, uh, trying to connect okay and, okay, uh, and we, see the we, goats. We, we, we see goats we see get uh, whatever is uh, okay that will go with this uh, uh, that that slot okay although although we have making made a uh, cereal but we can rearrange if there is any problem to correct
Taka, uh, uh, any 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 suggestion from you? Okay, uh, we have a plan B. Okay, if you okay. cannot, if you don't have the uh, farmers, we have then a video we, we have, to play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we have a video okay. to play. We have video. Just okay. Reza, Mr. Reza, relax, yes. relax, relax. I am relaxed. Okay, and <laughs> and I should talk slowly. Yeah, as your as your suggestion. I understand. Okay, the, <laughs> this is the flow. Okay, this is the flow. Slowly, Bob. Slowly. Okay. okay, Bob Robert Simpson will start. Okay. okay, Robert Simpson will start. We will play FAO video first. Mm -hmm. Then three places. We will show three places. Mm -hmm. Okay, after three, three places, a board. Go to, go to please three, hey? go to please three. pass the, uh, the floor okay, to okay. the uh, uh, government. It, uh, up to the end. So, so we don't, we show the, I show the video, right? I announced the video, two minute video. You announced the, you announced the video and the Imanu will play the video. Okay. And then after that, I pass the floor to government. No, uh, after three places, we done MMI, then pass to the government. And, and who will uh, pass to us? Rob, Boba, uh, Robert. Uh, I, Robert, I will, Robert will pass after completion FAO video, then uh, Not the video, will, FAO three places. If you, if you if FAO material, then we'll start after robot. Uh, link. Uh, robot will give you the cue. Robot okay, will cue, cue that uh, you you start. Okay. And then, okay, we'll see. Let's roll the uh, show card. Show card, please. Yes, yes. Yes, and uh, um, who will be spotting light from our side? Maybe I. You, okay, please spot light. Okay. Uh -huh. Spot, spot light, light only the speaker view. Only the speaker, I, I will spot light. Okay, yes. So, yeah, all the, Mr. Simpson, all, uh, you just, you, Mr. Simpson, you need to speak in English channel. Who? Am I Robert not in the English Simpson channel right to now? To speak in the English channel. Okay, so am I now in the English channel? In canals and water body, we are retaining rainwater, so there is no shortage Now you can hear water. Mr. Simpson. Life you can hear me now. now. Testing, testing. This change in coastal agriculture is very promising. Okay. Chokat, the order of the FAO is first Simpson. Then video, then daily corp, then potato, then fish. So, wait a minute, video will play who? who will play by, the video? By Imanun. Okay, okay, then I will spotlight the video. That is my job only. Yes, and then daily corp, then potato, then fish. Then again, robot. Then government. And I don't know the order of the, the government. Maybe pumpkin, pumpkin plus will be the first. Yeah, I gave the sequence to show goodbye. The same mail I gave to you. So, yeah. Oops. Okay. The last thing, please, everybody mute if you are not speaking, but uh, unmute when you start speaking. Okay. Pro Santa, please mute. Yes, okay. I should be ready in one minute. One minute, okay. Okay, now show cut.
What's on? Bob, let's start. We on, we're live. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome everyone to this virtual tour. We welcome you from around Bangladesh, from around the region, and from around the world. We will see today a virtual tour of some wonderful examples of innovation that are helping farmers and producer organizations around the country to produce more, to use better practices, and certainly to innovate and adapt digital technologies to help them connect better to the world and the productivity and the markets around them. We will see experiences from around Bangladesh, uh, one, several from FAO through the Missing Middle Initiative. And this is an initiative to help smallholder farmers connect better to all the markets, access credit, uh, and access digital resources to help them produce better and make more profit and act on businesses that are much more sustainable. We'll also see a number of sites organized by the Ministry of Agriculture. So as we begin, we'll have a short uh, scene setting video uh, on the producer organizations to help set the scene and get our show started today. Fukadamon, Dan Kibabe, Kumbis de Lebalo Hobe, Shop Zibagan Kibabe for resource of Tobe, Fasha Fasha Robaza, Zakoron Shomon de Darona de Taki, Masai de Shikore, Ogular Zonam, Mander Casse Ashe, Builder Help for it. So we can connect farmers in real time to extension services to market pricing, and also connect them to markets. This is an excellent opportunity to scale up the Digital Village Initiative to help address some of the nutrition security issues in the country, as well as food security challenges. Excellent, and thank you for that wonderful video. I hope you have a short context of how we're going to get started today. Now let's get moving to the field so we can get a great taste of the great results that we have from working directly with the producer organizations, ensuring their access to digital solutions. Thanks. Welcome, I am Asaduz Jaman Shajal, now connecting you from the Digital Village Service Center, of the, which is operated by the Lahiri Monko Dairy Cooperative. This digital center began at the onset of COVID-19 as a virtual call center to increase connectivity, market access, and information services. Now, this center, is the heart of all business and commercial activities of the villagers. Let us hear a testimony from the village center operator, Prashanto, a rural youth and member of this cooperative. Prashanto, please tell us how you operate this center and what services you provide to the villagers. 
আমি আইসিটি কোশিশ করি কিছু ব্যবসা সংক্রান্ত তথ্য এবং প্রদান এবং ব্যবসা পরিকল্পনা করতে সাহায্য করি যেটা আমি সুস্থ ও গান্তি কৃষকদের ব্যাংকের সাথে সংযোগ করব এবং এই সূত্রে তাদের সুস্থ করণ করব বিষয়ে সহায়তা So I provide businesses with ICT training and I also provide training on agribusiness information, business planning support, and I also assist the small Thank you, Professor. Let me uh, introduce you to Piyonti, a student of local college. She is receiving ICT training from this center. Piyonti, please tell us what are you learning here? So I have uh, previously I had no idea about computers, but now I have received training on basic computer skill, and I have learned about Microsoft Windows, internet use, and multimedia softwares like PowerPoint and Illustrator. So you know that there are many industries are in this area who need IC to operators, and if I can complete this training, then I will be able to join. In addition to their thriving business center, this top. Cooperative has been producing high quality clarified data and selling it to large buyers like HCI, Tan, Food Village, and many urban sweet meat shops, all with the support of this digital village service center. Like this center, producers' organization have established 55 digital centers countrywide for selling their produces and buying imports. As of today, they have received 150,000 calls for marketing their products buying inputs and advisory services. Collectively, they have sold produces of 900,000 US dollar and procured inputs of 140,000 US dollar. Now, I would like to show you the clarified butter factory, which is situated at the opposite of this center. Now, you can see this signboard of this producer's property limited this is their deep type and part of the thing center and you can see the can full of clarified water and they are ready to sell now we are entering into the the clarified water processing unit you can see they are preparing for heating the collected stream to convert it into clarified water and Butter of this cooperative is accredited by Bangladesh Standard Testing Institute (BSTI). This is all from the Lahiri Bangladesh Dairy Cooperative. Now I would like to connect you with the Moksha so Bhai. I would like to connect you with the potato field. Uh, over to Moksha Bhai, please. Now. So over to Moksha Bhai. Welcome. So I am Moksidul Hawk. I am a potato grower from the northern region. So we are producing successfully uh, potatoes after using the rural infest toolkit. And we have already prepared our business plan for potato production. We are connected with exporters through our digital village service center. So the FUMMI project, Department of Agricultural Extension, BADC, potato exporters provided us training on good agricultural practices so that we can produce export quality potatoes. Last year, our exporter partners gave us potato seeds. The variety is Santana variety. And this year, we will export 450 metric ton of this variety, bringing our export to total more than 1,500 metric ton. Let me introduce you to our digital uh, center operator helping us sell potatoes to exporters. So I'm introducing you to Salma Akhtar. She is uh, helping us to sell potatoes. So, I receive order from the exporters and I receive order online and I decide the highest price for the potatoes and we uh, produce quality potatoes and we prepare the potatoes for the exporters and here you can see we have five kilo potato set that we prepared with the quality potatoes we then make our uh, financial transaction digitally via mobile wallet and online transfer and we are very happy to let you know that many women potato growers are working in this sector, they are now getting very fair price through our virtual center. Before the establishment of our digital center, they did not uh, even think about it. And now they are getting good services. Uh, so, thank you.
আমি পলাশ চন্দ্র দাস দুই তিন বছর আগে then we set up our own self zone for the fishes and we prepared our uh, prepared our field, prepared our water body for brood fishes and now we have increased our production and productivity and we are making a good profit we have also established a community mini feed mill and also established hatcheries now our production costs have reduced by at least 10% using the digital village service center we are now selling fish and finger lines Thank you. Excellent, fantastic work. We're very proud to see all of this uh, being conducted and working so smoothly. We've seen live now how uh, both the business center, uh, farmers producing milk products, uh, potato farmers and fish farmers, all using these innovative ideas of the digital village to support the producer organizations to connect with farmers and our upstream services and downstream services, input dealers, digital services, extension services, and of course, buyers and markets. They have received the services and the information they need to move their farms from uh, previously unsustainable uh, context to profitable businesses. Now we'll move over to our colleagues at the Ministry of Agriculture, Mr. Riza, for additional uh, field visit viewing. Mr. Riza, over to you. Uh, thank you all. Amra Akun Bangladesh, Prishi Ketreje Shafulu Gathagulu Ase, She Gathagulu, Akade Shamnetu de Tarachesta Kurbu, Amra Janije Bangladesh, Prishi Ketreje of Burguti, Shiti Shapule Jana, Ekatu Shale, Amra Japun, Shatino to Junpuri, Tokuni Desh Tichilu, Katu Hakir Desh, Kitu Gotu Ponjas Botchuri, Akunamra Katu Padure, Lukuni of Burguti Pesi, Bangladesh, Prishi Akun Kurpush, Prishi Tate, Banije, Prishi, Potija Prashu. কৃষি রেজে অগ্রগতি তা কিছু কৃষক বিজ্ঞানী সম্প্রসারণ করবে এবং সর্বস্তরের মানুষের চেষ্টা উৎপাদন বেড়েছে দানা শস্যের উৎপাদন বেড়েছে শাকসবজি প্রতি ইঞ্চি জমি ব্যবহৃত হচ্ছে ফসল উৎপাদনের কাজে চরাঞ্চলে জলাভূমিতে উপকূলে বা সমুদ্রে কৃষি উৎপাদন এসেছে মাছ উৎপাদন প্রাণী সম্পদ পালন সকল ক্ষেত্রে রয়েছে আপনাদের সামনে তুলে ধরব আমরা প্রথমে একটু দেখে নেব উত্তরবঙ্গের জেলা রংপুরে কিভাবে চরাঞ্চলে কৃষকরা কাজ করছেন এবং সবুজের বন্যা বইয়ে দিয়েছেন সেই শুধু মরুভূমি চলুন আমরা দেখে নিই সেখানে Najmul bhai, apni ki upasthapun korbe na apnar shei shafolatar golpo. We are trying to connect Najmul. Thank you very much, Sadeja bhai. I am connecting uh, audience, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, so from the foothill of the Himalayas, from 200 kilometers in this direction in north, we are doing. This is the direction the in north where we are cultivating different sort of uh, different sort of vegetables. Of this is the chore and area, we and there are some areas where it is not even possible to grow grass. One such area is Tista Chore. This is the Tista Chore of Kamla Ujjala. Farmers have been cultivating sweet pumpkins in the area for more than a decade. This is the innovative method and the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute and the Department of Agriculture. Extension and, and they are also fighting against un, uh, unemployment problem as well as now they can account. produce different sort of crops here. Some farmers are cultivating potatoes or potatoes on Indians and other, uh, and other types of vegetables. And we have started with how to help them help themselves. 
and we are always trying to help them and we are going to figure out that how we can help the farmers of this area and how we can, we can design a sustainable agricultural system. So right now, for 2,000 farmers are working in this area and recently our company is working closely with the farmers so that we can improve the traditional agricultural system and we are, uh, we are giving them training and, and train them as and a future are, leader to and stop we are training them as a future leader. On an average, 35,000 metric ton production we have uh, 35,000 metric ton supplying crops and we are supplying a lot of crops Most um, importantly, to the nationally and internationally. We are also getting benefits from the Rohingya community as they are also working in this area. And, September, uh, with bulk um, amount of stuff like 30 to 60 metric ton per day. It's, the innovation is generating so over the innovation is generating uh, over 3,000 uh, meals for and the household growers and supplying nationally and internationally for the million of consumers right now. It is right now. directly hitting 10 it is directly out of 17 SDGs goals in different ways. Uh, and, the policy and the policy implication is huge. In Bangladesh, we have 3,000 square kilometer transitional land and toll land, and in other regions, and toll land, and there are 3,000 square kilometers. So, in total, 6,000 kilometer transitional land could be brought under cultivation uh, for so new generation products and farming system to address the food security need in 2050 and beyond 2050. We don't think there is a huge uh, challenge. Yes. We, want to, we, we want to conclude it. Uh, any farmer is there. Just, so uh, we, I, we I, can... I, am, I am just linking just, to my please. farmer. Or, yeah, please tell Tazin uh, Bhai. She just let us know that what was the previous condition. So previously we could not believe that it is possible, but now we are cultivating in this area. Our poverty has gone and the wholesaler are also buying vegetables from uh, us. So now we're producing a lot of different sort of vegetables and we are making a lot of profit. We are producing foods and I would like to tell you that uh, you supported us and that's why now we can cultivate in this uh, area and we can also export our food outside, uh, outside of our Thank country. You. So he's, Thank you. So he's telling they have started to feeding the world and in future so the land has fallen. The it could be under cultivation they are cultivating and more population sort of in their area and more and consumers more will be targeted and area, will be fed by the community and by their delegation so and community. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you Good morning from Flower Heaven. I'm a good morning and more than one my husband has been disabled since 2000. At that time, I had to run the family. I have benefited a lot by cultivating these flowers. My children are now studying. I have already put some money in the bank. I have already built my house. 
সকালে আমাদের ফুলের মার্কেটে অনেক ভিড় ফুল এখানে সংগ্রহ করে এখানে স্থানীয় বাই ফ্লাওয়ার বিক্রি করার জন্য তারা উইল কাল এন্ড উইল বাই ফ্রম হেয়ার এন্ড দে উইল এবং বলে রাখা ভালো এই বছরে দা লোকাল মার্কেট অলরেডি 2 লক্ষ টাকা অর্থাৎ 2300 এন্ড হেয়ার ইউ ক্যান সি অ্যানাদার ফার্মার হু হ্যাজ অলরেডি আর দা টু লাখ টাকা দিস ইয়ার হেয়ার ইউ ক্যান সি দা হাজবেন্ড অফ आवर ফিমেল ফার্মার হু ইজ অলসো ওয়ার্কিং ইন দিস আমরা আশা করছি এখনো পারে ইউ ক্যান সি দা আদার ফার্মারস আর অলসো ওয়ার্কিং এন্ড উই আর হোপিং দ্যাট উই উইল আমাদের স্থানীয় মার্কেটে একদিন ধন্যবাদ মাসুদ আপনার এই চমৎকার উপস্থাপনার জন্য আপনি যে কথাটি বলেছেন এই ফুলের মতো জীবন হোক আমাদের সেখানকার মানুষের এবং এই ফুলের মতো সমৃদ্ধি আসুক আমাদের সামনের দিনগুলোতে আপনাকে ধন্যবাদ আমরা সকলের দৃষ্টি আকর্ষণ করছি এভাবে যে আমরা জানি যে আমাদের দক্ষিণাঞ্চলের কিছু কিছু অঞ্চল আছে যেখানে জলাবদ্ধতা ছিল এবং সেখান থেকে অনেক রকমের সংকট তৈরি হতো সেরকমই একটি উপজেলা হচ্ছে ডুমুরিয়া ডুমুরিয়া একসময় লবণাক্ত এলাকা ছিল জলাবদ্ধ এলাকা ছিল এবং সেখানে we had water and uh, problem and we uh, we had uh, saline water and we put the produce in crops in this area and we had to cut the lot but now we have prepared the fences and we are using the rain water and now we are cultivating different sort of rice and we are also uh, cultivating fish in this area and at the same time we are also cultivating high field vegetables like water and milk and milk and milk and other things now we have a massive change in agriculture let's hear the story from our farm we will hear her story so my name is asad and we are making a huge profit by producing uh, safe vegetables we are using the latest technologies and uh, the knowledge uh, of the asal lobonaktota bangladesh er samoshya na ba jolobodhota bangladesh er samoshya na e jolobodhota ebong lobonaktota is a problem in the world but we can overcome this situation and amader dumuri asha dekha jabe ebong amader produsthan to dumuri ana sara upokule anchole churiye porte amader madhye ebong bortoman sarkarer bibhinno podokrom korar phole ajke amader e dokkhin anchol ধন্যবাদ মোসাদ্দেক চমৎকার এই উপস্থাপনার জন্য এবং কৃষকরা যে সফল এবং তারা যে সন্তুষ্ট এটাই আমাদের সবচাইতে বড় গল্প সেখান থেকে আমরা কারিগরি কারণে হয়তোবা 
দাকো পে কৃষককে পাচ্ছি না আমরা একটি রেকর্ডেড ভিডিও দেখে দেব এই ক্ষেত্রে যেখানে লবণাক্ত সরিষার ধানের চাষ করা দ্যাটস হোয়াট দে আর ডুইং ইন দ্যাট এরিয়া আসসালামু আলাইকুম স্যার আমি খুলনা জেলা দাকো থানার কাটাই গ্রাম থেকে আমি ফ্রম দা খুলনা ডিস্ট্রিক্ট ফ্রম দা দাকো উপজেলা এন্ড হিয়ার ইউ ক্যান সি আমাদের এখানে শুকনো মৌসুমে জমি ও নদী এবং খালের পানিতে অতি মাত্রায় লবণ থাকার কারণে বর্ষাকালে আমরা একটিমাত্র আমন ধান কাপার সুরাপ জমি প্রতি থাকে এবং মাটি গরু ছাগল সরে বেড়াতো কিন্তু জমিতে লবণ অধিকার সাধন করে গরু ছাগল তেমন ঘাস পেতো না Sorry, cannot hear you. I think you're on mute. ধন্যবাদ আমরা এবার যাব গোপালগঞ্জে এবং বরিশালে আমরা জানি যে বাংলাদেশের কৃষির একটি ঐতিহ্য রয়েছে সেই ঐতিহ্য হচ্ছে ভাসমান কৃষির ঐতিহ্য যেখানে নিচু জমি জলমগ্ন জমি সেখানে কৃষকেরা জলজ আগাছা উদ্ভিদ সেগুলোকে দিয়ে ফসল উৎপাদন করতেন এবং সেটি কিন্তু একটি ঐতিহ্য হিসেবে স্বীকৃতি পেয়েছে আমরা এখন সেই বিষয়টি জানবো আমাদের যারা মাঠ পর্যায়ের কর্মী আছেন তাদের কাছ থেকে ডক্টর মহসিন এবং ডক্টর মাহাবুদ তারা নিজেরা আজকে উপস্থাপন করবেন এই ভাসমান কৃষির গল্পটি আমরা চলে যাচ্ছি তাদের কাছে ভাসমান কৃষি বাংলাদেশ 
বর্তমানে ভাসমান কৃষি নিয়ে অধিকতর গবেষণা চলছে এই গবেষণার আওতায় রয়েছে ফসলের বহুমুখীকরণ মান সম্পন্ন চারা উৎপাদন ভাসমান বেড়ে বিভিন্ন ধরনের সবজি ও মশলা জাতীয় ফসলের চিত্রে আপনারা এগুলো বিভিন্ন গবেষণা মাঠ দেখছেন এই চমৎকার চিত্রটি বলে দেয় এই কাজের সফলতা ও সম্ভাবনা বর্তমানে ভাসমান কৃষি দেশের দক্ষিণাঞ্চল সহ হাওড় এলাকা এবং অন্যান্য নিচু এলাকায় ছড়িয়ে পড়েছে কৃষকের প্রচলিত জ্ঞান বিজ্ঞানীদের হাতের ছোঁয়ায় হয়েছে আরো উন্নত আর সম্প্রসারণ করবিরা এটিকে নিয়ে গেছেন সারা দেশে ভাসমান বেড়ে রাসায়নিক সার ও কীটনাশকের ব্যবহার খুব কম করা হয় তবে পোকামাকুড়ের আক্রমণ দেখা দিলে তা জৈবিক পদ্ধতিতে দমন করা হয় তাই বলা যায় এই ফসল সম্পূর্ণ নিরাপদ প্রায় বিশ হাজার কৃষক পরিবার তিনশো তিন হাজার হেক্টর নিচু জমিতে এই পদ্ধতি ব্যবহার করছে আমরা এখন একজন কৃষকের সফল্য সাফল্য ভাষা শুনব মিস্টার আলামিন আপনার সাফল্য ভাষা তুলে ধরেন আমি একজন কৃষক আমি আগে বাসন বেড়ে আমরা নিচু অঞ্চলের জলভগ্ন এলাকা থেকে এখন ফসলে রূপান্তর করতে সক্ষম হয়েছি উদ্ভাবন বটে এটি আমাদের দক্ষিণাঞ্চলের জেলার বাইরে অন্যান্য জলভগ্ন এলাকাগুলোতে কিন্তু প্রাণী সম্পদের ক্ষেত্রে যাব আমরা জানি যে বাংলাদেশে ব্ল্যাক বেঙ্গল গোট এটা একটি চমৎকার জাত যেটি আমাদের প্রাণী সম্পদ পালনের ক্ষেত্রে ব্যবহৃত হয়ে থাকে আমরা এই প্রাণী সম্পদ পালনের ক্ষেত্রে ব্ল্যাক বেঙ্গল গোটের মাধ্যমে অনেকে কর্মসংস্থান করেছেন এবং অনেকে নিজেদের জীবনকে সমৃদ্ধ করেছেন আমাদের লাইফস্টক ডিপার্টমেন্ট মিনিস্ট্রি অফ লাইফস্টক এন্ড ফিশারিজ তারা এই নিয়ে কাজ করছেন আমরা সেই গল্পটি শুনতে চলে যাব ঢাকার দোহার উপজেলার একটি গ্রামে এবং সেখান থেকে উদ্যোক্তারা বলবেন তাদের ব্ল্যাক বেঙ্গল বোর্ড ইন দা লোকাল মার্কেটস এজ ওয়েল 
now we'll talk to Limon Hossein. So I never thought that I would wear boots. Later, when I started training, I thought that it was profitable. I received training, I received advices. Now I know it is profitable. Others are also learning from me. I'm helping them too. By raising Black Bengal boards, many young, enterprising, unemployed, and rural women have been able to find self-employment. As a result, many young entrepreneurs are now becoming prominent who have completely changed. Limon Hussain ki ek to dadiye kotha bolte pare na madher ke kaj baat diye. So can Limon Hussain speak with us clearly? I mean, yes. Uh, I will tell you my story. So previously, I never thought that I would be able to rear horse. Later, when I started rearing, I saw that it was really profitable. I received training then. I received advices from our officers. Now I know it is profitable. Others are also learning from me. And now I have many horse in my farms. I am also helping the farmers in my country by raising Black Bengal horse. Many young, enterprising, unemployed, and rural women have been able to find self and I am also selling my goods online. And now many unemployment people are also wearing Black Bengal goods, and I will hope that will change their life. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. So it is really true uh, that if we want to improve our agricultural sector or livestock sector, we are now focusing on digital agricultural system, and we are also focusing on uh, focusing on um, uh, focusing on train the smart entrepreneurs. So if we get more entrepreneurs in this sector, then we will be able to fulfill our target by 2030. And we also have a fission of 20441, and we are also targeting that fission as well. I would like to thank you. I would like to thank you on behalf of our colleagues as well. So now we'll see some videos. Now we'll see some videos and you will get some idea about the agricultural system of Bangladesh. You have already had the idea, but now I would like to show you some more video images. So um, it is not even possible to show you the whole pictures of our agricultural system within uh, in these small videos, but we will try our best to let you know about the progress of the agricultural sector. Bangladesh Dhan Gobeshana Institute, Bangladesh Paramanu Krishi Gobeshana Institute, Uddan Unnan Board, Tula Unnan Board, Beach Pruttan Agency, Iku Gobeshana Pratishthan, Motsho Unnan Corporation Shaho, Krishi Bhittik Bohu Pratishthan. Shomoy Dhara Bahi Kotae Unishu Chiyanubu Shale Bongo Bundu Kunna, Manunir Pruthan Muntri Shekha Sina, Pruthom Barer Moto Desh Puri Charanad Daito Gruhan Karen. Jatir Pita Rado Shre Tini Krishi Pavustar Unnane, Shorbati Guru Todin. Matro Pants Botchery, 
দেশ খাদ্য স্বয়ং সম্পূর্ণতা অর্জন করে দু সালে পুনরায় দেশ পরিচালনার দায়িত্ব গ্রহণ করে মাননীয় প্রধানমন্ত্রী শেখ হাসিনা কৃষির উন্নয়নে কৃষকের কল্যাণকে অগ্রাধিকার দেন মাননীয় প্রধানমন্ত্রীর দিক নির্দেশনায় কৃষকের হাতের নাগালে পৌঁছে দেয়া হয় সার জ্বালানি ও আধুনিক কৃষি সরঞ্জাম সহ প্রয়োজনীয় অন্যান্য উপাদান ফলশ্রুতিতে বাংলাদেশের কৃষি আজ বিস্ময়কর সাফল্যের ধারায় পরিচিত বাংলাদেশের অর্থনীতি সম্পূর্ণভাবে কৃষি নির্ভর কৃষিকে যান্ত্রিকীকরণ সেটা আমরা বিশেষভাবে প্রণোদনা দিচ্ছি এবং আমরা প্রায় পঞ্চাশ থেকে সত্তর শতাংশ উন্নয়ন সহায়তা দিয়ে রাজকৃত মূল্যে কৃষকরা যাতে এই সমস্ত যন্ত্রপাতি প্রয়োগ করতে পারে তার ব্যবস্থা আমরা করে যাচ্ছি মাননীয় প্রধানমন্ত্রীর দিক নির্দেশনায় কৃষি মন্ত্রণালয় দুর্বার গতিতে এগিয়ে নিচ্ছে বাংলাদেশের কৃষিকে বাংলাদেশ কৃষি গবেষণা কাউন্সিল বিএআরসি নেতৃত্বে নার্সভুক্ত প্রতিষ্ঠানগুলো অর্জন করেছে উল্লেখযোগ্য সাফল্য বাংলাদেশ কৃষি উন্নয়ন কর্পোরেশন দু হাজার নয় দশ থেকে দু হাজার বিশ একুশ পর্যন্ত প্রায় পনেরো লক্ষ মেট্রিক টন বীজ কৃষক পর্যায়ে সরবরাহ করেছে এ সময় সার বিদ্যুৎ ও ইক্ষু ইত্যাদি খাতে ভর্তুকি দেওয়া হয়েছে প্রায় তিরাশি হাজার কোটি টাকা বর্তমান সরকার ক্ষমতায় এসে সারের মূল্য ব্যাপকভাবে কমানো হয় বিশেষ করে ডিএপি সারের মূল্য দুই দবায় কমিয়ে কেজি প্রতি নব্বই টাকা থেকে ষোলো টাকা করা হয় আন্তর্জাতিক বাজারে এই সারের দাম অনেক বেশি কৃষিতে প্রতি বছর দেওয়া হচ্ছে প্রায় দশ হাজার কোটি টাকার ভর্তুকি ও প্রণোদনা খাল পুনর্খনন সেচ নালা স্থাপন রাবার ড্যাম নির্মাণ ও সৌর বিদ্যুৎ চালিত পাম্প স্থাপনের মাধ্যমে কৃষিতে সেচ সুবিধা বাড়ানো হয়েছে বাংলাদেশ কৃষি গবেষণা ইনস্টিটিউট নিরলসভাবে গবেষণা চালিয়ে যাচ্ছে গ্রীষ্মকালীন পেঁয়াজ সামার টমেটো নানা শাক সবজি ও ফলমূল সহ নানা ফসলের নতুন নতুন জাত উদ্ভাবন কৃষিতে অনন্য সংযোজন খরা বন্যার মতো প্রাকৃতিক দুর্যোগেও কৃষকের এখন আহাজারি নেই গত বারো বছরে বৈরী পরিবেশ সহনশীল ও উচ্চ ফলনশীল অসংখ্য জাত উদ্ভাবিত হয়েছে বঙ্গবন্ধুর জন্মশত বার্ষিকীতে বাংলাদেশ ধান গবেষণা ইনস্টিটিউট কর্তৃক উদ্ভাবিত হয়েছে উচ্চমাত্রার জিং সমৃদ্ধ বঙ্গবন্ধু ধান ব্রি একশো বাংলাদেশ পরমাণু কৃষি গবেষণা ইনস্টিটিউট আঠারোটি গুরুত্বপূর্ণ ফসলের মোট একশো বারোটি উচ্চ ফলনশীল জাত উদ্ভাবন করেছে দু হাজার সালে প্রতিষ্ঠিত গম ও ভুট্টা ইনস্টিটিউট মাত্র তিন বছরে ভুট্টার তিনটি জাত সহ উদ্ভাবন করেছে ব্লাস্ট প্রতিরোধী গমের নতুন জাত খোরপোষের কৃষিকে বাণিজ্যিকীকরণের লক্ষ্যে কৃষি সম্প্রসারণ অধিদপ্তর গবেষণা লব্ধ কলা কৌশল মাঠ পর্যায়ে কৃষকের কাছে নিরন্তর পৌঁছে দিচ্ছে শুরু হয়েছে সমলয় ভিত্তিতে চাষাবাদ কৃষি হয়ে উঠেছে রাষ্ট্রের নির্ভরযোগ্য খাত করোনাকালে মাননীয় প্রধানমন্ত্রীর নির্দেশনায় বীর মুক্তিযোদ্ধা ও বিশিষ্ট কৃষি বিজ্ঞানী মাননীয় কৃষি মন্ত্রী ড আব্দুর রাজাকের সাহসী নেতৃত্বে বড় মৌসুমে সারা দেশ থেকে কম্বাইন্ড হার্ভেস্টার এনে হাওড়ের ফসল সময়মতো ঘরে তোলা সম্ভব হয়েছে এ সময় কৃষকের পাশে দাঁড়িয়েছে স্থানীয় আওয়ামী লীগ যুবলীগ ছাত্রলীগ কৃষক লীগের নেতাকর্মী মাননীয় প্রধানমন্ত্রী উনি বারবারই বলেন যে আমার উপকূলবর্তী এলাকা এগুলোকে তোমরা চাষাবাদের এটাই হলো আমাদের জন্য এখন চ্যালেঞ্জ সতেরো কোটি মানুষ প্রায় প্রতি বছর বিশ থেকে চব্বিশ পঁচিশ লক্ষ মানুষ নতুন মুখ যুগ হচ্ছে এদেরকে তো উৎপাদন না বাড়াইলে আমরা খাবার দিব কোথায় থেকে উৎপাদন তো বাড়াতে হবে এবং উৎপাদন বাড়ানোর সবচেয়ে বড় সম্ভাবনা এখন যেটা হলো উপকূলবর্তী এলাকা এখানে অনেক সুযোগ রয়েছে আধুনিক কৃষি যন্ত্র ব্যবহারে বাংলাদেশ আজ এক স্বপ্নের নতুন কৃষি যুগে প্রবেশ করেছে কৃষি যান্ত্রিকীকরণের উপর নেওয়া হয়েছে বৃহৎ প্রকল্প বিভিন্ন কৌশলের মাধ্যমে গম ভুট্টা সূর্যমুখী শাক সবজি সহ নানা ফসলের আবাদে লবণাক্ত এলাকার এক ফসলের জমি এখন তিন ফসলের জমিতে পরিণত হচ্ছে ঘেরে তরমু চাষের সাফল্য আশাবাদী করছে কৃষককে পাহাড়ি এলাকা সহ দেশের উপযুক্ত এলাকায় চলছে কফি ও কাজু বাদাম চাষ ড্রাগন স্ট্রবেরি অ্যাভাকোডা সহ নানা বিদেশি ফলের চাষও শুরু হয়েছে সারা দেশে কৃষকের বাজারের মাধ্যমে শুরু হয়েছে নিরাপদ কৃষি পণ্যের বাজার নেয়া হয়েছে পারিবারিক পুষ্টি বাগান নিরাপদ সবজি উৎপাদন সহ অনেক গুরুত্বপূর্ণ প্রকল্প 
বাংলাদেশের কৃষি পণ্য দেশের চাহিদা মিটিয়ে এখন ইউরোপ আমেরিকা সহ একশো চুয়াল্লিশটি দেশে রপ্তানি হচ্ছে একই সাথে বেড়েছে চা জুস জ্যাম জেলি ও শাক সবজি ফলমূল সহ বিভিন্ন পণ্যের রপ্তানি কৃষি সেবাকে কৃষকের হাতের নাগালে পৌঁছে দিতে কৃষি বাতায়ন অনলাইনে সার সুপারিশ সহ নানা তথ্য প্রযুক্তিগত বিভিন্ন সুযোগ চালু করা হয়েছে বাংলাদেশের ভাসমান চাষাবাদ পদ্ধতি এখন বিশ্ব ঐতিহ্য হিসেবে স্বীকৃত পটুয়াখালীর দশমিনা উপজেলায় গড়ে উঠেছে দেশের বৃহত্তম বীজ বর্ধন খামার বৃহত্তর রংপুরের কুড়িগ্রামে দুই হাজার মেট্রিক টন ধারণ ক্ষমতা সম্পন্ন বীজ আলু হিমাগার ও এক হাজার মেট্রিক টন ধারণ ক্ষমতা সম্পন্ন ডিহিউমিডিফাইড নির্মাণ করা হয়েছে দু হাজার আট নয় অর্থ বছরে মোট খাদ্য শস্যের উৎপাদন ছিল তিন কোটি আঠাশ লক্ষ ছিয়ানব্বই হাজার মেট্রিক টন দু হাজার বিশ একুশ অর্থ বছরে তা বেড়ে চার কোটি পঞ্চান্ন লক্ষ পাঁচ হাজার মেট্রিক টন হয় দু হাজার আট নয় এবং দু হাজার বিশ একুশ অর্থ বছরে চাল গম ভুট্টা আলু ডাল তেল বীজ ও সবজি উৎপাদনের প্রবৃদ্ধি যথাক্রমে তেইশ পঁয়তাল্লিশ সাতশো পঁচাত্তর একশো এক তিনশো পঁচাত্তর একাশি ও পাঁচশো আটাত্তর শতাংশ বর্তমানে বাংলাদেশ বিশ্বে সবজি উৎপাদনে তৃতীয় পাট উৎপাদনে দ্বিতীয় চা উৎপাদনে চতুর্থ এবং আলু ও আম উৎপাদনে সপ্তম স্থানে রয়েছে বাংলাদেশের আম প্রবেশ করেছে বিশ্ববাজারে চালু হয়েছে ম্যাঙ্গো ট্রেন করোনাকালেও ইন্দোনেশিয়াকে পেছনে ফেলে ধান উৎপাদনে বিশ্বে বাংলাদেশের অবস্থান এখন তৃতীয় মাননীয় প্রধানমন্ত্রীর নির্দেশনায় কৃষি মন্ত্রণালয়ের তৎপরতায় পেঁয়াজ উৎপাদনে বিশ্বে এবছর বাংলাদেশ যুক্তরাষ্ট্রকে পেছনে ফেলে তৃতীয় অবস্থান অর্জন করেছে এভাবে সরকারের সময়োপযোগী সিদ্ধান্ত এবং নিরন্তর গবেষণা ও সম্প্রসারণের মাধ্যমে এগিয়ে চলেছে বাংলাদেশের চিরসবুজ কৃষি খাদ মানুষের মৌলিক অধিকারের প্রথমে রয়েছে খাদ্য উনিশশো সালে দেশ বিভাগের পর উনিশশো সালে বঙ্গবন্ধু শেখ মুজিবুর রহমান তৎকালীন প্রাদেশিক সরকারের কৃষি ও বনমন্ত্রী হিসেবে দায়িত্ব গ্রহণ করেন কৃষি ব্যবস্থাপনার উন্নয়নে অনেক স্বপ্ন ছিল তার উনিশশো সালে কৃষি ও খাদ্য মন্ত্রণালয়ের অধীনে সিভিল সাপ্লাই অবয়বে এদেশে খাদ্য বিভাগ চালু হয় স্বাধীনতার পর উনিশশো সালে প্রতিষ্ঠিত হয় খাদ্য ও বেসামরিক সরবরাহ মন্ত্রণালয় দু হাজার বারো সালে স্বতন্ত্রভাবে প্রতিষ্ঠিত হয় খাদ্য মন্ত্রণালয় খাদ্য মন্ত্রণালয় পরিচালিত সামাজিক সুরক্ষা কর্মসূচির মধ্যে রয়েছে খাদ্য বান্ধব কর্মসূচি ও এম এস কর্মসূচি এল ই বা শ্রম বহুল প্রতিষ্ঠান রেশনিং বাস্তবায়ন খাদ্য বান্ধব ও ভিজিডি কর্মসূচিতে অতি দরিদ্র মানুষের মধ্যে পুষ্টি চাল বিতরণের মাধ্যমে অপুষ্টি দূরীকরণের কাজ চলছে খাদ্য মন্ত্রণালয় খাদ্য শস্য ও খাদ্য দ্রব্য পরিদর্শন বিশ্লেষণ এবং স্থানীয় পণ্যের গুণগত মান সংরক্ষণের মাধ্যমে পালন করে চলেছে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ দায়িত্ব ন্যায্য মূল্য নিশ্চিত করার লক্ষ্যে এখন ডিজিটাল পদ্ধতিতে খাদ্য শস্য সংগ্রহ করা হচ্ছে খাদ্যের গুণগত মান রক্ষায় আধুনিক পদ্ধতিতে খোলা আটা প্যাকেট জাত করে ও এম এস কর্মসূচিতে বিতরণ করা হচ্ছে বাজার দর নিয়ন্ত্রণের লক্ষ্যে নিয়মিত বাজার মনিটরিং ও প্রয়োজন অনুসারে খাদ্য শস্য আমদানি রপ্তানি করা হচ্ছে খাদ্য শস্যের ধারণ ক্ষমতা উন্নীত করতে আধুনিক সাইলো নির্মাণ ও খাদ্য ব্যবস্থাপনা প্রবর্তন করা হয়েছে নেওয়া হয়েছে নানা প্রকল্প এছাড়া দুর্যোগ প্রবণ এলাকায় খাদ্য নিরাপত্তা মজুদ করতে বিতরণ করা হচ্ছে পারিবারিক সাইলো খাদ্য শস্যের ধারণ ক্ষমতা উন্নীত করতে আধুনিক সাইলো নির্মাণ ও খাদ্য ব্যবস্থাপনা প্রবর্তন করা হয়েছে নেওয়া হয়েছে নানা প্রকল্প নিরাপদ খাদ্য আইন দু হাজার তেরোর আওতায় প্রতিষ্ঠিত হয়েছে বাংলাদেশ নিরাপদ খাদ্য কর্তৃপক্ষ নবসৃষ্ট এই প্রতিষ্ঠানটি খাদ্য পণ্যের গুণগত মান সংরক্ষণ পরিবীক্ষণ ও পরীক্ষা নিরীক্ষার মাধ্যমে জনগণের জন্য ভেজাল মুক্ত নিরাপদ খাবার নিশ্চিত করতে নিরলসভাবে কার্যক্রম চালিয়ে যাচ্ছে খাদ্যের নিরাপত্তা রক্ষায় পরিদর্শন নমুনা সংগ্রহ ও বিশ্লেষণের আলোকে প্রয়োজনীয় ব্যবস্থা গ্রহণ ভ্রাম্যমান আদালত ও ভ্রাম্যমান ল্যাবরেটরি প্ল্যান পরিচালনা সহ নিরাপদ খাদ্য বিষয়ে সৃষ্টির লক্ষ্যে পরিচালনা করা হচ্ছে নানান প্রচার প্রচারণা জাতিসংঘ ঘোষিত টেকসই উন্নয়ন অভিষ্ট লক্ষ্যমাত্রা এসডিজির সূচকে ক্ষুধা মুক্তি ও দারিদ্র অবসানের ঘোষণা দেওয়া হয়েছে খাদ্য নিরাপত্তা ও উন্নত পুষ্টিমান অর্জন এবং টেকসই কৃষির প্রসারে দেয়া হয়েছে বিশেষ গুরুত্ব মাননীয় প্রধানমন্ত্রী শেখ হাসিনার নির্দেশনায় 
এই মন্ত্রণালয়ে দারিদ্র ও ক্ষুধা দূরীকরণ ও পুষ্টি পরিস্থিতির উন্নয়ন এবং এসডিজি লক্ষ্যমাত্রা অর্জনের লক্ষ্যে নিরলস কাজ করে চলেছে যে বাংলাদেশে খাদ্য আমাদের ঘাটতি ছিল একশো মঙ্গা ছিল মঙ্গা পীড়িত এলাকা এবং আমাদের সুষ্ঠু খাদ্য বন্টনের নিমিত্তে মাননীয় প্রধানমন্ত্রী জন শেখ হাসিনার নেতৃত্বে এবং সুপরিকল্পনায় আমাদের কৃষি যেমন আমরা সাফল্য লাভ করেছি আমরা খাদ্য এখন স্বয়ং সম্পূর্ণতা লাভ করেছি আমরা চাই যে খাদ্য মন্ত্রণালয়কে একটি সফল এবং সৎ দুর্নীতিমুক্ত খাদ্য মন্ত্রণালয় তৈরি করার জন্য এবং আমরা আশা করি আমরা মজিব শতবর্ষে সেটাই উপহার দেবো মৎস্য ও প্রাণী সম্পদ মন্ত্রণালয়ের প্রচেষ্টায় গ্রামীণ জীবনে পোল্ট্রি এখন শিল্পের মর্যাদায় উত্তীর্ণ এছাড়া মাছে ভাতে বাঙালি শুধু প্রবাদ নয় হাজার বছরের ঐতিহ্য দীর্ঘদিন ধরে এদেশে মাছ ধরার নানা রীতি প্রচলিত রয়েছে স্বাধীনতার পর বন মৎস্য ও পশুপালন নামে কৃষি মন্ত্রণালয়ের একটি বিভাগ পরে স্বতন্ত্র মন্ত্রণালয়ে রূপান্তরিত হয় দু হাজার নয় সালে এর নামকরণ হয় মৎস্য ও প্রাণী সম্পদ মন্ত্রণালয়ে মন্ত্রণালয়ের অধীন সংস্থা ও দপ্তর মৎস্য অধিদপ্তর প্রাণী সম্পদ অধিদপ্তর বাংলাদেশ মৎস্য উন্নয়ন কর্পোরেশন বাংলাদেশ মৎস্য গবেষণা ইনস্টিটিউট বাংলাদেশ প্রাণী সম্পদ গবেষণা ইনস্টিটিউট বাংলাদেশ মেরিন ফিশারিজ একাডেমি এবং মৎস্য ও প্রাণী সম্পদ অধিদপ্তর প্রচলিত প্রথার বাইরেও বাংলাদেশ মৎস্য গবেষণা প্রতিষ্ঠান এ পর্যন্ত ষাটটি প্রযুক্তি উদ্ভাবন করেছে বাংলাদেশ প্রাণী সম্পদ গবেষণা প্রতিষ্ঠান প্রাণী সম্পদের উৎপাদন বৃদ্ধিতে উদ্ভাবন করেছে চৌষট্টিটি প্রযুক্তি ছাগল উৎপাদনে বাংলাদেশ এখন স্বয়ংসম্পন্ন ছাগলের দুধ উৎপাদনে বিশ্বে বাংলাদেশের অবস্থান দ্বিতীয় এবং ছাগলের সংখ্যা ও মাংস উৎপাদনে চতুর্থ পিঠা পানির মাছ উৎপাদনে বিশ্বে বাংলাদেশের অবস্থান তৃতীয় এবং মৎস্য উৎপাদনে পঞ্চম স্থানে রয়েছে ইলিশে গুড়ি ইলিশে গুড়ি ইলিশ মাছের ডিম বাংলাদেশের জাতীয় মাছ ইলিশ দু হাজার ষোলো সালে জিওগ্রাফিক্যাল ইন্ডিকেশন জি আই পণ্য হিসেবে স্বীকৃতি লাভ করেছে দু হাজার উনিশ বিশ অর্থ বছরে ইলিশ আহরণ করা হয়েছে মোট পাঁচ দশমিক তিন তিন লক্ষ মেট্রিক টন যা দেশের মোট মৎস্য উৎপাদনের এগারো দশমিক চার আট শতাংশ মৎস্য সম্পদের মান নিয়ন্ত্রণে আন্তর্জাতিক ভাবে স্বীকৃত তিনটি ল্যাবরেটরি রয়েছে নির্মাণাধীন রয়েছে আরো দশটি প্রাণী সম্পদের মান নিয়ন্ত্রণে আন্তর্জাতিক মান সম্পন্ন আধুনিক ল্যাবরেটরি নির্মাণ করা হয়েছে মাছের অপচয় রোধ সহ গুণগত মান রক্ষায় দেশের বিভিন্ন স্থানে নির্মাণ করা হয়েছে মৎস্য অবতরণ কেন্দ্র এছাড়া দেশের সীমান্তবর্তী অঞ্চল বিমান সমুদ্র এবং স্থলবন্দরে বিদেশ হতে আমদানিকৃত প্রাণী ও প্রাণীজাত খাদ্যের রোগ নিয়ন্ত্রণের লক্ষ্যে চব্বিশটি কোয়ারেন্টিন স্টেশন স্থাপন করা হয়েছে গত অর্থ বছরে মৎস্য ও মৎস্যজাত এবং প্রাণী ও প্রাণীজাত খাদ্য রপ্তানি করে আয় হয়েছে চার হাজার একশো পনেরো কোটি টাকারও বেশি এখাতের অপ্রচলিত পণ্য তথা কাঁকড়া কুচিয়া ইত্যাদি রপ্তানি করেও আয় হচ্ছে প্রচুর মৎস্য ও প্রাণী সম্পদ উপখাত থেকে সৃষ্টি হচ্ছে আত্মকর্মসংস্থান দূর হচ্ছে বেকারত্ব করোনাকালে উৎপাদক সরবরাহকারী ও কর্মকর্তাদের সমন্বয়ে বাজার রাখা হয়েছে স্থিতিশীল এতে খামারিরা তাদের উৎপাদিত পণ্যের ন্যায্য মূল্য পেয়েছে অন্যদিকে ভোক্তা তার দোর গোড়ায় পণ্য ক্রয় সমর্থ হয়েছে উনিশশো সালে বঙ্গবন্ধুকে সোভিয়েত ইউনিয়নের উপহার দেওয়া দশ উন্মোচিত হয় সুনীল অর্থনীতির এক বিরাট দিগন্ত নিয়মিত ভাবে সমুদ্রে জরিপ কাজ পরিচালনার মাধ্যমে সামুদ্রিক মৎস্য আহরণ করা হচ্ছে গভীর সমুদ্র থেকে আহরণ করা হচ্ছে টুনা মাছ সমুদ্র উপকূলে সি উইড এর চাষ সহ এর ব্যবহার বৃদ্ধিতে নানামুখী গবেষণা কার্যক্রম পরিচালনা করা হচ্ছে স্থাপিত হয়েছে সি উইড গবেষণাগার খুব শীঘ্রই 
মৎস্য ও প্রাণীজাত সম্পদ খাতে স্বনির্ভর হতে চলেছে বাংলাদেশ বঙ্গবন্ধু বলেছিলেন খাদ্য বলতে শুধু ধান চাল ভুট্টা গম নয় খাদ্য বলতে কিন্তু মাছ মাংস দুধ ডিম মাছ মাংস দুধ ডিমের উৎপাদন আমাদের যেমন বৈদেশিক মুদ্রা অর্জনে সহায়তা করছে আমাদের খাদ্যের চাহিদা মিটাচ্ছে পুষ্টির চাহিদা মিটাচ্ছে গ্রামীণ যে অর্থনীতি সেটাকে সবল রাখছে এবং যারা বেকার সেই বেকার মানুষরাও কিন্তু উদ্যোক্তা হয়ে এই সেক্টরের সঙ্গে নিজেদের সম্পৃক্ত করে বাংলাদেশের একটা অভাবনীয় পরিবর্তন নিয়ে আসছে উনিশশো সালে বাংলাদেশের জনসংখ্যা ছিল সাড়ে সাত কোটি বর্তমানে তা আড়াই গুণেরও বেশি বর্ধিত জনসংখ্যার আবাসন এবং শিল্প কলকারখানার প্রয়োজনে কৃষি জমি কমে গেলেও কৃষি বান্ধব সরকারের নানা পদক্ষেপে মাথা উঁচু রেখেছে বাংলাদেশের কৃষি বাংলাদেশ ইতোমধ্যে অধিক পরিকল্পনা একুশও প্রণয়ন করেছে এতে কৃষি খাতে জলবায়ু পরিবর্তনের প্রভাব মোকাবেলায় গ্রহণ করা হয়েছে কৌশলগত নীতি বঙ্গবন্ধুর জন্ম শতবর্ষ ও স্বাধীনতার সুবর্ণ জয়ন্তী উদযাপন কালে দেশের কৃষি খাতের মুকুটে যুক্ত হয়েছে গৌরবের অসংখ্য পালক মাননীয় প্রধানমন্ত্রী শেখ হাসিনার দূরদর্শী নেতৃত্বে চিরসবুজ বাংলাদেশের সোনালী কৃষি তাই আজ নতুন অহংকার মুজিব বর্ষের অঙ্গীকার কৃষি হবে দুর্বার মহান মুক্তিযুদ্ধে বিজয়ের পর স্বদেশ প্রত্যাবর্তন করে জাতির পিতা বঙ্গবন্ধু শেখ মুজিবুর রহমান অনুভব করেন ধ্বংসপ্রায় এই বাংলাদেশকে উন্নয়নের পথে নিতে হলে কৃষি উন্নয়নের কোনো বিকল্প নেই তাই দেশকে খাদ্য স্বয়ংসম্পূর্ণ করতে হাতে নেন বিভিন্ন পরিকল্পনা কিন্তু পঁচাত্তরে জাতির পিতা বঙ্গবন্ধুকে নৃশংসভাবে হত্যা করার পর বাংলাদেশের কৃষি উন্নয়ন মুখ থুবড়ে পড়ে পরবর্তীকালে বাংলার জনগণ তিন দফায় বঙ্গবন্ধু সুযোগ্য কন্যা শেখ হাসিনাকে প্রধানমন্ত্রী হিসেবে দেশ পরিচালনার ভার দেয় তিনি জনগণকে সাথে নিয়ে বঙ্গবন্ধুর খাদ্য স্বয়ংসম্পূর্ণ সোনার বাংলা গড়ার স্বপ্ন বাস্তবায়নে নিরলসভাবে কাজ করতে থাকেন সমগ্র দেশে খাদ্য নিরাপত্তা ও পারিবারিক পুষ্টি নিশ্চিত করার লক্ষ্যে অনাবাদি পতিত জমি গুড মর্নিং এভরিওয়ান এক্সেলেন্সিজ ডিস্টিংগুইস ডেলিগেটস লেডিজ এন্ড জেন্টলম্যান দোজ হু নিড টু টেক দ্য সিটস প্লিজ টেক ইউর সিটস অ্যান্ড উইল স্টার্ট ইন আ কাপল অফ মিনিটস Thank you very much for, to all of you, those who are here in the plenary hall today, and to those who are joining us online on Zoom. Of the Asia Pacific Regional Conference. And today is the day side event. Today, 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 today. Welcome to the second day of the APRC. Today we will have side events. You were just now following a wonderful virtual field trip and information, very interesting information about our host country, Bangladesh, on the advances that they have made in food production, food security, and many other fronts. There's also right now a physical field trip in progress around Dhaka and many of the delegates who are here in person have actually gone on that field trip. But we will now be starting off a series of side events, one after the other. The first one will be on the SID Solutions Forum, and that will be coming to us, conducted by our colleagues in the FAO sub-regional office in Apia, Samoa. That will be followed by an event on the Hand in Hand, FAO's flagship initiative. The, with that will be followed by four smaller and uh, regional uh, side events. The first one on the Asia Pacific Water Scarcity Initiative Program, then the International Year of Millets 2023, followed by the UN Decade of Family Farming, and then the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022. And these four events will be conducted by our colleagues in the regional office for Asia and the Pacific in Bangkok. So before we start off, uh, the usual instructions for Zoom, 
We're all very familiar with this, but it's always good to have this once again repeated for optimal sound quality, both for speaking and listening. Please use a plugged in headset if possible, and don't use the speaker in your computer. Please use an ethernet or a LAN connection instead of Wi-Fi so that you have a stable connection. Please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Of course, the, the managers of the Zoom call can also meet you if required. Please note there is no chat function available, but we will be sending messages from the secretariat if needed. When you're speaking, please remove your mask and replace it when you're finished speaking. But if you can speak with your mask and make yourself heard like I'm doing now, then please do so for the safety and health of everybody around you. In order to see the speaker in full screen, please remember to select speaker view instead of gallery view in the upper right corner of the Zoom screen. And to express appreciation, which is always a good thing of anyone's remarks, please use the clapping hands icon in the reactions button. We have simultaneous interpretation available in Chinese, French, and Russian. These are accessible on the interpretation button in the toolbar using the globe function. And that's also available here in the plenary hall through the equipment that's been provided to all the delegates. So with this short instructions and a few words on the etiquette on Zoom, we get started off on the first side event. And it's my pleasure to welcome Ms. Yang Jun Yao, sub-regional coordinator for FAO of the sub-regional office in Apian Samoa for the Pacific. Over to you, Ms. Yao. Uh, thank you very much, Shreda. I hope uh, you hear me and also see me well. Yeah, Your Excellencies, Honorable Governmental Senior Officials, Distinguished Guests and the Colleagues, very good morning, afternoon, and uh, evening. As introduced by Shreda, my name is Xiang Jun Yao, and I'm the FAO, uh, Sub-Regional Coordinator for uh, the Pacific Islands. Uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, side event titled uh, Seas Solutions Platform, Knowledge Sharing to Accelerate Achievements of the SDGs, Samoa Pathway and the Food System Summit Goals. Uh, with the COVID-19 adding on top of the unique challenges that uh, the Seas confront, I feel decided to create the Seas Solutions Platform in 2021 by the senior management team in HQ, as well as the decentralized offices, including the sub-regional office in the Pacific. So the aim of uh, the creation of the platform is to facilitate the knowledge sharing and accelerate progress for achieving the SDGs, the Samoa Pathway, and the Food System Summit goals for the seats. Uh, to launch the platform and also to start uh, facilitating the knowledge sharing among the seas, I feel in partnership with the government of Fiji as co-host and the International Telecommunication Union as a co-partner, organized the first Seed Solutions Forum on 30th and 31st August last year, 2021. The objectives of this side event are therefore to brief the APRC audience about the outcomes of this uh, very successful solutions forum in 2021, and also to engage the regional stakeholders over the implementation of the forum's recommendations, and also share knowledge on good innovation and the digital agricultural practices suitable for the seas among the APRC participants. So though with the very packed objectives as introduced above, we have only one hour with the full agenda of speakers, panelists, and also uh, we have the session uh, to hear the audience if you have questions uh, to uh, address to the panelists and also the speakers. To start uh, set the context, so please uh, let me ask the secretary to play the short video. Shreda, back to you, please. Small island developing states are characterized by remoteness, 
small and dispersed populations, and economies, as well as vulnerability to natural disasters linked to climate change. They depend on imported foods and tourism and have a high incidence of non-communicable diseases. The impacts of COVID-19 are intensifying these challenges and rolling back the gains that were made in achieving the sustainable development goals in these countries. It is within this context FAO created the SID Solutions Platform. The aim of the platform is to facilitate knowledge sharing and accelerate progress for achieving SDGs, specifically those related to agri-food systems, nutrition and the environment. The platform was launched during the SID Solutions Forum that was organized by FAO in partnership with the International Telecommunication Union and the government of Fiji as a co-host. The forum that was held on the 30th and 31st of August 2021 welcomed 1,600 people who attended either virtually or physically in Apia, Samoa. Twelve key action points were formulated based on the rich discussions of the two-day forum. They cover all of the most urgent steps that will lead to scaling up and replicating identified 2021 SID solutions to support the implementation of the agreements of the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Thank you, Secretary. Now, I have the pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Chu Dong Yu, FAO Director General, to deliver our welcome statement. Director General, the floor is yours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this event is especially important for me as it will highlight the centrality of innovation, science, and technology for the positive transformation agrophysics to be more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable. This event will build on the achievement of the Seed Solution Forum here in 2021, which launched the Seed Solution Platform that will be at the center of the today's discussion. There was a strong sign of a solidarity from non-seed government and the development partners who attended the forum and we needed to capitalize on that moment. The Seed Solution Platform is an important tool because it helps us address the common challenges such as remoteness, small and dispersed geographies, population and economies, high exposure and vulnerabilities to natural disasters due to the impact of the climate crisis. Dependence on the import of the food and the tourism, and a higher incidence of non-communicable disease. These challenges have become even more complex due to the pandemic, and they can only be effectively addressed by the harnessing science, technology, and innovation. We need a science to identify synergies and trade-offs and to advance evidence-based policy making. Dear colleagues, strengthening the science policy interface is critical. Today's event provides an opportunity to share the experience and exchange ideas on how increased innovation and the digitalization can have the seed and the rest of the world achieve the multiple and the cross-cutting targets of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The Samoa Pathway Framework for Action and the UN Food Assistance Summit follow up action. The Seed Solution Platform promotes new technologies and also facilitates knowledge sharing on social, institutional, policy, and financial innovation. It is about new ways of thinking and collaborating. To reach impact at a scale, we must develop new and tangible partnerships, including with civil societies and the private sector. Collectively, we can and we must do more to place science and innovation firmly at the center of our decisions and actions for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, a better life for all, leaving no one behind. I wish you a productive event and thank you.
Thank you, Director General. I now have the great pleasure to invite the Honorable Mahandra Reddy, the Minister for Agriculture, Water, Waste and Environment, Fiji, to deliver the keynote statement. Honorable Minister, the floor is yours. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend my thanks to the organizers for, the, for inviting Fiji to speak at this important side event on the SIT Solutions Platform, knowledge sharing to accelerate the achievement of SDGs, Samoa Pathway and Food Systems Summit goals. The challenges and gaps as well as the opportunities and solutions related to boosting innovation and digitalization are numerous and are oftentimes co-shared especially between small island developing states or SIDS. As my Prime Minister noted during the forums, SIDS are different chapters of the same book. This was the very reason behind launching the SIDS solution platform back in August 2021. The government of Fiji was very pleased to co-host the launch of this important forum together with FAO and we are happy to continue being part of various discussions organized around SIDS solutions discusses like this one. As I mentioned, SIDS members share a number of the same challenges. Amongst them are remoteness, small and dispersed geographies and economies, vulnerability to natural disasters, dependence on imported foods and tourism, and a high incidence of non-communicable diseases. The impact of COVID-19 has magnified these challenges in many SIDS countries around the world. However, the pandemic has also pushed us to accelerate the development and adoption of digital technology. For example, in Fiji, data usage has spiked by 300% since the start of the pandemic. We should take advantage of this momentum to transform the way we produce, consume and trade our food. The time has come to start leveraging the digitalization of agri-food systems to support COVID-19 recovery as well as improve food and nutrition security and resilient societies. These efforts can also help us make agriculture more attractive to younger farmers. They can also reduce food waste and boost the deployment of climate smart agriculture practices. The SIT solution platform is here to do just that. The platform opens a new frontier of cooperation between countries for sharing innovations and digitalization to support SIDS. A lot has been achieved, but we do not plan to stop here. There is much work to be done. First of all, we need more partner countries to join our efforts. The more countries we have under SIT's solution umbrella, the richer our discussions, collaborations and outcomes will be. Secondly, we need international financial institutions, more vertical donors and donor countries to demonstrate solidarity and back up this incredibly important work. Without financial and technical support from our long-standing donors, the SID solutions goals will be impossible to achieve. And finally, we need to act. We have identified pilot solutions and in-depth convers convers conversions around the next steps and opportunities. Now is it, 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 is it time to act and scale up the solutions and ideas by supporting our innovators to contribute to the achievement of the SDGs, the Samoa Pathway, and this Food System Summit Dialogue goals. At the core of all these three points are partnerships and collaboration. I am certain that SIDS will be able to recover from the pandemic, build sustainable, clean food systems, and continue to strengthen climate resilience to deliver economic prosperity. But SIDS cannot do it alone. We need strong partnerships, resourcing, and financing that is fast deploying and affordable and accessible. Only through strong and durable partnerships, innovation and digitalization, SIDS can modernize agri-food systems and rural economies to ensure food and nutritional security, all crucial for delivering on the pledges made under various frameworks like the SDG, the Samoa Pathway and the 2021 Food Systems Summit. Thank you. Manakawakilevu. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for this uh, very inspiring words. So I'm now invite Lahonta Ma, I feel Deputy Director General to introduce the high level results and the follow up actions concluded uh, from the Seed Solutions Forum.
Uh, Deputy Director General Lohan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Chang Jun. Uh, dear Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are hearing me well. Uh, I would like to welcome you warmly to this uh, important APRC side event. As mentioned by the Director General, uh, today we are building uh, on the goals, ideas, and outcomes of the SEEDS uh, Solution Forum. Uh, for us, it's a flagship event. Uh, we organized it in partnership with the International Telecommunication Union and with the government of Fiji as a co-host uh, in August, as you will all uh, recall, August 2021. It was recalled in the introduction that um, about uh, 1,600 people from uh, various countries attended the forum, either virtually or physically in, uh, in Apia, uh, Samoa. Nine head of states and governments, 20 ministers from seats, as well as other high level representatives from the countries, international organizations, and UN organizations, including the FAO Director General, were there. Important to note uh, that the ministerial representation from non seats countries at the forum, for example, China, Ireland, demonstrated a strong solidarity and partnership between SEEDS and the rest of the world in advancing a shared development agenda in the SEEDS. The forum gathered and showcased 11 SEED solution innovators, women and youth leaders, parliamentarians, policymakers, UN and development partner officials, researchers, farmers, and fishers. The take home message was very clear. We need to incentivize and support locally grown solutions of innovation and digitalization that can accelerate the achievement of the SDGs and the Samoa pathway while mitigating the impact of the COVID pandemic to build back better. As a key result of the forum, FAO launched the Seed Solution Platform which has already begun to facilitate knowledge sharing, not only between the seeds, but also with other countries with similar challenges. The, the forum participants agreed on uh, several recommendations. Uh, they were uh, summarized in 12 key practical and precise action points that will guide the way forward while developing homegrown seed solution. So, let me, uh, you know, take a, a, a deeper dive into the, these uh, crucial action points in order to, to, to set the scene for this uh, session. The first action point calls for harnessing the power of information and communication technology in order to build effective and resilient agri-food systems to enable farmers, fishers, and artisans of all genders and age to gain the full benefit of development. The second and the third points note the importance of strengthening ICT infrastructure with special emphasis on the agriculture and fishery sectors, as well as supporting the development and implementation of what we call e-agriculture strategies linked to national ICT strategies. The fourth point calls on partners to support, promote, scale up, and replicate homegrown seed solution, as well as provide tangible long-term assistance, including a Pacific startup package. The fifth and sixth points call for support to the leadership of women and youth in the use of digital agri-food system technologies, including building financial and digital literacy. The seventh and eighth points refer to the promotion and the scaling up of uh, the seed solution platform itself and to and pledge to, to submit it to UNDSA, UNDESA, as a key seed partner to support the implementation of the Samoa pathway and the SDGs. Point nine and 10 call for investing in partnership and knowledge sharing alliances, including through South-South and tri Triangular Cooperation to catalyze and scale up seed solutions identified in 2021. Under the 11th point, 
the participant call for support to the application of the multidimensional vulnerability index. The one that is currently being developed in line with the Samoa pathway to allow the inclusion of many income-based criteria to assess eligibility for concessionary finance. Finally, point 12 calls for the establishment of structured and targeted regional financing appropriate for the seeds. In his uh, opening remark uh, at the forum, FAO Director General assured members that the platform is for results and that the forum will not be the usual one-off event. Let me give you a few examples. On 1 February 2022, through its liaison office in Brussels, Geneva, and New York, FAO kicked off a series of events touted as the FAO Global Seeds Solution Dialogue. These dialogues on agri-food systems transformation will run for the next two years. The event drew global attention to not only the challenges that SEED confront, but also the local innovation and creativity that can be leveraged in SEEDs to catalyze agri-food systems. This uh, 1 February event was attended by more than 253 people including the participation of permanent representation, government officials, intergovernmental organizations, UN agencies, NGOs, academics, and other partners based in Brussels, Geneva, New York, Rome, and around the world. The Seed Solution Dialogue Series is part of FAO's continued commitment and efforts to ensure seeds remain high on the agenda in Brussels, Geneva, Rome, New York, and beyond. I should also share that uh, drawing on the South-South and Triangular Cooperation Modality, FAO secured an agreement with the government of Korea to facilitate the training of uh, Pacific seed farmers and producers in agri-food system value addition. Under this agreement, Pacific seeds farmers and producers will travel to Korea in 2022 to exchange and learn from Korean farmers. FAO and the ITU are leading a partnership with ILO, UNOPS, UNESCO, and UNICEF to implement a $6 million project for accelerating SDG achievement through digital transformation in Cook Islands, Kiribati, the Federated States of Micronesia, Republic of Marshall Islands, Nauru, Palo, New, and Tokelau. The two years project starts on the 1st of May and the budget is uh, largely a combined sum from a UN Joint SDG Fund and FAO uh, Technical Cooperation Program, our TCP Program Fund. FAO is uh, continuing to identify and profile more solutions of innovation in SEEDS as a tool for knowledge sharing. We are organizing an Agri Innovation and Digitalization Bootcamp in 2022 to nurture and scale up at least two solutions in each Pacific seeds. We have invested in replicating the MyCanaHap nutrition education tool from Fiji to Tonga, and we are partnering with the University of the South Pacific to scale up the locally produced hot hair dyer for producing potato and cassava chips in Solomon Islands. We have also invested in improving the functionality of existing digital solutions in Fiji, Samoa, and Solomon Islands by addressing the gender divide. Again, all these are just a few examples of what FAO will continue to do by using its TCP funds to, to attract partnerships and investment to support the shared agenda of SEEDS through the SEEDS Solutions Platform. As mentioned at the forum, uh, seeds speak a common language. Uh, today it was mentioned uh, a common book with uh, different chapters, a common book of uh, shared experience and challenges. Innovation is our beacon of light in overcoming these challenges effectively and collaboratively. Whether you are a panelist or an attendee of today's event, keep these valuable and concrete action points in mind. I wish you a very productive session. Thank you very much. 
thank you so much, Lahon Tama, uh, for taking your time to uh, take us through uh, about this 12 uh, recommendations that were concluded uh, from the C Solutions Forum. And also you introduced uh, those uh, follow-up actions that I feel have already taken and also will take in the coming years uh, to uh, implement this uh, follow-up actions from FAO's ant. And I think this has been highlighted by you, but also by the DG, by saying that the Seed Solutions Forum is not uh, one ad hoc uh, event, but rather is a kickoff of the series actions that I feel will be partner with the different stakeholders to promote the seed solutions in the coming years and also further uh, to support the countries to achieve the SDGs, but also the uh, Samoa pathway. So with this uh, really uh, insightful uh, introductions and the presentations from your aunt, thank you so much uh, for this. And uh, as uh, Colleagues, uh, you see from the program of this side event, uh, we are going to have a panel discussion uh, following this uh, opening remarks from the FAO DG Fiji Minister, as well as FAO uh, DDG. And uh, for the panel discussion, I am going to invite uh, my colleague, uh, Joseph, uh, to facilitate the next session. So Joseph, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Zanjan. Excellencies, honorable government officials, distinguished guests and colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your current location. My name is Joseph Nyman, and I'm the Nutritional Food Systems Officer for FAO in the Pacific Islands. In this role, I support the technical work on our disease solutions platform. It is therefore my honor and pleasure to facilitate this panel discussion by replacing Mrs. Simona Marinescu, the UN resident coordinator for the Samoa based resident coordinator's office, who is currently traveling. The focus of the panel discussion today is partnership and financing for accelerating implementation of the forum's recommendations and ensuring that they contribute to the SDGs, the Samoa Pathway, and the Food System Summit dialogue goals. Now, please allow me to welcome and introduce our distinguished panelists. Mrs. Benoan Bosquet, Regional Director, Asia and the Pacific World Bank. Mrs. Fiona Lane, Director, Agricultural Development and Food Security Section, Climate Financing and Programming Branch, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Mrs. Shelley C. Burridge, President, Samoa Women's Association of Growers and Managing Director of Bawaola Vanilla. And lastly, His Excellency, Dr. Walton Webson, Chair of the Association of Small Island States and also permanent representatives, representative of Atingua and Barbuda to the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased now to turn to our distinguished guests to offer some different perspectives. If I may, I would like to call on Mr. Benoan Buskert, Regional Director, Asia and the Pacific for the World Bank. Mr. Buskert, from the perspective of the World Bank, what are your insights on the subject of discussion for this panel, which is partnership and financing for accelerating implementation of the forum's recommendations and assurance that they contribute to the SDGs, the Samoa Pathway, and the recently developed Global Food Systems Summit Dialogue Goals. Mr. Benoan, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Niema, and uh, good uh, day 
uh, to all the participants, uh, excellencies and uh, colleagues. Thanks very much for the opportunity uh, to share a few insights uh, with uh, uh, the uh, group uh, gathered here for this uh, important uh, site event. Um, I, I will, uh, because of uh, uh, lack of time, I will go straight uh, to the point and, and tell you a little bit about what the World Bank Group uh, does to promote uh, financing innovations and digitalization in Pacific Island countries. Um, first, uh, in terms of financing innovations, I'd like to highlight two initiatives uh, that we support at the World Bank Group. The first one is productive agri-business partnerships uh, and value chain uh, development. This entails uh, public-private partnerships, uh, which are an effective model for expanding smallholder access to services and markets and agribusiness development in the cocoa and coffee sectors in particular. This uh, uh, comes along with capacity building in order to address uh, gaps in information and know-how uh, both technical and market-related information, for example, uh, new technologies and uh, improve the planting materials. Um, as well, we support producer organizations and micro, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises to commercialize products uh, in a number of uh, key value chains, uh, cocoa, uh, coconut, coffee, spices, um, small livestock, fish, honey, uh, and, uh, and to promote diversification to assist um, uh, the mitigation of shocks and, and risks. In addition to these uh, productive agribusiness partnerships, we also um, foster uh, and issue matching grants for increasing on-farm productivity and improving access to markets. And so farmers uh, are able to increase on-farm productivity uh, and fisher folk improve the management of their fishery resources. Uh, that also enhance uh, the linkage between their production and uh, the markets. And, and obviously, these initiatives in terms of financing, you know, are typically coupled with broader measures, in particular, strengthening national institutions for crop uh, and, and livestock, or, uh, as the case may be, enhancing the management of the region's uh, shared oceanic and coastal fisheries. And then the second uh, set of uh, experiences that I wanted to quickly share with you uh, has to do with uh, digitalization. And here I would like to mention e-vouchers and e-monitoring. The e-vouchers e first, uh, we are piloting in uh, Samoa. Uh, there the, the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock uh, was able to disburse matching grants to a number of approved farmers using this new e-voucher system. And what we see as a result uh, of using this e-voucher system, farmers are now able to purchase goods, equipment, and materials from a pre-approved list of eligible items through uh, an online system. And this reduces transaction costs, it increases flexibility, uh, as well as transparency and uh, accountability. So a very useful mechanism that is tested now in uh, a range of situations around the world. And then finally, when it comes to e-monitoring as well as e-reporting, this is uh, something that we now support uh, in eight Pacific Island, as well as the uh, Regional Fisheries uh, Forum Agency. Um, it 
uh, basically put specific island countries on a par with the most advanced uh, fisheries management systems used in North America or Europe. And, and what happens there is that as part of obtaining access to fishing rights, the vessels that are authorized to operate are equipped with video cameras and sensors to monitor and record fishing activities that will make it possible to the regulate, for the regulators to verify the fishing logbooks, which by themselves are not reliable. And what we see in terms of impacts is that there's now a much higher transparency, uh, a possibility to penalize non-responsible uh, fishing vessels because the countries are able to detect under-reporting of catch or misreporting of bycatch. Over time, this e-monitoring supports improved uh, data for better management of the fishery stocks themselves. And we hope that this is also going to give countries an idea of how tuna stocks respond to climate change because they migrate, as we know, away from uh, the equator. And as well, uh, this e-monitoring and e-reporting system uh, facilitates data exchange among regional management and governance bodies, uh, which is critical for uh, the shared management arrangement that the Pacific Island countries have uh, uh, adopted. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. If there is a need for further information about these initiatives, uh, my colleagues and I would be happy uh, to indeed uh, oblige. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, we'll listen to the next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Benoit. I'm quite sure um, colleagues, community groups, but also governors will be interested uh, in what you've said, uh, because you've spoken about the World Bank, uh, its support to both land-based and marine-based value chains, which is important for community groups. But also I think in terms of governments knowing that Pacific Island countries are surrounded by a lot of water and fish and with huge exclusive economic zones that they cannot control. So you're offering on the bank support in terms of regulating um, capacity building uh, for controlling illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing activities will be quite uh, an issue of interest to governments. Without delaying, I will try to move on to a different perspective, and that is from the vantage point of governments, especially governments that are very active in seats. For this reason, I will invite Ms. Fiona Lin, Director of Agricultural Development, Food and Food Security Section, Climate Financing and Programming Branch, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Ms. Lin, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and hello to uh, distinguished guests and colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this, uh, in this panel on these very important topics. Um, as I've been introduced, I'm with the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. As a development partner in agriculture and food security in the Pacific, we are very much guided by, by the priorities of the Pacific. And these have been outlined through the Samoa pathway uh, national and regional dialogues that occurred ahead of the UN Food System Summit um, and uh, in, more regularly in the two yearly meetings of the Pacific Ministers of Agriculture and, uh, and Forestry. And so we sort of take, we take our lead from, from those forums. Um, and if I reflect on the, on the recent Pacific Heads of Ag and Forestry meeting, um, very, very clear priorities, increasing food and nutrition security, building resilience to the impacts of climate change, enhancing biosecurity, promoting value adding and downstream processing, and improving livelihoods um, and contributing to economic growth uh, in the Pacific Island region. So, so it's, a, it's a challenging question as to how to mobilise the necessary resources and partnerships to, to catalyze and scale up 
in order to deliver on those specific priorities. And that has been very much what the SID solution platform has been looking at and what I'll, I'll reflect on now. That sort of issue of how you, how you catalyze partnerships, how you mobilize resources. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have a straightforward answer um, and sharing knowledge through the SIDS platform is, is one way to, um, to assist. But, you know, every country is different, of course, and every community is different. Um, but what is the same, I think, is that, is that scale up requires many different partners to work together. Uh, farmers, governments, the private sector, NGOs, researchers, and, and ourselves as development donors. Um, I mean, we're very pleased to, to be building a number of um, partnerships in, uh, in agriculture-related areas. A and I'll give you just a couple of examples um, so that you can sort of get, get, a, get a sense of, of what we do um, from the Australian perspective. Um, I think as, uh, as Director General Chu mentioned, the, the private sector is so very important to, to achieving scale-up and scale-up of innovative solutions. Um, we're a, um, a long-term funder of um, an initiative called the Market Development Facility, um, which operates in a number of countries, including uh, Fiji. It, it's very much a partnership model, and it looks for opportunities to support private sector actors to adopt new practices. And if I give you a, a tangible example of that, um, acidic soil is a widespread problem. In, uh, in sugarcane producing countries, in, including Fiji. Um, and um, you can um, manage acidic soils through the application of lime. And so uh, through our market development facility, we, um, we, we, we drew upon some research that was done by the Australian Centre of International Agriculture um, Research. So, so we had a solid evidence base for how to, to apply this product. And then working with, with the industry, with potential uh, suppliers and distributors of, um, of lime, and then with farmers, we basically worked up through our market development facility a sort of partnership that could um, source this product, this lime, this additive, distribute it through a, a network of hardware stores, and then engage with farmers so they understood the product and were able to apply it. So thereby we went from... Uh, something that was a, a sort of research finding into something that was a scaled solution that could be accessed by, you know, thousands, thousands of farmers. Um, I think the other issue to reflect upon is, is the importance of exports for the, for the Pacific. Um, you know, Pacific countries are developing very unique high-value products, um, cacao, vanilla, coffee, um, and that these export pathways are certainly challenging. Um, challenging to build and challenging to maintain. And, and Shelley, who's our next speaker, I think will um, we'll touch upon that. But again, we've looked to um, build some long-term support through our Pacific Horticulture and Market Access Scheme that Australia and New Zealand funds to help exporters in, in many different locations across the Pacific to build and maintain those pathways. Again, so we can go, we can go to scale. Um, of course, Every situation is different, as I mentioned, and um, it, it may not always be a private sector um, partner that, that can take things to scale. It may well be an NGO or a community-based organisation. And we've uh, had, some, had some great success with, uh, with, with NGOs, uh, one in particular, Live and Learn, who we work with in Tuvalu, to, to scale up the production of fresh, uh, fresh produce. Um, and uh, in, in a water and soil limited environment such as Tuvalu. Um, so I might, um, I'm very much aware of time, um, draw things to a close, but, but I guess in, in using, um, you know, partnerships are key to, uh, to catalyzing and scaling up investment. Um, and, and we are very pleased to continue to work with our partners in the Pacific to do that. Thank you very much. Ms. Lynn. Um, I think our innovators will be quite intrigued listening to you. I should recall that the FEO Director General in 2021, when he unveiled the Sea Solutions platform, he made it very clear that the goal is to facilitate knowledge sharing, to allow us also to identify innovative solutions and replicate them. 
And I see that Fiona, you did talk about replicating solutions. I should remind um, the audience that this is very important because in Solomon Islands, we did identify a solution by an ordinary farmer, a businessman, if you want, a small private sector who created a hot air dryer device that produces potato chips. Now, this innovation is very important because it's within a context where you have non-communicable diseases, partly because people eat food that is saturated with a lot of um, saturated fat. So hearing about how to replicate solutions is very important because this gentleman would like to expand this initiative and for us, we see these kind of people as private sector. So thank you very much, uh, Fiona. Now, I will move on to our next speaker, who is actually from the, if you want, the private sector. But she's also an innovator. And she will be speaking, sharing a lot of uh, perspectives from that vantage point of the local innovators. And she is Mrs. Shirley Birch, who is the president of the Samoa Women's Association of Growers. But she's also of the innovator of the Samoa uh, Vanilla uh, Initiative. Mrs. Birch, I give you the floor, please. Thank you, Joseph. Excellencies, honorable officials and esteemed uh, panelists, I extend warm greetings atu, to you all from my beautiful country, Samoa. It is certainly an honor to be the nominated representative of a SID civil society organization for this first side event today. My name is Shelley Burrich, and this is my third year as president for the Samoa Women's Association of Growers, otherwise known as SWAG. I'm also the founder and owner of the sole organic vanilla farm in Samoa called Vawala Vanilla. SWAG was established in just under four years ago from the need for closing the gap for women to access information and resources for women growers and farmers in Samoa. This NGO provides women growers and farmers with opportunities for business networking, training and education, accessing local and international markets and socializing in a supportive open environment to share traditional and environmentally safe solutions to modern day agricultural needs. Due to the economic stresses caused by COVID in Samoa, more previously employed women are turning to micro business ventures in the informal space. Pop-up markets, new market spaces that are available on Saturdays, roadside vendors, and increased activity on online market platforms has helped support struggling families and female-headed households. It is estimated 70% of stalls are managed and staffed by women. SWAG Saturday markets offer our membership and casual vendors a safe environment to sell their produce, baking and handicrafts. SWAG helps to promote vendors through our Facebook page with just over 6,000 followers, giving many of these vendors an opportunity to sell their produce in and outside of Samoa. Between 75 to 90% of vendors working at Pacific marketplaces are women, and their earnings often make up a significant portion of the incomes of many lower income households. Within the context of today's discussion topic, I'd like to focus on what was noted from the 2021 SID Solutions Forum. If I may recap just a couple of um, statements that I had made uh, within the innovative statement back then, we asked, where to now? We wanted to see tangible results. We also said, because we are small, we require long-term support and assistance. When we talk about financing for innovatives and SIDS, let us remember that it's not just about technical support and peer-to-peer -peer learning. We need financial support too. 
not having the financial tangible resources and for some of us open payment gateway, gateways to utilize digital technology as a means of additional financial income is a major challenge and, and a big roadblock for e-commerce entrepreneurs. The SIDS Solutions platform can be an opportunity for Australia, the World Bank and other major stakeholders to support innovators. And if I may highlight a couple of uh, some of the leader statements that were made at the 2021 uh, Solutions Forum. The Honourable Fiji P Prime Minister, Honourable Joe Bainamarama said, no innovation can be too small to make a difference. The Cook Island Prime Minister, Honourable Mark Brown said, turning ideas into results requires commitment with partners. And our very own Samoa uh, Minister for Agriculture and Fisheries, our Honourable uh, Lauli Pulataivao, noted that family farming is a sector in which women and youth play significant roles, and it's important in Samoa and other SIDS. He reminded us that rural women face greater constraints than men in accessing technologies, markets, and employment opportunities. And he called for the use of the SID Solutions platform to support farmers and fishers, including women and youth. As an NGO, we are always out there doing the call to action. So farmers and innovators in SIDS are private sector business owners and entrepreneurs trying to make a living too. We need to be mindful that it's not just about producing food and what we eat. Whether we are farmers or growers, we are all entrepreneurs. When we sell what we produce, we are in business. We need to be also reminded of the 12 key action points that were recommended by the Solutions Forum. And they are important and urgent. And three of them that I believe need immediate action. Number one is support, promote, scale up and replicate home-grown SID solutions, as well as provide tangible long-term assistance, including a Pacific startup package. Number two, build financial and digital literacy and support women and youth to transition into the formal financial ecosystem, especially the digital economy. And number three, Establish structured and targeted regional financing appropriate for SIDS, as well as a pool of regional experts on accessing financing, including concessional financing. As we said at the forum, the inaugural SIDS innovators for this platform are committed to supporting each other by sharing skills, knowledge, and the continuation of networking whenever and wherever we are able. We continue to ask our governments, FAO and UN agencies and other development partners for their support, such as te technical assistance, networking and mentoring opportunities, peer-to-peer -peer learning, access to sustainable markets and access to financing, including reduced excise taxes. We need government support to help us expand and replicate in other Pacific and SIDS nations should there be interest in our innovations. And I reiterate once more, we require long-term support because we are small. In closing, I would like to share some pertinent points that I took away from Samoa's International Women's Day event celebrated yesterday, and which I believe are also relevant to the needs of the SIDS innovators and entrepreneurs too. A one size fits all approach is not necessarily the right solution. There is a need to continue proactive and interactive communication with the innovators and entrepreneurs, and it needs to be constant. The financial and technical support needs to be, needs to be designed to meet the needs and the challenges of the innovator. Our needs may change due to the changing environment in which we live. And therefore, 
so too will the needs of the type of financial and te technical support change. We ask our stakeholders and our leaders to be open and receptive to these changes. Action is needed now. It is not just about saying there is a commitment. Real commitment is when the action is implemented. And there, honorable excellencies and delegates, I conclude. Thank you very much, Shelley. As you were speaking, I was receiving several texts from a lot of innovators in the community and they said, you should keep speaking for the next one hour. Unfortunately, I said to them, we can't, time isn't enough, but thank you very much. Now I will go to the next speaker and that's the Honorable Dr. Walton Webson, the chair of AOSIS and the permanent representative of Antigua and Barbuda to the United Nations. Honorable, you have the floor. Thank you. It is a pleasure for me to join this meeting on the sidelines of the Regional Conference for Asia Pacific to highlight some of the key findings from the SID Solution Forum. As you are aware, genuine and durable partnership are the catalysts of the Samoa Party, and SIDs have greatly benefited from South-South and Triangular Cooperation in advancing our development aspirations. We hope to build on this momentum and see new actions and commitments emerging through these dialogues, which are enriched through regional experiences and lessons. First and foremost, to overcome the capacity barriers that SIDS face in harnessing innovative solutions and digitalization, we urgently need scaled up financing to create more enabling environments, including establishment of necessary infrastructure. The quantum of resources that are currently available are insufficient to meet the evolving needs of small island developing states, especially when faced with the global challenges such as climate change and the socioeconomic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. We also need adequate and predictable channels of funding which can be accessed without additional restrictions for states. Noting, of course, the current rules governing access to public finance are less than ideal. Development support should primarily be directed to the most vulnerable countries to ensure that they are not left behind. And the current GDP per capita income criteria utilized by the IFIs consistently exclude numerous sits. In this context, we wish to highlight the recommendation from the forum to support the application of the multi-dimensional vulnerability index, which is currently being developed and considered by member states. This will be a key political milestone for us that could shape a new and more favorable development trajectory for SIDS during this decade of action. Another important takeaway from the forum is to maintain focus on areas where there are persistent gaps, slow progress in implementation, as we are almost halfway through the implementation of the 2030 agenda and reaching the end of the mandate of the small pathway, there are a number of challenges that inhibits and even set back the lack of resilience to external shocks that is common that is the common denominator that must be addressed to preserve and advance the gains we've made in a cross-cutting manner. It is also important to consider co-benefits and long-term impacts of envisioned initiatives to ensure meaningful and sustainable results, which include enhanced resilience of SIDS. Last but not least, it is important for us to be able to keep track of the progress made through partnership that emerge from these initiatives in a holistic manner. Efforts must also be made to ensure complementarity and avoid duplications to best utilize 
the very scarce or limited resources we have available. In this regard, it is important to note synergies with existing partnership under the SIDS partnership framework, as well as other relevant initiatives such as the Global Action Forum on Food Security and Nutrition in SIDS by the FAO. Distinguished colleagues, Excellencies, before concluding, I would like to extend the sincere gratitude of EOSIS to the FAO for their continued close collaboration with SIDS and the leadership in extending the outreach of the SIDS solution platform. Through the discussions such as these, we hope to generate further concrete actions to facilitate implementation of the recommendations in the years ahead. I thank you. Thank you very much, sir, and to the preceding speakers. Esteemed participants, at this point of the discussion, I would like to invite interventions, comments, questions from the audience. We will have about two minutes per question, and hopefully we can entertain about three questions or more, depending on how long we talk. Kindly use the raise your hand function in Zoom, and I will try to recognize you to speak. The floor is open. Um, I don't see any hands up. And also, Joseph, if I may uh, uh, interrupt, I think we are running behind the schedule as well. I think the, the next uh, session is yeah. awaiting yeah, to, keep, to start. Oh. Joseph. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Madam Zansha. Um, so noting that um, we don't have uh, questions, um, I'm going to wrap up this event shortly. Um, but before I turn over um, the mic um, to um, the, um, the moderator, uh, Ms. Zanjun, um, I would like to see um, the panelists, uh, if there's any one, any one issue that you didn't say that you would like to offer, just maybe 20 seconds. Okay, so it looks like um, the colleagues are quite uh, happy, but they are also cognizant of uh, the time uh, constraint. Um, so at this point in time, um, let me thank uh, all of the um, speakers, the panelists for this very, very rich uh, discussion. Um, it was a pleasure um, to have you uh, join us um, during this uh, event. Um, I should quickly recall that the C Solutions platform was created to facilitate knowledge exchange. And by inviting all of you here today, for example, the World Bank spoke about supporting public and private partnership. Australia talked about their willingness and involvement in supporting the replication scale up of solutions. And Shirley from the private sector clearly spoke on behalf of innovators in terms of what they would like to see to scale up important solutions that they have developed. With this, I want to conclude that we had had the opportunity for the platform to do exactly what it was created for, which is to facilitate the cross-pollination of information. So thank you very much. And I should let you know that um, the C Solutions platform is always up online and we are available always um, to facilitate information that will be useful and benefit the community. At this point in time, I will pass the microphone on to Ms. Zanjian. Ms. Ms. Yao, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Joseph, uh, for your uh, moderation to the panel discussion. I also want to thank all the panelists uh, for your excellent deliberations. 
I think the composition of today's speakers already show that uh, our commitment to support the seeds countries to scale up the innovations and also the digital agriculture practices, but also shows a kind of a good composition of the partners. Uh, from the UN agencies like FAO, uh, international financing institutions like World Bank and also others, but also the uh, donor countries and also the participating countries, as well as the CSOs and also the private sector. So without such a kind of partnership to engage all this concerned stakeholders, I don't think uh, we can make our journey successful. So with this, I want to thank you again very much uh, for your participation at this event. But uh, let me give the floor to the uh, FAO regional representative and also assistant director general, Jung Ying Kim, uh, to uh, deliver the closing remarks of this side event. So with this, I end up my responsibility as uh, the master uh, moderator for this side event. I thank you again. So, uh, Zhong Jin, Mr. Kim, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Shang Jun. Um, Honorable Minister of Agriculture, uh, Waterways and the Environment uh, of Fiji, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, and uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to uh, thank you very much uh, for very dynamic and thought-provoking uh, discussion uh, today. I think we have heard uh, very clearly uh, from the opening remark of the Director General of FAO and uh, uh, the remark uh, by the Minister of Fiji and uh, to the panel discussions uh, uh, with our esteemed partners, the importance of partnership and financing for accelerating the implementation of recommendations uh, uh, from the Sea Solution Forum. Uh, these uh, recommendations and uh, uh, outcome of uh, Sea Solution Forum uh, will eventually contribute to the SDGs, the summer pathways, and the full system summit uh, goals. I think it is uh, very important for us to organize discussion at this uh, uh, 36 session of uh, regional conference for Asia and Pacific. As so many countries and the international actors uh, are at present and uh, engaged in various discussions uh, in this uh, conference, the efforts and achievements of CIS must be heard loud and clear across uh, the region. This event was a great opportunity to familiarize ourselves with the outcome of the Sea Solution Forum last year and uh, the key results and outcome uh, to take deep dive into the way forward. And it is indeed uh, comes at a very important uh, time in following of UN Food System Summit uh, in view of agri-food system transformation, as we discussed the last uh, yesterday. What we are seeing in Pacific seas is an increase in the development of innovative and the locally uh, grown uh, digital tools. These applications are opening up uh, of new horizon from increasing competitiveness in uh, building resilient agriculture uh, and food systems and combating the ever-threatening uh, climate change. This event specifically is an opportunity to uh, once again draw global attention to not only the challenges that seas confront, but also the local capacity and innovation and creativity that exist already in seas, which can be catalyzed the agri-food system in positive way. The theme of this conference highlights our strong belief that innovation and digitalization offer opportunities for improving food production and trade and it can help to achieve food and nutrition security for seeds, as we are observing in other parts of the world. I want to emphasize that agri-food systems agenda and catalyzing it through innovation and digitalization in seeds 
is the agenda for all of us. The government of seeds, private sector, development partners, international financial institution, and others must come together to make an impact. It's on coll uh, collective efforts. I'm therefore very happy that Australia and the World Bank are totally engaged over this agenda. I'm excited about the next steps. And I'm especially looking forward to seeing more innovative solutions from seeds that will be identified and replicated this year under the umbrella of seeds solution platform. Again, I want to thank you for your uh, uh, active engagement and I wish you another wonderful uh, side events uh, uh, just behind this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, JJ. I think with this, uh, I could uh, declare that uh, the side event is successfully uh, closed. I thank you very much again, and also wish you would stay with us for the next side event. Thank you, Ms. Yao. And thanks to everyone, all the distinguished speakers at the last event on the Seed Solution Forum. I'm sure we found the sharing of those experiences very fascinating and a good learning for all of us. So we'll now move on to the next event. This is on FAO's flagship initiative called the Hand in Hand Initiative. And this will be run by our colleagues from the FAO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific in Bangkok. So we have Alison Moore, who is the regional lead for this initiative, who will be running this event. Let me just remind everyone who's online that interpretation is available using the globe icon on the Zoom call. And those of you who are here in the plenary can use the equipment that's been provided to you. So without any further ado, over to you, Alison. Thank you, dear Sridhar. Um, warm greetings to all from Bangkok. My name is Alison Moore. I am the Senior Field Program Officer in FAO's Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. And in this role, I serve as our Regional Coordinator for the Hand in Hand Initiative. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this side event for rural transformation to achieve SDGs 1, 2, and 10. We have a technical issue now. The regional office is disconnected. Um, Uh, excuse me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, we have a, a technical uh, glitch uh, uh, for now. Uh, I think we have a, a disconnection from the regional office uh, uh, in Bangkok. Uh, we are uh, uh, addressing this technical issue uh, for now. Uh, uh, Srida. Dear uh, colleagues, it is a pleasure for me to be with you today. I will present what the Hand in Hand Initiative is about. Let me share with you my PowerPoint. So the Hand in Hand Initiative is an initiative that looks into how to resolve and accelerate the solutions of the problems that we are facing today. As you well know, people are suffering from hunger and malnutrition. Climate is changing faster than we adapt, changing the access to land because of drought or because of excessive rainfall and increasing volatility. Mass extinction of certain species is accelerating along with soil and land degradation and depletion of fresh water resources. And far too many countries and too many people are facing the potential risk of not having a sustainable development. 
So what we are doing today is not enough, and we need to work differently. The hand in hand approach tries to bring a different mechanism in which we can work smarter together at the required measurable impact. The hand in hand initiative is a country driven and country led initiative. It provides a framework and key supports to implement and sustain ambitious country led, country owned agri food system transformation programs. It acts as an SDG accelerator to eradicate poverty and hunger and all forms of malnutrition and reduce inequality within among nations. So SDG 1, SDG 2, and SDG 10, completely consistent with the strategic framework of FAO. It deploys integrated geospatial, biophysical, and socioeconomic analysis and a market-oriented agri-food system lens to differentiate subnational territories and focus on collective action. Promotes scale-up investments backed by high-impact partnerships aligned through a start of the start partnering and performance management mechanisms. The Hand in Hand Initiative has three, five key principles. The first principle is to target the poorest between countries and within countries. And for that, we're using territorial approaches. The second is to help countries through matchmaking to access to the private sector funding, to the international organizations funded, the IFIs, but also to access funding from donors. It is within FAO mandate and the new strategic framework and targets the CG1, 2, and 10. And it provides a framework which looks at differentiated strategies. We know that what works in one place not necessarily works in the other. That's why we use not only an agri food system lens, but we also look at territorial approaches. We try also to complement with existing donor resources. We don't want to create duplication. We want to increase effectiveness in how the restricted resources that we have today are more effectively used. And for that, we have developed a geospatial platform of donor interventions. But we also have developed a geospatial platform of data that will allow countries to better target and prioritize their interventions. And finally, of course, we need to put priorities. We need to prioritize the way we invest. To be able to achieve all these four principles, we also need partnerships. FAO cannot do this alone, the country cannot do this alone. So FAO becomes a platform of facilitation, facilitation of partners with IFIs, with the private sector, with the governments, with other key players that could complement all what is needed to achieve the agriculture system transformation that we want in this case for Bangladesh. FAO Global Public Goods in the Service of Agri-Food Systems it consists in several pillars. And what we're bringing here is a data and analysis, which includes a pillar of the hand-in-hand geospatial platform, and also the analytic tools and models. The second is how we partner and align and become a facilitation platform. That's what we call the matchmaking, where we bring together donors, we bring together the private sector, we bring together civil organizations to do what is needed to create the change. And this is also based on performance management, what we call the OKRs of hand in hand. And the final work is to try to achieve this transformative impact. And for that, we need to have finance and investment support. And the investment center of FAO has been transformed so that they can do what is needed to create this bigger transformation that can be scaled up. But to be able to achieve success, we need to monitor. And Hand in Hand has developed and is in the process of implementing a real-time monitor and evaluation dashboard that will allow us to achieve this key goal. We have right now 47 countries, 10 in Asia, 27 in Africa, one in Europe, but six in Latin America, and three in the Middle East. We keep pursuing our goal. We are aiming to have 60 countries by the end of the year. But it's not only Bangladesh, as you can see, there are many countries working with us to achieve this goal. What are the key inception milestones that we want? The first is the handshake, the government ownership, confirmed through notice of interest, designation of national focal points, and formation of FAO across organizational country task teams. As I said, this is a country-driven, country-led initiative. We immediately develop a task force that work in technical analysis and stakeholder consultations. We collect data, based on assessments, develop our geospatial platform, especially for Bangladesh, and implement our stochastic profitability frontiers to do the territorial approach that we are going to achieve. Then we go into an agreement of program support. We identify the territories, the value chains, and what are the major assessments and what we need to be done through our executive roundtables to identify the solutions to the problem. At the end, remember, hand in hand, wants to reduce 
the inefficiency so that farmers can achieve their optimal potential given their current characteristics. So we're not looking at enormous investments of infrastructure. We're looking at the changes that are needed to achieve the goals that you want to achieve. We work then with investment plans that go to donor matchmaking and partner engagement. We will attract private sector and the government will be the one deciding with whom to work. And we will attract IFIs and we will try as much as possible to facilitate this process for the government. We finalize the investment plans and associated program support plans and with clear commitments so that we can move forward. Our aim at the end is to start the implementation of the program so that we can support and go with the government in this process with our dashboard of m &E, but also trying to assure that everything is properly designed and that the process of implementation goes ahead. This is what we are aiming. This is the steps that we need to follow and that we need to accelerate because at the end of the line, the important thing is to have an effective and efficient investment to achieve the food system transformation. Thank you so much. And Hand in Hand initiative needs you. So let's work together to achieve our goals. Thank you. Anyone? Well, it looks like RAP is back online. And so with great thanks to FAO's chief economist, Maximo Torero, for kicking us off. Uh, now we'll put the spotlight uh, right on the countries. I have the pleasure first to invite the Honorable Minister of Agriculture and Forests from Bhutan to take the floor virtually uh, by Zoom for the keynote address. Uh, Your Excellency, please, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, good morning to all. Am I audible to all the participants? Excellencies, a few assistant director general at the regional office of Asia Pacific in Bangkok and other FAO colleagues, respected uh, development partners, distinguished delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This morning, it is a great privilege and honor for me to address to this August gathering on a special theme of hand in hand initiative of His Excellency, the Honorable Director General of FAO. This side event uh, at FAO's 36th Asia Pacific Regional Conference is crucial and an important for, uh, opportunity for all of us to share our learning experiences, innovative thoughts, and further enhance the initiative for greater benefits. The reason why I like this hand-in-hand -hand initiative is because it targets the poorest, the least developed landlocked countries, least developed and small island developing states, countries in food crisis, and large countries with significant hot spots of poverty. I myself come from a very low income farmer family. Therefore, this hand in hand initiative is very close to my heart. Equally, I have very high expectations from this initiative. Bhutan's engagement with Hand in Hand Initiative began in June 2021 through the official handshake letter to FAO's Director General. Our request for a fast track process with joint administration and designated high level focal and technical teams was strongly supported by FAO's country office, regional office, and the headquarters. Rapid progress has been made since then. In my intervention today, I would like to share an update to our colleagues on the development and progress of Hand in Hand Initiative Bhutan and submit our expectations from this flagship initiative to support our national pathways for sustainable food systems to, that we submitted to FAO and the UN General Assembly to achieve sustainable development goals one, two, and 10 in Bhutan. The Backbone Foundation and one unique innovative setup of this hand in hand initiative is the governance structure and coordination mechanisms. Composed of a joint steering committee and a technical task force from various ministries, departments, supported by several units from the FAO, hand in hand initiative Bhutan exemplifies an effective collaborative approach that ensures Bhutan's leadership and ownership. No one silos and multi-stakeholders. Uh, one strong team works in harmony and synergy. 
Bhutan understands that geospatial technologies and aggregate data represent an opportunity to find new ways of reducing hunger and poverty for evidence-based policy making. We rely on FAO's technical capacity and have already benefited a lot from hand-in-hand -hand initiative methodologies, GIS platform, and the technical analysis developed under the initiative. Through data tools, hand-in-hand -hand initiative Bhutan team produced the agricultural topologies, which identified priority regions in Bhutan with high agricultural potential and characterized by high poverty that can benefit from agricultural interventions. Targeted policy bundles are suggested depending on the topology classification to address needs and challenges facing each region and territory. In addition, Two baseline studies on food security and nutrition and uh, every food systems have provided updated findings on Bhutan's production and nutrition gaps and interventions needed to address different food systems and climate change related challenges. This, uh, this aggregated data at sub-national levels showed that Bhutan has a long way to go for uh, every food systems transformation and policy implications emerged from the baseline studies include promoting agricultural diversification and integrated value chain development for special agro product through innovation, upgraded processing facilities, increased market access, e-commerce, and marketing. Based on this state-of-art uh, state studies and series of technical consultations jointly conducted by Royal Government of Bhutan and the uh, FAO, Bhutan, as a new member of the Hand in Hand Initiative, is already close to concluding agreement on the nature of priority of the program and the core investment plan supporting it. Ladies and gentlemen, Bhutan has developed eight full pathways to transform Bhutan's food systems to secure product, enhance value, standards, and markets, unleash digital power, invest in science and technology boost nutrition positive initiatives, apply nature first approach to championing environmental conservation, secure financing and investments, and build capacity and the partnerships. We have high expectations from hand in hand initiative, as I said earlier, to bring diverse actors together to achieve all of these pathways in a systematic manner, focusing on the least advantaged areas in Bhutan to uh, eradicate poverty and end hunger and malnutrition and reduce inequalities. We have prioritized four things for hand in hand uh, initiative Bhutan. First, RNR enterprise development. RNR stands for renewable natural resources uh, and marketing. Uh, RNR enterprise development and marketing. Second, climate smart farming. Third, food and nutrition security. Food geospatial platform and digitalization of agricultural spatial data. In terms of investment and partnership, hand in hand initiative Bhutan's geospatially referenced donor mapping has laid a great foundation to understand and uh, understand the patterns and scale of food systems related funding and donors' commitment. Building on this information, as well as the technical analysis, we take the following overall investment approaches. Number one, using territorial and uh, commodity-based approach with focus on the under, under-supported agriculture regions to maximize profit, uh, profit from agriculture. Number two, understanding implications of GIS and other analytics and bringing together all information to start process of investment and partnership to create uh, different types of opportunities. Number three, creating an, an enabling environment that includes infrastructure policies, tax, financial mechanisms, extra for exports and foreign direct investment in the agriculture sector for economic development. We expect to conclude more partnerships with a diversified and balanced portfolio of public and private sector entities to work in hand in hand to achieve Bhutan's national pathways for sustainable food systems and to achieve the sustainable development goals. I am confident that the, development, the developments and results of Hand in Hand Initiative in Bhutan that I shared with you will continue to grow, supported by an innovative governance structure, evidence-based approach, and collaborative spirit. 
I take this opportunity to thank the FAO for the strong support, and I look forward to working closely with you, with all of you, in this hand-in-hand -hand initiative venture to continue our efforts in achieving the targets set uh, set in the Sustainable Development Goals, and let us leave no one behind. Thank you, and touch today. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for these inspiring words, which we can see come from the heart. Um, we hear your high expectations and are impressed with the momentum in Bhutan under Your Excellent Leadership um, to take this initiative forward through the four pillars identified um, in line with Bhutan's needs and policies, and you can count on our continued support. I will now turn the spotlight to how another country initiative supported by Hand in Hand in Nepal um, has used geospatial analytics for integrated planning uh, for their climate resilient agriculture transformation. Uh, in this regard, I'm pleased to introduce the Honorable Joint Secretary from the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development of Nepal, Dr. Rajendra Prasad Mishra who is participating from the main conference hall in Dhaka. Um, we will support to display your PowerPoint here from the RAP MCR. Uh, just tell us when to go next in advance. And Dr. Mishra, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, excellencies, honorable delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to present about the hand in hand initiative in Nepal, the, the project was the value added of GIS analysis to inform integrated investment planning. Uh, it was the joint project uh, from World Bank, FAO Technical Support, and Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock De Development. Hand to hand, hand in hand initiative in Nepal, a partnership between MOLD, FAO, and World Bank initiated in 2020 and helped to jointly develop the Climate Smart Agriculture Investment Plan, CSAIP, launched in 2021. CSAIP identifies costed and economically viable climate smart agriculture investment packages by province and subsector uh, in three river basins of Nepal. A participatory iterative process was used in specialist terms of national and international specialists to identify appropriate climate smart options and priorities. Okay, please next. Okay, uh, in support use GIS and mapping together with economic economic tools and modeling to achieve with global map data from a few geospatial platform and which drawn on million layers, national statistical data on agriculture production areas, food security and poverty. Uh, using economic tools to identify potential for agriculture opportunities that also lead to poverty reduction Close collaboration and complementarity of CSAIP planning with GCF Climate Resilient Agriculture Project preparation for the Kosi River Basin. Uh, we got basic ground from this information. Please, next one. Actually, context mapping of agroecological zones and provincial priorities, we uh, selected uh, four river basins, Karnali River Basin, Gandagi River Basin, Province one and province two. Uh, Agroecological zonation was completed as high hills, middle mountains, hills, Sivalik, Pleasant, Sturia, and Trai. Uh, these were the agroecological zones uh, mapped. And for each area, we collected provincial key value chains and socioeconomic data uh, like cereals, fruits, vegetables, gas crops, livestock and provincial key value chains uh, for each uh, river basins collected and compiled together. Geo-special data, land use, crop use, 
together with climate change model data indicate changes in expected areas of crop suitability. What we uh, did, how the climate change, climatic parameters will change in coming days and how do these climatic parameters change will impact on land and crop use and using the uh, climate change models uh, in this respect. Land cover changes um, was uh, modeled and climate change mean annual uh, pitch participation uh, in symbol mean of year 2041 to 2060 from uh, Chelsea uh, source we compiled together. And basically which suitability projected uh, in symbol means 2050 RCP 4.5 and high input high rain fed condition uh, source uh, Geja P4. This way we uh, map the contextually the together the four river basins. Next please. Next one. Again, next one, please. Next, please. Okay, these were the scenarios from land cover changes, climate change, and wheat suitability. Next one. Uh, in this way, we got uh, the modeling uh, ways to uh, put forward the investment plan or create a plan of investment. And please, next one. Okay, to provide insights into major predicted climate change effect relevant to agriculture by area, uh, there are some positive changes and uh, there are some negative changes. Mostly uh, Nepal is uh, highly vulnerable and highly impacted country with respect to climate change as uh, uh, Himalayan glaciers are already in a process of melting and so many other uh, changes are ongoing and it is a uh, hard hit country uh, with the climate change. That's, that's why uh, we uh, predicted some positive and negative ex expected impacts from climate change, but the positives are very less and uh, negative climate change parameter uh, impact is very high. Uh, please next. And we, we uh, developed scenarios of high, high temperature increase scenarios increased incidence of extreme precipitation, uh, land basin with increased uh, uh, river flows and increased temperatures and increased high temperatures extremes. Like this, we uh, developed four, five scenarios together for each river basin and uh, developed impact of positive and negative with uh, four river basins like Karnali, Gandaki, uh, province one and province two. And finally, after analysis and uh, prioritization of, next one, please. Analysis and uh, prioritization of the CSA options investment packages were prepared and also estimated investment by province or basin wise uh, from the geospatial approaches. Uh, this one bar is equivalent to one uh, 50 million. And actually, for each river basins, uh, crops, horticulture, irrigation, uh, agroforestry, and livestock uh, investment plan were prepared uh, with uh, different uh, climatic parameters uh, to be changed or uh, changing in the future uh, to, to get the overall plan of the uh, four river uh, basins. Here, uh, all uh, high value cash crops are integrated together and crops, irrigation, agroforestry, livestock uh, combined together to have an impact on poverty, livelihood and food security of these uh, regions. And using, uh, next one please. Using uh, mapping and economic models of priority investment types by local areas to identify areas of different possible approaches to agriculture in investment for poverty reduction and local scale ongoing and next stage. So after having these uh, plans, 
we put the data from poverty reduction and local scale level and classify the typology classes of uh, critical investment areas, high priority areas, medium priority with high agricultural opportunities, low priority with high agricultural opportunities and high performance areas. And having the impact on critical area will have high poverty, moderate potential, high priority areas will have high poverty, medium, high potential, medium to more moderate efficiency, medium priority with high agricultural opportunities, medium poverty, medium uh, high potential, medium moderate efficiency, and uh, high performance area is moderate poverty, medium to high potential and high efficiency. Thus we classify or classified our interventions on uh, critical high priority, medium priority, low priority and high performance uh, typology. This way uh, we can see the uh, Western Karnali River Basin, which is uh, marginally agroecological zone uh, located in Western Nepal is the critical investment intervention area where uh, high poverty, moderate potential is uh, available. Same way, while going to the way, Eastern Nepal River, uh, Kosi River Basin, there is high priority, high poverty, medium to high potential, and medium moderate efficiency. Same way, the province number two and province number one are similar potentialities having a medium to low priority uh, areas. This way, uh, uh, the poverty is uh, counted based on number of poor uh, uh, household in these four river basins. With this, uh, we uh, developed a plan and mapping support of identification. Next one, please. Mapping support to identification of possible uh, ideal storage on market hub locations for different tops. Uh, after identification of the uh, selected value chains uh, with high impact, we located the market hubs locations for different crops to be required to be uh, promoted uh, for smoothly functioning of these value chains and to have higher impact from these selected value chains. Uh, these are the maps from uh, major market centers uh, having uh, the greater market potential. With this uh, production and market, production, market, marketability and the geo spatial data are uh, combined together uh, and four, five market hubs were identified for future promotion. In this way, we, we prepared a uh, climate smart agricultural investment plan uh, for uh, four river basins and lessons and ways forward from this next one, please. Lessons and ways forward from this CSIP, uh, now moving to a stage of localizing and CSIP with provinces and local palikas, investment needs and opportunities will be important. Uh, as Nepal uh, is adopting three tier of governance system and capacity building and need assessment and opportunities available to local levels are most important. That's why we are moving to our, the uh, local level and the provincial level. And geospatial tools will help dialogue and planning at different levels. The geospatial tools that we have used in this uh, uh, CSIP preparation uh, will help in dialogue and planning of different uh, levels of governance. Next stage of mapping, refining and resources are being allocated where and for what? Uh, the resource mapping and resource allocation are by the government, partners, World Bank, GCF, IFART and other uh, different uh, non-governmental partners uh, working in the field of poverty reduction. Also help to map and monitor SDG 1 and SDG 2 at more local level to continue focus on poverty reduction, uh, production, incomes and food security. Local planning will continue combination of participatory processes and the use of range of tools and further ministry and local capacity to analyze and use data for distance making should be standard for a sustained process. These are uh, lessons and ways forward 
we captured from the CSIP preparation phase, and now we are in the phase of implementation and expecting support from different uh, governmental, non-governmental agencies and development partners to implement uh, this plan. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, and namaste. strategies and programs with the geospatial layers enabling this kind of coherent analysis over quite complex and multi-dimensional data. I, I think this, what you've shown us, um, which is a, a similar process taking place in, in all of the hand-in-hand -hand supported country programs, um, it, it provides an excellent evidence base for transformative agricultural investments and programming. Um, and in Nepal, uh, we hope the whole, whole of government and many investment partners can come together behind it. Thank you again. Next, we return to Zoom in order to connect with the country in a different context, uh, the Pacific SIDS. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us today the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Agriculture of the Solomon Islands, Ms. Ethel Tebengi Francis to provide her experience and perspective on hand-in-hand -hand support to the Agriculture Sector Growth Strategy and Investment Plan, the ASCIP, for the Solomon Islands. Um, we will display, again, your, your PowerPoint from the RAP MCR. Please bear with us and just let us know when to advance. Madam Permanent Secretary, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Chair, and um, greetings from Honiara. Uh, it is truly an honor, colleagues, uh, honorable uh, excellencies and colleagues to present to you a product of, uh, which is an example of great partnership between our development partners. And in this case, especially for IFAD and FO, who had been uh, our key partners in the development of the uh, first ever 10 uh, year agriculture sector for Solomon Islands. The Solomon Islands agriculture sector is one of the most important sector for our economy and our people in that it is the main source of employment and livelihoods of 80% of Solomon Islanders living in our rural areas around the country who have limited access to infrastructure and agriculture services. However, our investment in the sector as a country over the years has not reflected well as only around 1.5% of our total national government budget are allocated to agriculture sector, which is one of the lowest levels of agriculture funding in the region, and that is very sad. Agriculture productions accounts for approximately 16% of our GDP and accounts for about 24% of our total exports. The biggest uh, agriculture product uh, is oil palm, which accounts for 70 to 80% of our exports. And they export around two to 3,000 tons of crude oil, while cocoa is around 150 to 200 tons, just last year, for example. Coconut is also one of our main export. Both the agriculture sector and the ministry have over the years performed significantly below their potential after the disruptions of the ethnic tensions and are still beset by the number of serious shortcomings. And these include chronic underfunding, as I have just mentioned, low production and poor productivity, the lack of infrastructure, technical proficiency and cross-sectoral planning and coordination, land ownership constraints, weak and absent land use planning, and a high economic risk exposure to geographical, geological, hydrological, and climate, climatic hazards. We used to have one of the best research center in the Pacific, but was destroyed during the ethnic tension and was never rebuilt until today. So I want to say research capacity is also one of our biggest and has been one of the underfunded um, areas in agriculture in the country. 
So while the recent COVID-19 pandemic has negatively impacted the country's economic situation, it has highlighted again the importance of a productive and resilient agriculture sector to guarantee continued economic growth and food and nutrition security for all Solomon Islanders. And all of this provides all the reasons for the development of the agriculture sector, which has been through a robust process of consultations with all stakeholders and throughout the whole country. And we, again, are grateful to have had IFAD consultants who had been with us in the whole process in this development. And we owe them so much for, for the product that I am proudly sharing with you today. As you have mentioned, uh, as I have mentioned, um, <clears throat> the robustness of this process is proven by the fact that it's, it was submitted twice to cabinet and was approved in the final submission which was then launched by the prime minister himself in October last year. So the strategic, identify strategic opportunities and outlines ambitious pathway to revitalize, modernize and commercialize the agriculture sector to contribute to the well-being and prosperity of all Solomon Islanders, ensuring food and nutrition security and increased economic growth. So the strategy itself um, is divided into four programs. Next slide, please. The strategy is divided into, uh, the strategy has um, the development goals and key results of the strategy are directly aligned to our national development strategy 2016 to 2030. And uh, its development goal aspiration is to ensure a sustainable, competitive and profitable agriculture sector, enhancing economic growth. The Senia agriculture sector strategy has key results. And these are to increase agriculture sector contribution to GDP, to increase self-sufficient sufficiency through local food supply chains, decreased levels of stunting in children under five, increased agricultural production and value chain, increased profitability for all value chain actors and decreased levels of people living below poverty. The agriculture sector has four main programs. Those four programs comprise, comprise the roadmap which will guide public actions and investment in the sector over the next 10 years. And it is based on a matrix of interlinked investment and organizational and technical interventions contributing to the progressive achievement of sub program objectives, key outcomes and the overall development goals. So program one, as you can see on the screen, is governance, knowledge, management, and innovation. And it seeks to improve organizational structure and processes, creates an enabling environment for innovation and research, and provides public access to information and best practices that promote sustainable growth of the agriculture sector. Program two is National Food and Nutrition Security Program that will promote innovative technologies and resilient production systems to increase accessibility, avail availability, affordability, and diversity of nutritious food for all Solomon Islanders. Program three is livestock production for import substitution. We are one of our, uh, one of the highest import country. And um, this program seeks to support, address that. And it seeks to enhance live, livestock productivity through improved breeds, veterinary and technical advisory services, and promotion of environmentally sustainable farming systems for smallholder and commercial scale livestock development. The last one is program four, is crop production for export earnings. 
And this program will seek to increase productivity and quality of existing as well as of new high value crops for the export as well as domestic market through improved varieties, resilient farming system and good agricultural practices. As we know, as a small island state, our exposure to climate change is one of the biggest challenge. And uh, this program is aimed at supporting our people with their resilience in food production. So I have a few slides that has um, uh, detailed the sub programs. I, program one, which is governance, knowledge management and innovation has eight, five um, has, I would say uh, five sub uh, programs. The first one there is governance and organizational development. And this sub program will seek to improve the ministry's organizational transparency, efficiency and effectiveness, strengthen industry linkages to better meet the farmers and industry needs and to improve technical service delivery through information technology. It's a program too, is to improve on our research and knowledge management capacity. And we'll seek to increase sustainable and resilient agricultural productivity, economic growth, competitiveness, food security, and poverty. As you will note from the slides, uh, the sub programs also have sub activities. Next slide, please. So sub, sub program three, which is agriculture and advisory services, will aim to increase farmer access to relevant information, knowledge and technology, decrease extension services, decentralized extension services to Im increase efficiency and effectiveness and increase private sector involvement in line with government policies. Subprogram 1.4 is national land use planning that will look to efficient, to efficient, sustainable and participatory use of agricultural land resources according to agroecological zones. And the last one in that sub in that program is a program 1.5 biosecurity services to enhance protection from the incursion and impact of plant and animal pests and diseases. Improve market access through compliance with SPS and TBT agreements. So program two also has some has similar setting with sub programs and activities. So for program two, which is national food and nutrition food security, has as 2.1 sub-program sustainable food systems development, which look to improve food production among smallholder and commercial farmers and incre increase availability of locally produced and nutritious food. Sub-program 2.2 is horticulture and local kakai promotion that will seek to increase production and availability and use of diverse exotic and traditional horticultural crops. So program 2.3 is village small livestock farming to increase availability of locally produced meat and eggs as a, as a measure to decrease malnutrition in rural communities. Like any other, even, even in our rural communities, they also suffer from malnutrition, but also the highest in terms of non-communicable disease. Sub so program 2.4 is rice production for import substitution being the highest. Rice is one of the highest uh, imported commodity here in Solomon Islands. So we want to have a sub activity, a sub program that looks to reduce this for import substitution. And that is to enhance rice self-sufficiency through improved rice farming system based on sustainable and profitable 
multi-cropping systems. Sub-program 2.5 is disaster preparedness and recovery. And this is very important in light of the so many disasters, natural disasters that we face because of a climate change. So this will look to improve our resilient and diverse farming systems, establish and preparedness for replanting and restocking. Our, sub, our program three, which is livestock production for import substitution. Has five sub programs. Program, sub program 3.1 is livestock service development. There is a dire need for us to really look at this sector. So this program will see to enhance animal breeding, production, and animal health service capacity capabilities and improve private sector collaboration in the livestock sector. Subprogram 3.2 is cattle industry development, is to increase sustainable commercial beef production system, systems and to reduce beef imports to increase domestic production for the urban beef demand. Subprogram 3.3 is peak industry development, and this will seek to increase supplies of locally produced pork to reduce imports and cater for urban pork demand and increase availability of locally produced good quality breeding stock. Subprogram 3.4 is poultry industry development that will increase the supplies of locally produced chicken meat and eggs and also increase the supply of locally produced one day old chicks for the poultry industry. And the last is honey industry development. Honey is one of the, the product that, that we cannot import into the country, but this is one of the sub sector which has not developed over the years. So this activity will seek to increase production and processing of premium honey, not only for local product consumption, but also for export and partnership between the beekeepers, traders and processors is improved. Our last program is program four, which looks up is for crop production for export earnings. And that program has Three sub program it looks at our main, our main export commodities. And um, that is coconut, is, is coconut. So we have a sub program to develop the coconut industry so that we increase exports and domestic use of high quality copra and other coconut derived products and increase the profit margin for our farmers in collaboration with the private sectors. Subprogram 4.2 is cocoa industry development, which will seek to increase exports and domestic use of high quality cocoa and its products from the sustainable cocoa farming systems. And this will also seek to increase profit margins for our farmers in collaboration with the private sectors. So the last subprogram is high value crops. And we look to at the moment, we only have three main export commodities, the oil palm, coconut, and cocoa, all those that we also export, but in very, very small quantity. But this program will seek to, the sub-program will seek to develop other potential commodities. And at the moment, we are investing on cassava as an example, but we will seek to also increase our export through introduction of new crops. So this program will increase and diversify exports and domestic use of well-processed high value crops, and also look at increasing the profit margin for our farmers. So this strategy also um, outlined how it will be implemented in the next slide you will see uh, the ministry, we, 
as a, as a ministry, we're answerable to parliament and cabinet. But in the implementation of the strategy, it is designed to facilitate implementation through a sector-wide approach involving both the public and private sector, uh, including farmers and other organizations. Other crucial implementation partners uh, in this strategy will be, our, of course, our development partners, NGOs, the private sector, civil society, and we are also looking at uh, partnering with, with churches because one of the biggest challenge in the country is land. And a lot of our churches in the country own a lot of registered land. So we want to partner with them and they will be one of our key partners. One of the key, which is new in, in this country is to establish a, an agriculture sector advisory council. Uh, we don't actually have one at the moment, but that's what we want to set up. Uh, to address the challenges of consistent, consistent commitment uh, by governments into the agriculture sector. In that what this strategy being a 10 year plan is to ensure that we are consistent with our investment because the practice of, of changing priorities and policies because of new governments has also been a challenge in developing agriculture sector. So the council will also be there to advise and mobilize support for, develop, for the implementation of this strategy. We will seek to establish industry working groups. I know other countries have all these groups. We don't actually have it here in the country. And, and that is a testament to, to why we have not grown this sector the way it should be. So we will seek to establish industry working groups that will focus on specific subsector and commodity value chains. And I am very proud to, to note here the support from our development partners. And we will also seek to establish a development partner sector working group, which we have already. As soon as the, the strategy was launched in October, all the partners wanted to come together so we can start, um, we start this group, start, start it operational. So we already had one um, development partner sector working group com, uh, meeting. And I am so encouraged by the commitment by all the partners to support us. But I think one of the very important aspect of this strategy, because without it, we cannot go anywhere is the investment plan. Um, the investment plan is basically to ensure sustainable investment over a sustained period of time to reinvigorate the agriculture sector and support its transformation into an efficient, vibrant and productive sector. The funding channel through the ministry consisting of both um, government funds and development partner financing is envisaged to increase. And that is what the investment plan is about. Uh, you will see from the graph from the side, one of the core of this strategy is to be able to increase funding of our development budget for agriculture sector and reduce recurrent. Because at the moment, recurrent is the highest and it consumes a lot of the resources that should go into developing this sector. So over the years, we have made some estimate, you know, with the COVID now in the country and all the trickle down impacts of what is happening around the globe with all, especially the Ukraine um, war, it's going to have impacts even to small nations like ours. Uh, but this is what we envisage, that over the next 10 years, we will continue to increase our investment and in development budget so that we will have more development in this, in this sector. So the next slide, the next slide reflects the anticipated investment into the different programs that I 
subprograms that I covered previously. And those itself demonstrate the areas that it really need investment. And you will see there, research and knowledge management is one of the biggest because it has been neglected for many, many years. Biosecurity is very important because of the continuous and increasing threats of pests and diseases. And of course, we want to also be growing our economy. So we will look to invest more on our uh, main exports, which is coconut and cocoa. So with that, I want to thank all of you but I also want to take this opportunity to ask our partners to support us. When I started off here, I, and our discussion with development partners, the question was, where is your vision for agriculture sector in the country? With the support of FAO and IFAD and all our partners in the country, we have now have a vision for the next 10 years in agriculture sector. I want to ask that all partners who work in this country and those of you who would be interested also to support small island countries, uh, mitigate or address issues of climate change, that you use this strategy as your reference because everything that needs to be in place to ensure that we have a vibrant agriculture sector uh, in this tenure agriculture sector strategy and investment plan. Thank you all so much for giving me this opportunity. Ah, thank you very much, Permanent Secretary, uh, for seizing this opportunity to give us a very comprehensive overview of the ASCIP program. And I hear that you are already attracting investment to it. And as we move to the next stage, we will support further matchmaking. Now, just in order, in order to continue moving forward, I would like to turn to our next panelist for the next country spotlight. Uh, here we return to the main conference hall uh, in Dhaka and to one of the very first hand-in-hand -hand initiatives to be launched in our region um, under the leadership of the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of Lao PDR. I am very pleased to introduce uh, Deputy, De Deputy Director General, Dr. Pami Chak to share the update on the exciting progress and status of the initiative in Lao. Um, we'll project the, the PowerPoint from RAP MCR as usual and just let us know when to move. Dr. Pami, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alison. So, um, uh, honorable chair, uh, distinguished guest ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my uh, great pleasure to uh, share with you today the uh, Landlock to um, Landlink experience in Laos uh, from Lao PDR. So um, I, I think I, we have the uh, slideshow also, if uh, you can put up. So next, I would like to uh, uh, start with the uh, in introducing a little uh, brief about the uh, Lao profile. Lao People's Democratic Republic, or in short, Lao PDR, or Laos, is a landlocked and mountainous country that is widely covered with uh, um, a tropical rainforest. It is bordered by the uh, China and Myanmar to the north, uh, Cambodia to the south, uh, Vietnam to the east, and Thailand to the west. It has a population very small, about uh, 7 million people and uh, an area of about uh, 236,800 square kilometers. Um, in 2019, the country was visited by over 4.5 million uh, tourists. However, as the uh, last two years show or have shown 
uh, reliance on uh, tourism uh, sector is not a sustainable long-term uh, solution. Um, uh, in view of the country long-term uh, development and to offset the impact of being landlocked, uh, the country embarked on uh, linking itself uh, to China. Um, and beyond through a railway link. Uh, the country railway link with China was open uh, last year, December, about the uh, second, second December of last year. And present, uh, presently links uh, Vientiane to the Chinese provinces and, and of uh, uh, Yunnan province through a uh, 422 kilometer long railway track. Um, as you can see in the slide, the, the map uh, uh, show the railway uh, line and the areas accessible to, to the track using uh, road networks, uh, which clearly show the potential of agriculture sector along the uh, railway corridor that uh, we call the green growth uh, economic uh, corridor, which uh, the government of uh, Lao Pidia intends to develop uh, through uh, a 10 years uh, investment plan for uh, investment in the area. And they engage on stakeholders, including farmers, uh, private sector, uh, public sector and development partners to uh, invest in this uh, area. Next. And uh, in this uh, slide, uh, show the concept uh, program, uh, concept note program for, uh, for this initiative. Um, uh, upon derail uh, analysis of uh, potential of these areas, a careful review of the existing agricultural practices the future uh, projection of climate change uh, impact and multiple round of discussion with a wide range of uh, uh, stakeholders. And uh, under the direction of the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and Forestry, the future development plan has uh, four components. So the first one is to uh, develop the agricultural uh, agriculture value chains in these areas. Um, the second, to develop uh, food and agriculture-based uh, livelihoods. Third, to imp improve the nutritional status of the most uh, vulnerable and resp uh, resource poor household in the areas. Uh, the, and the last one for is to support institutional innovation, uh, enabling policies and uh, legislation to enable uh, this area to achieve their uh, full development potential. Uh, this plan is based on the public private community partnership for which an investment plan is uh, being prepare and therefore uh, public, private and private uh, sectors and development partners and um, uh, multiple uh, multilateral development uh, banks will be invited to invest in these uh, areas. We are formulating um, detailed set of activity under the uh, in each uh, component and uh, Oh my God! And, uh, next slide. That will be the last slide of uh, saying thank you. But uh, I have um, a copy of the concept note, so distribute it to everybody. And also, we hope to uh, to share with you online also, as uh, this concept note uh, duly endorsed by the government of uh, Lao Pida that is available for uh, Porosho as we have uh, a limited time for discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Palmi, for, uh, for sharing the developments in Lao PDR. I think one of the most uh, innovative 
uh, entry points into a hand in hand supported program and um, and we're certainly excited about how uh, things progress with the green growth economic corridor. Um, so I'm glad that you've brought those materials available for sharing with the delegates there in DACA and we'll, we'll also share online. Uh, for our final country presentation now, I am pleased to put the spotlight back on our, our host country in, in Bangladesh and joining us from the main conference hall, may I please invite the Honorable Additional Secretary from the Ministry of Agriculture of Bangladesh, Mr. Ruul Amin Talukdar, to take the floor. We will show your PowerPoint from here and I, sir, the floor is yours. Honorable Chair of this session, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. Uh, I welcome you all to the status, updating the status of Hand in Hand Initiative in Bangladesh. At the very outset, I like to pay homage to the father of the nation, who created this country, who brought forth this country in a new shape after a long bloodshed in 1971. And I also like to welcome you all and to inform you that we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of our, of our nation's birth and centenary of our Father of the Nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. I also like to congratulate FAO for organizing this, for allowing us to host this conference in Bangladesh for the first time. Uh, now, you know that Bangladesh is a uh, developing country of the South Asia. We have plenty of achievements in terms of agricultural production and productivity, in terms of growth, and in terms of social improvement in social indicators. In most of our responses, according to the agenda of this conference, we have shared those achievements through our response in, in writings, as well as in uh, the responses that were given by our head of the delegation yesterday. What I like to note that Bangladesh has achieved tremendous achievement, tremendous development in agriculture. In 1971, we had a production level of, of nearly 10 million metric ton of cereals. Nowadays, our production level is nearly 45 million. So it's a fourfold increase in terms of cereal production. And if you see the progress in, in the production growth of vegetables, fruits, meats, those are tremendous. And I think uh, we have shared the information, especially in the, in the opening session of, the, of yesterday, we heard that Bangladesh is, is third in cereals, in vegetables and in meat production in the world, and second in jute, and almost 
if you average out the production, you will find that Bangladesh is among the top 10 crop producing country in the world. So I think why I am saying this background information to link how important is hand in hand initiative for our, our country. We can't allow our farmers to be losers. We can't allow our entrepreneurs to be stopped, to be halted in the pace of their progress. We need to have a strong decision support system in our country. That's why we like to flag this initiative. That's, that's, that's why we like to utilize this opportunity. Uh, we need to increase the investment in agro-processing sector in view of the post-harvest loss that the farmers, the storers, and the market players are, are burdening over the years. So uh, in order to do, do so, what we need? We need to, we need to uh, understand the investment gap in each of the production process, in each of the marketing process, in, stage, in, in each stage of the marketing process. For that, we need to build our capacity build our capacity of our people, of our officials, not only in the public sector, but also in the private sector. We need to understand what would be the strategic location for storage. Say, for example, for fruits, for a particular fruits. We are in the process of articulating zoning, agricultural zoning in the country. For that to happen, we need to have big data to handle, big chunk of geospatial data, which will not only have production data, but also the these aggregated data on production down to the union level. I should say down to the plot level data, we should, we should have to store and we need to know what is the exact production potential of each zone, what is the requirement of the people who are living there, and what, what is the, uh, that means the food, food gap analysis for each individual zone. So for that to happen, we need to have a big data to handle. We need to increase the efficiency of our agricultural production system, processing system, storage system, efficiency of irrig irrigation, efficiency of the uh, of technical efficiency of production in order to reduce the cost of production, to be in the, to be connected, to, to be competitive in the global market. I think we need to harness this opportunity. Some other magic changes you can uh, see in the pace of our development. We are experiencing rapid urbanization growth as elsewhere in the world. And definitely we need to enhance the production, storage, processing, packaging capacity of high value commodities. And we, are going through a process of development, a level, a, a paradigm shift of subsistence, subsistence farming to commercial farming. We are diverse, we have to diversify our product. Okay, definitely we need to carry out the production of rice because rice is the staple food of our people. But at the same time, we need to diversify our production. We need to diversify our diets. In view of the nutritional targets that we have, 
targets that, that have been specified in our, in our national development plan and targets that have been specified in the SDGs, especially on SDG 2. We need to diversify our production as well as, 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 well as diets. So uh, we, I think even our HOD yesterday said that this type of development initiative cannot be taken up only by the public sector. We need to promote the private sector in this process as well. Next slide, please. So we are in the process of transforming our agriculture through a plan of action that have been articulated last year. You know that we, we, have, we have the new agriculture policy in 2018 and we are fortunate enough to have the support of FAO to articulate the plan of action uh, of that policy. And we have taken initiative to implement this plan of action holistically. We have set some philosophy of our agriculture transformation in that plan of action. We need to see our agriculture transform in a way that the agriculture is nutrition sensitive. We need a sort of agriculture which is resilient to, to shocks even in the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Our agriculture has shown tremendous re resilience. So this type of resilience we need to keep up. So that is another point of our agriculture transformation. We need to see our agriculture responsive to, to the needs of the global supply chain, not only on the uh, in addition to the demand of the domestic uh, population, we need to see our agriculture diverse, diverse and export oriented. So with this philosophy, and this morning I, I was talking to the, uh, His Excellency, the Director General, from where I learned that we need to transform our agriculture in view of 5F. We need to see the food, we need to see the feed and some other Fs. We need to consider the fuel, that means the, uh, the driver of the engines of agriculture. We need to consider sustainability issues. So with all these sustainability issues, the nutrition sensitive issues, we need to transform our agriculture. Next, please. And for that to happen, you will be glad to know that we have, I should say, energized sectoral governance system. If you talk about food sector, if you talk about the agriculture sector, the health sector, we have articulated a responsive governance system for improving the food and nutrition security of the country. And that has been showcased since 2010. Even in the uh, CFS, I remember in 36 CFS in FAO, that was so showcased. And we have been continuing that, that governance system with the lessons that we are having through, through the passage of time. So the goal is to coordinate support to Bangladesh agriculture transmission system. Uh, you would be happy that we have institute a, constitute a uh, technical working group headed by our secretary, honorable secretary, Minister of Agriculture, in which FO will be supporting other development partners are on board on, in that process and also other partner ministries. So this particular technical group is supposed to commission an analytical work, formulate action plan for the agriculture, uh, agri-food transformation, I should say, and also link potential development partners 
to uh, to mend the gaps in terms of investment we need to we will, this technical group will also work for facilitation of the uh, capacity of the uh, of our institutions of our agencies and implement uh, also a, a strong monitoring and evaluation uh, measures in in that process i understand some monetary monitoring framework will be established and ensured that a medium term sustainability of agriculture development is uh, afforded next next please through this uh, technical working group and the processes that we have adopted we foresee some immediate usefulness of our initiative first of all as i said that if we can institute constitute a strong decision support system having been supported by all our organizations the directorate of agriculture extension our nars system our food ministry our health ministry combining all these partner ministries and the agencies if we have a good, strong information system with us i think that will help in decision support system in terms of mobilizing invest, investment in terms of allocating allocating investment in terms of taking programs in terms of monitoring uh, the programs in terms of making further policy refinements so what lens, lessons we have learned so far from our initiative that we took uh, i think 6 months back we learned that the importance of a multi stakeholder dialogue and also learned the utility of a multi stake multi stakeholder and multi level governance system with a strong coordination mechanism that we learned from from our initiative we also learned how to engage with and involve with the private sector and that has been exemplified through a delegation very recently where the minister our minister went abroad to see for things by himself the transformation process with the private sector we also felt that a dynamic structure that process and meets the need in short and medium term in line with the targets of our national development plan you will be happy to note that we have the 2030 agenda in front of us and we have a very clear vision of development for 2041 where our honorable prime minister has set the target of being a prosperous country a developed country by 2030 we like to be a higher middle income country we like to see our sdg goals to be uh, achieved by 2030 so having those targets in front of us we think that a dynamic structure and processes have to be accomplished and the last but not the least the lesson that we have that his as a mechanism will help identify investment opportunities i have already mentioned about it and the timing of implementation using the evidence of decision making the data the the technology the tools in our response you will see that we foresee a strong digitization in agriculture and we also propose something an institutional uh, structure for a regional uh, digitization hub so that with the support of fao and other development partners in the region we can have uh, a strong planned and timely digitization structure so with these few words i like to stop here if you have any question or query
I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Talukdor. Um, I think this was uh, very, very worth hearing, and and uh, it's a very ambitious plan um, for for Bangladesh. Um, and I'm sure that the solid basis that you have um, with the government's outstanding leadership and coordination and bringing together all of these different partners um, should bring you, provide you the investments and the partnerships and, and programming that, that are needed to, to realize the vision. Um, this concludes our not so quick tour of the hand in hand supported government agricultural transformation programs, a few of them in the region. Um, I think in our enthusiasm to share what hand in hand has been developing, um, we, we run a bit over time. Um, but before we conclude, we know that hand in hand is also about the other stakeholders who have to come in. It's not just FAO who will come in to support these programs with the government. It's not just the government who can do it alone. We need to bring in so many more. We need to match make. We need to bring in many more partners. We have a, a, a panel joining us mostly by Zoom. Short, I will just ask for their very short points, but to, we, to get their perspectives, I think on the floor, on the table, we want to give a, a few minutes to each one um, to just share. I ask first, um, I'd like to call in Mr. Taufik um, El, El Azabri, who is EFAD's country director for the Pacific. Um, dear Taufik, thank you for joining us. And we certainly appreciated our collaboration with EFAD in supporting the investment plan as, as permanent secretary, uh, Ms. Ethel mentioned in the Solomon Islands and, and working together elsewhere. If you have to give, can give us a perspective in just, you know, your key points, what would be your key messages about how to connect this work under hand in hand and this work that the countries are doing with the investments that are needed? Uh, what, what's your key message for us, please? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me and uh, greetings to um, the speakers and panelists. I think, I mean, I, I just want to say that the value um, from the Hand in Hand initiative, I'll just focus on a few points because of time. Um, I think um, really uh, when, we, when we started the dialogue, we realized that a lot of, that it served um, both the government and the, um, the um, donor community and development partners to have, uh, to articulate a vision uh, um, um, that is owned by the government. So one of the key things about this, its value was that it was participatory and consultative uh, locally, uh, and also um, and also that it brought in uh, technical uh, expertise. Um, FAO provided a lot of technical expertise to um, to to help develop the strategy, um, uh, and also it the, another advantage that was brought by the FAO and IFAD. Uh, partnership in support of the government is that it's also neutral and objective. You know, in, a, in, a, in I, I suppose this happens in many countries, but in small countries, uh, every expert is associated with someone and has some vested interest or so on. So to have an actually external UN um, uh, um, uh, technical inputs has made it, has also helped improve its credibility that it, it did not have any kind of bias. And I think I have to say that it has um, also another challenge in small island states. Uh, I don't know how much the other countries uh, face this, but not all um, uh, development partners are act actually have offices in the country. So this provides a really excellent way for people, uh, for other partners to, to, to jump in and provide support um, or to start a dialogue on with government how to provide support because there's a very articulate vision, but it's not only vision in terms of strategy, it's also in terms of the investments and the financing and the resources needed. So it's really possible to tune in from, uh, from external support, as well as the national budget, about where, how can we spend our money in the best way in support of um, the local actors um, and their vision. Um, so I think, um, you know, and we've used this already to, to, um, to um, access uh, global uh, funding from the Global uh, Agriculture Food Security Program. Uh, it has really helped us to, um, uh, it's one, one of the scoring criteria, uh, I, I presume other donors are interested also in this, is that there is a comprehensive investment approach and not just an ad hoc project here and there to meet the donor, uh, the, the donor check boxes. Um, uh, and so, so, um, so it helped us with that and we are building on that. We're doing four other, um, uh, um, uh, we, also helping us with our EFAD investments in the country. We're programming uh, investments to support this sector strategy. An investment plan, and we are looking forward to work with FAO and four other countries in the Pacific 
in de developing investment plans. So, uh, of course, this is linking to the food systems dialogues. So the timing also for us worked quite well. We can um, uh, we can help uh, build on that. So I think our partnership with FAO has been very fruitful, and um, and also with the government of Solomon Islands, which has taken the lead role in driving this and and pushing us to help um, get what they need. So we've been able to work together to hand in hand to support um, uh, to support the government, uh, also hand in hand with the government. So uh, it's been a very useful um, uh, um, partnership and exercise, and look forward to continue working together with um, with FAO and our partners and government and other partners. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank, thank you. And, and likewise from our side, very, very well said and, and very uh, succinctly put. Thank you very much, Tavik. Um, may I turn next to our other panelist representing the private sector, um, Mr. Ansari, who's the managing director and CEO of ACI Agribusiness, um, which is very well known in Bangladesh, a huge agriculture value chain player. Um, Mr. Ansari, um, let me say, how, how would you contextualize this for us in terms of your perspective in participating in this ATP development process and hand in hand in, in Bangladesh? How does the private sector fit in the picture? Um, and, and how is the role changing? Over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me and also appreciate very much Mr. Talukta's presentation to give you the feel about how the private sector is organized in this country, uh, I'll take the opportunity to introduce our company so that you can get a, a real picture of a contest of a few of the private sectors. ACA is a leading, leading conglomerate in Bangladesh, having diversified interest uh, and our uh, mission to improve the quality of life through responsible application of skill and technology. As a Bangladesh, is a country largely populated and also involved in agriculture. So SCA major interest in agriculture and mission to create wealth for the farmer through providing complete solution to the need of the farmer. As, as a largely involved in broad-based agriculture value chain in crop and animal agriculture, starting from molecular breeding and genetics, communication, supply, supplying technologies, seed, fertilizer, crop protection solution, agri machineries, animal health solution, buying, selling commodity, post-harvest agri processing, and also forward linkage like a retail chain. I think uh, through this, uh, we have some experiences that may uh, I would like to mention that may help to discuss in this uh, contest. Uh, through the value chain, the major changes, uh, challenges we see the capacity building of research and innovation of private sector. That is a very important because most of the inputs supplied by the private sector, more than 90%, and mostly private sector involved in agriculture activity and upgrade capacity of research and innovation of public institution and universities. The reason productivity uh, actually is a very important reason because 70% of the surface is covered with rice. Uh, we may need to improve the uh, you know, productivity of rice so that we can reduce to 50% level so that we'll be able to produce other crops that we are now currently importing. And you will be very surprised to know that 24 million cattle population in this country, and I still we are importing large quantities of milk from abroad. Our food conversion ratio in poultry and cattle is more than 1.5 kilo. So all these areas need to be you know, improved through the research and innovation. Uh, we have to improve the uh, nutritional food security and health uh, through healthy rice or some kind of technology and sustainable in the fast changing global environment and introduction of variety and the trade that is very very important we have to introduce varieties very very fast in this country for that it requires capacity private and public sector extension services actually linkage government extension and private companies and the private extension worker to connect input dealer and pharma through digital technology can be the key to expedite faster expansion of the new technology and the process. That would require very much and it require a lot of improvement in this area for the faster propagation of the technology and the practices, digital platform and the multiplier effect can be the key also. Post harvest capacity building, Mr. Talukdar already mentioned, whatever we produce, we can consume in three to four months, uh, not much capacity
I'm afraid we might have lost Mr. Ansari. I think he raised a number of important points and, and really appreciate uh, his time to join us for that. Um, I think in the interest of time though, we, we must move to just one, uh, one more aspect um, in terms of South-South cooperation. I, I will turn then to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Shi Chun. So Hand in Hand Initiative and, and SSTC share some common objectives of creating a process for partnerships and complementarities, drawing from your experience and in your view. So what are the synergies between SSTC and Hand in Hand, and how are you going to work to facilitate opportunities and linkages and synergies among these two in Asia and the Pacific? Over to you, Mr. Jiaotun. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, I'm the Special Advisor to ADG on South-South Cooperation, the Triangular Cooperation. One of my roles is to support mainstreaming SSTC into the key priorities of RAP and member Nations agricultural development strategies. In my view, the High High and SSTC have four themes in common. First, the two initiatives have highly consistent principles and missions, and they can promote and complement each other. High High is FAO's evidence based and the country led, country owned initiative, and the country ownership and the demand driven is also the core principles of the effective South-South cooperation, the triangular cooperation. Second, on matchmaking, one key element of high high is matchmaking. The high high brings together countries to have the highest rates of poverty and hunger with the developed countries. It focuses on areas with high agricultural potential at a sub-national level, in the bigger picture of the high high agenda, South South and the triangular cooperation can play a matchmaking role, which can contribute to accelerating country level process by amplifying the partnership and the knowledge base. Third, the target investments. Central to the hand in hand is the use of the data and the modeling to target investment. And in countries that lack strong dollar support, hand in hand, we identify new dollars and give them access to the geographic information system data platform. Once a dollar country willing to participate in high high and is identified and paired with a recipient country, SSTC work will focus on addressing the capacity and investment through horizontal Southern partnerships. First, the partnerships. Partnerships, including attracting the private sector. This PPP mechanism, the public private partnership, concerns areas where the potential returns are very significant. Hand in hand reduces the risks and identifies investment gaps in, in areas where it is profitable for the private sector to operate. SSTC can complement and bridge information, innovation, knowledge gaps, and the finance in high, high target countries through leveraging partnerships. In these areas, in now PDR, we are working with country offices to bring private sector investments to fund agro-processing and potentially facilitate agri-trade under the China North Railway. In return, SSTC also benefits from high high by partnering with high high. SSTC also strengthens its linkage with development actors in the country and has further integrated SSTC in the evidence-based country programming for rural transformation. And um, uh, moreover, the joint discussion between SSTC and the high high team have stimulated opportunities and the innovation for SSTC modalities, particularly in the areas of triangular partnerships with international financial institutions and the private sector. The, uh, just like the um, uh, chief economist Massimo just now said, hand in hand initiative leads you. Hereby, I'm sending my sincere invitation again to high team, to partners, to triangular partners. Let's working together 
and contributing together. I thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Shi. Um, and, and we won't forget SSTC as, as a key component in, um, in helping to achieve these hand-in-hand -hand ambitions. Um, our last panelist is Ms., uh, our dear colleague, Ms. Amy Hyman, who's working with the hand-in-hand -hand coordination team um, in FAO's governance unit and headquarters, but is, is there with us in, in DACA. Um, Amy, I, with only a minute to, let me just say, you've seen hand-in-hand -hand developing across all the different countries and different regions. What observation do you have about hand-in-hand -in, -hand in this region of Asia Pacific compared to others? Thank you very much, Allison. And whew, it's really been an opportunity to be able to listen to the hand in hand supported countries this morning. You know, as the chief economist said in his presentation, there are now 47 of the poorest and most vulnerable countries across the globe that are participating in hand in hand. And 10 of those are in this region. We've heard from several of them this morning. And with each of these 10 countries come 10 very unique hand in hand initiatives. And they're unique because they really respond to the needs and the strategies of each of the countries. I think that's one of what the points that's really unique about the Hand in Hand Initiative. Maximo also outlined the principles, the framework, the pillars that make up the Hand in Hand Initiative. But now it's really time to build on the foundations that have been, been constructed in so many countries. Maximo also mentioned that we're targeting this year to have 60 countries participating on board by the end of the year. And we're pushing to have 30 of those countries across the globe over the finish line, which really for us means well-defined investment opportunities that are targeting particular territories within a country and that have operationalized these investment opportunities in an investment plan and to have helped countries identify possible financial support for these investment opportunities. We also hope to systematize matchmaking, which has been taking place in many countries, and put in place a mechanism to be able to monitor progress towards achievement of the, the Hand in Hand initiative. I'll just close very quickly by saying what I think is unique in RAP. I'm in a very privileged position that I get to see across all these 47 different countries. And I must say within the region, we have very active participation and leadership by governments in the region. Maybe I would say even on average more than in other regions. And given that it's country owned, country led, this is paramount. We also see involvement of many stakeholders, which includes the government as well as beyond. And we've just heard from two of our, our key partners in this process. I'll just conclude by saying that really our success will really be your success. And so we really look forward to continuing to work with you on this hand in hand initiative. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Amy. Um, with that, um, let me just uh, bring this session uh, to a close in terms of my, my moderator duties. Apologies for going over time, but warm thanks to all of our speakers and to our panelists um, for, for your time to, to share um, what is going on and what your thoughts are on Hand in Hand and to our very attentive audience. Um, I think this sort of exchange underscores how beneficial it is to continue to have the opportunity for sharing and learning across the different countries and from many different stakeholders um, as Hand in Hand just continues to adapt and deliver on supporting the big ambitions and big expectations and new opportunities that the initiative is generating. So I would like to now um, close out my, my responsibility and invite FAO's Assistant Director General and Regional Representative, Mr. Jong Jim Kim, uh, to offer the closing remarks. Mr. Kim, please. Uh, thank you very much, Alison, and uh, uh, my sincere thanks to uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 
we already heard that uh, this hand in initiative is basically a call for a new approach, an ambitious approach to deliver concrete progress on SDGs uh, through rural development based on potential of agricultural transformation. As uh, we have heard today, uh, already uh, significant progress has been made in the region. Now, uh, in terms of way forward, uh, already uh, uh, there are a uh, number of potential partners in the private sector. Already they have engaged in this process and uh, also the financial sector who are taking an interest in how they, uh, these investment plans can build up a public uh, private partnership and build up new capacities and overcome bottlenecks to work together uh, for inclusive growth, uh, for better uh, production, nutrition, and the better environment and life. Uh, we have heard the enthusiasm uh, uh, from uh, those uh, uh, speakers uh, from uh, the perspective of countries. Also, uh, the potential of South South Central Angular corporations. Uh, from FEO side, now it's time to leverage uh, this good experience uh, from country to uh, country and to shift into higher gear to support matchmaking and the exchange and partnership to concretely mobilize investment. FAO, of course, cannot do alone. Governments uh, may not be able to do alone. The private sector uh, uh, cannot do it alone. But I think we can do it all together by keeping a focus on the potential of agri-food uh, transformation to achieve SDGs. Uh, we very much look forward to continue to working with you. Uh, uh, I'm a cognizant of time, so I want to uh, finish my concluding remark here. And I uh, would ask you to continue to participate in the next four uh, side events back to back uh, on very interesting uh, topics. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Kim, um, and all the speakers indeed at that event, which was uh, very illuminating and, and described a lot of very exciting initiatives being undertaken under the, under the broad uh, rubric of the Hand in Hand initiative. Um, so in the interest of time now, we're going to move to the next, quickly to move to the next side event, which is on the Asia Pacific Water Scarcity Program. So I'll turn that over to Louise Whiting now, who will serve as the moderator. Louise, please go ahead. Thank you, David. Thank you all. There's apologies from me for the late start for this event. I do hope all of my speakers are still online. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and all participants, good afternoon. My name is Louise Whiting, and I lead the Water Scarcity Program for FAO from the Regional Office in Bangkok. I'm sure you all agree today that the issue we are focusing on is one of the most serious that we will tackle this century. It is, am I still on? Continue. Okay. <laughs> the increasing water scarcity that all countries are experiencing and the negative impact this is having on our food security, farming communities and our environment is one of the most serious issues we will tackle this century. Now, I want to start by highlighting that in this region, we have many different types of water scarcity. We have absolute or acute water scarcity in countries such as Pakistan, India, China and Iran. But then we are also seeing a newer but also very serious trend in seasonal water scarcity. And this is the type of scarcity experienced in monsoonal Southeast Asia, where dry season competition for water coupled with more frequent and intense droughts is leading to increasingly stressed water supplies. And then finally, we have the Pacific Islands. We've had a side event on that already today. 
And these countries face very unique water scarcity challenges. They are reliant on limited and usually over exploited groundwater supplies. And these supplies are very vulnerable to pollution, saltwater intrusion and climate extremes. Now, agriculture is the major consumer of fresh water in this region. And it is therefore from within the agriculture sector that we need to take action. So today I am pleased to announce that FAO has been working hard in developing an Asia Pacific water scarcity program that will support member countries in taking practical steps to manage water scarcity in a changing climate. Specifically, the program will help countries to help put in place the fundamental building blocks of a sustainable and climate resilient water management system. In essence, this requires regular water accounting and that this is being linked to, trans, to transparent and enforceable water allocation frameworks. So the program has already made significant progress. We've conducted assessments of country capacities in modeling, produced new knowledge products on remote sensing, water tenure, gender and irrigation benchmarking. And we have developed an innovative, innovative new tool and package to help water managers achieve real water savings in agriculture. And in just a few months, FAO, in partnership with Australia, will publish a comprehensive regional policy and governance analysis that will help us determine how to target our next investments under the program. So we have come a long way, but there is still a long way to go. And today we are very fortunate to be joined by an excellent panel of high level country representatives and experts who have been working alongside us on this important issue. These eminent speakers, possess a wide range of valuable insights and experience that will help us move forward in tackling water scarcity together. So time is extremely short. So without further ado, I will invite our first distinguished speaker, Dr. Surasi Kiditimon, is the Secretary General of the Office for the National Water Resources in Thailand and a close partner of the Asia Pacific Water Scarcity Program. Dr. Surasai, the floor is yours. Good afternoon from Thailand. I'm Surasi Kittimonton, Secretary General of the Office of the National Water Resources. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here today for the FAO Water Scarcity Program Science Event. Today, I will give you a brief introduction of water scarcity management in Thailand. Thailand is one of many countries that experience fast and dark factory. Uh, every year, as well as high fluctuation and vulnerability to water shortages in many areas due to increased demand for water and climate change. Currently, there has been less rainfall in the catchment areas of large scale dams during the last four to five years, resulting in extremely low of water levels in the dam. Uh, leading to a reduction or suspension of water supply to the agricultural sector, affecting farmers and food production eventually. As a result, in 2017, ONWR was established to manage the country's water resources for water security by pushing for four pillars in water resource management, which are the 20 years water master plan. The second one is the law or water resource act. The third pillar is the water management organization. And the last pillar is uh, of uh, knowledge, innovation and technology. Thailand's current water management has embraced the sufficient economy philosophy and the sustainable development goals for balance uh, sustainable and comprehensive development to the implementation of a uh, 20 year master plan on water resources management with six strategies. The first strategy is uh, management of uh, water consumption. The second one is water security in the production sector. The third one is fast management. The fourth strategy is uh, water quality management and conservation of water resources. The fifth is conservation and restoration of decayed watersheds, forests, as well as soil erosion prevention. And the last one in, uh, is management to serve as framework and guideline 
for addressing challenge and enhancing water resources of the country that have a significant impact on the people. This also supports socioeconomic development by serving as the world's primary production base to support cultivation and food production. The guidelines for water allocation in Thailand during the dry season are that we must well, evaluate the availability of water from this reservoir and water storage at the end of the rainy season. Then allocate water in the dry season based on the priorities of water demands in all sectors. The water allocation plan during the dry season for consumption must be adequate throughout the dry season and cover the beginning of the rainy season. As for the allocation of water for agriculture, it will be allocated from the surplus water availability from other allocations. So in each dry season, we have decided to use flexible water allocation measures such as the season planning by indicating between relevant agencies and proposing it to the cabinet for approval, adjusting the plan during the season according to the situation, and summarizing the result and lesson learned at the end of the season in order to strengthen the plans for the next season. Water tense and direction in the future in Thailand are expected to be highly probable. Uh, that the availability of storage water will be less over many years, affecting water allocation to the agricultural sector. There is already a big negative impact on farmer incomes and food security due to climate change. This uh, problem is going to be more serious in the future. Considering this, while Thailand's policy of aiming to be the green kitchen of the world uh, is, is necessary to establish more stable water availability for the agricultural sector by focusing on and uh, accelerating the action on the second strategy in the water master plan, uh, developing water security in the food production sector, adding strategy or measure to address climate change, and adaptation to the problem of water scarcity in the agricultural sector. Finally, I would like to express my sincere thanks to the FAO for recognizing the significant and pushing forward the water scarcity program in Thailand, as well as the support of Australia to make this project a success and serve as a guideline for further development in other aspects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General. Thailand is obviously making really impressive strides towards the better management of water scarcity. It's really great to see. I think in particular, your dry season allocation plans are really ambitious. They are what is needed. And FAO and Australia and others really look forward to working together with you as we move forward. Thank you very much. Next, we shift focus to Vietnam. It's another valued partner of the Water Scarcity Program. And I'm pleased to invite Ms. Toy An, who's from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment to present on behalf of Vietnam. Ms. An, the floor is yours. Um, so hello, everyone. So thank you for your invitation. Thank you for inviting us. So uh, from Vietnam, we have the representative from the Monterey Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment uh, with, uh, the, with um, the participating of um, the, the Director General as well as the Deputy Director General. But today I would like to give you a brief uh, overview of the water scarcity management in Vietnam on behalf of them. So uh, with the background, uh, can you please move to the next slide, please? Um, so Vietnam has uh, 3,450 rivers and stream with a length of 10 kilometers and more. The total annual runoff is um, 835 million cubic meter but the shortest of water is 
aggravated in six to seven month dry season when the runoff is only 15 to 30 percent of this total. So as you can see from the chart, more than 50 percent of river basins in Vietnam are already will and will suffer from the water shortage and the situation is predicted to get worse over the years. Next, please. Uh, next, next slide, please. So the rising threats against Vietnam's water supply could reduce the nation GDP by 6% by the year of 2033, according to a World Bank report. And there are many reasons behind these problems, but some outstanding ones to be mentioned are transboundary water dependency, unevenly distributed in space and time, the low efficiency of water exploitation and use, the escalating water demand, the low access to clean, safe water, degrading water quality, inadequate forest and water sources protections, and increasing impact of climate change and water-related risks. Next, please. Um, Vietnam has been facing with the risk of drought and local water shortage in many provinces. Um, and the drinking well water uh, contaminated with lead, iron, um, arsenic will affect the digestive system, skin diseases, and long-term use will increase in possibility of cancer. And when the access to clean water is limited, the conflict will increase. Another point worth considering is that the agriculture in the central regions to the central highlands of the and the Mekong Delta is experiencing unusually dry condition, limited to limited source of irrigation water, leading to thousands of acres of crops are affected, which will weaken the economy and increase the poverty. Next slide, please. And the ongoing water crisis in Vietnam is threatening the country's sustainable development. So therefore, it is necessary to come up with solutions and key tasks for the water sector to tackle water scarcity. Firstly, uh, we need to continue to strengthen the legal framework. Uh, secondly, we have to focus on reviewing and supplementing formulating and approving plans, master plan and strategies related to water resources. Um, for example, the National Water Plan and the River Basin Water Plan has been implemented in Vietnam. So thirdly, we need to upgrade and repair facilities and develop a national irrigation network in the near future. Uh, capacity building, accountability and coordination between levels and sectors also very important. Then we have to consider water as an economic good, promote water accounting and assessment, bring water resources back to its true value. And also education and awareness raising are also very important. Last but not least is to promote international cooperations. Like we are having a workshop here with the existing efforts and determinations we hope to strengthen the collaborations and with other countries and to learn from international best practice. The supports consultations as well as practical uh, experience are extremely important to the water sector development in Vietnam to cope with water uh, scarcity. Next, please. So to conclude, um, now, to conclude uh, my brief presentations, uh, we have to say that water scarcity is not only a national problem, but also a global one. I hope that this water scarcity program would effectively contribute to address the alarming problems and to turn the water scarcity situation from emergency to recovery from water from water scarcity in Vietnam and in the regions. So on behalf of DWRM and Monray, I would like to thank 
FAO for developing the program and conducting this fruitful workshop and sections. I wish you all good health and wish the workshop a great success. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anne. I think it would be a surprise to many people that Vietnam suffers from, from water scarcity, but you've made it very clear that it is a serious and growing issue and that your government is taking it very seriously. It's really great to see. It's also good that you raised the issue of water pollution, which is obviously a really key driver of water scarcity in Vietnam and in many of your neighbouring countries. And on your final point on regional collaboration, that is good to hear also because that is a core pillar of the water scarcity program. We're really looking forward to bringing you together with practitioners from your neighboring countries to start to work through these issues together. We do think there's a lot you can learn from one another. So next, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. John Dorr, who is the lead water specialist for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia. Now, Australia is a country in this region that has shown that it is very possible to support a high agricultural productivity in the face of extreme water scarcity. Australia has many decades of reform experience and a deep pool of technical expertise that can be drawn upon in supporting other countries in the region as they try to improve their water management systems. So we look forward to hearing from some of this today. John, over to you. Thank you, Louise. And uh, good afternoon, Dr. Surasri, colleagues from Vietnam and everybody else online. Australia appreciates this invitation for the session very much. Why? Well, uh, as Louise has pointed out, water scarcity is a huge issue for Australia, as it is for so many Asia Pacific members of the FAO. All of us are on a journey trying to better manage our precious water resources. The key steps we have taken might be summarized as including the following ingredients. Uh, and if any of you uh, follow cricket, um, there's a cricket 11. So I've got 11 quick points that I think are, are sort of important parts when we remember what we're, we're doing. Number one, we've had a very strong national water initiative negotiated by all governments in our federation. Uh, that started in 2004. Number two, legislation, a Water Act of 2007 is an important step in our sort of evolution. Number three, entitlements and allocations, requiring titles and measuring. Number four, transboundary river basin organization, Murray-Darling Basin Authority is uh, one of our uh, prominent institutions. Number five, sustainable diversion limits, including environmental flows and other things like buybacks, which I can't really go into in the time allowed. Number six, transboundary river basin planning, basin and sub-basin water sharing plans. Number seven, pricing, transparent charging of fees for services and volumes. Number eight, water trading. Markets in some connected systems. Sometimes it's, it's over, um, it's thought that we have markets all over the country. We don't, we have water markets in some of our connected systems. Number nine, a national water information system led by our Bureau of Meteorology. Number 10, a national hydrological modeling platform led by eWater Source. And very importantly for all of us, number 11, compliance. And we've certainly had to sort of uh, beef up our compliance mechanisms. So that is some of what we are doing. Um, now to the FAO water scarcity program being discussed at this meeting. Uh, Australia has been very pleased to participate in building the foundations or participating in building the foundations of this program. And we do look forward to ways to participating in its implementation. Australia will continue to learn as much as we can with you all. We'll also continue to share what we are doing with uh, all friends across the Asia Pacific, including, of course, with friends on this panel from Thailand and Vietnam. So in conclusion, thanks FAO colleagues for the work done thus far, and uh, Australia looks forward to uh, continuing to learn and work with you. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'm sure there are many people sitting in Bangladesh that follow cricket and understood your analogy. And thank you also for your valuable insights and the extensive support that Australia has already provided to the development of the Asia Pacific Water Scarcity Program. We're looking forward to the next steps. 
So now we have come to our final speaker. It gives me great pleasure to give the final word to my colleague from FAO headquarters in Rome, Mr. Maha Salman. Maha will provide a snapshot of the full breadth and depth of support that FAO can provide in this area, as well as providing some concluded, concluding remarks. Maha, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Lewis. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good morning on my side. Um, I would like to express my gratitude for having this highly topical discourse today. And from we have uh, already heard, I'm sure that the ACN Pacific Water Scarcity Program will bring valuable results towards sustainable and balanced water use to address water scarcity. It's all well said that water scarcity is a major threat to future advances in food security and poverty elevation. In fact, the State of Land and Water Resources for Food and Agriculture report released this year by FAO Land and Water Division warns us that water scarcity and pollution are putting key food production systems around the world at breaking points. We know that already more than 2.3 billion people live in water stress countries of which more than 733 million people live in countries with high and critical water stress. This requires coordinated and concerted efforts from all and at all levels. FAO, in fact, maintains multiple lines of work on water scarcity, just to name a few. We already heard about the Asia Pacific Water Scarcity Program. FAO has also a regional water scarcity initiative for the NENA region, supporting 20 countries spanning from the development of regional collaborative strategy to the provision of tools to inform decision making. At global level, the global framework on water scarcity in agriculture, the WASAG, hosted by the Land and Water Division, brings together key players across the globe to tackle the collective challenge of using water better in agriculture to ensure food security for all. To further support the global efforts, the Land and Water Division provides a range of actions to create synergies amongst all these initiatives. In terms of tools for optimal and sustainable allocation of scarce water resources, the VAPO tool actually is now being extended to, be, to become a global application and also the renewed global statistical database, the Aquastat is under upgrade to serve countries with the extended information. But enhanced cooperation and network are at the heart of linking regional and global efforts. The Land and Water Division is envisaging the expansion of this global work on water scarcity to provide means for technical support on innovation deployment, revisiting land and water management practices, the transformation of or for resilience, the evidence-based policy making and needs-based investment as well as knowledge management. All of this are for providing support to cope with water scarcity. The challenge is vast, the task is enormous, but our joint efforts and works are the guarantee that effective mechanisms will put in place. We stand ready to provide technical support through all possible means. At last, I thank you really very much and I wish you the greatest success. And let me hand it over to Mr. Sridhar Dharmapuri, the APRC chair. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you. My, my name is David Da. I'm just filling in for Mr. Dharmapuri while he's attending to other important business. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our colleagues in that last session for their very uh, diverse perspectives. On, on one of the most pressing issues for our, of our time in, term, in terms of making agri-food systems sustainable. 
So thank you very much for everything. That was a very interesting event. Um, in the interest of time, we're now going to move to our next site event, which is on the International Year of Millets 2023. And to moderate that event, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague from the regional office, uh, Bo. Bo, please go ahead. Thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Thaw. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever, wherever you are. Very welcome to the side event on the International Year of Millets 2023. I am Bao Zhou, Agriculture Officer at FAO Regional Office for Asia and Pacific. It is my great pleasure to convene this event. As you know, as you know the UN General Assembly in March 2021 adopted by consensus a resolution of declaration of the International Year of Millets 2023 which was sponsored by India okay, and supported so by uh, hmm, more than 70 amazing. other countries. The International Year of Millets will pave a smooth way to globalize this humble crop and maximize its nutritional and ecological benefits to producers, consumers, and environments. Today, we have four distinguished speakers from different institutes to provide you are inspiring and information, informative glimpse about the significance of the International Year of Millets 2023 and uh, this amazing crop. Without further ado, please allow me to invite our first speaker, Mr. Xiang Jingyuan, to deliver his opening remark. Mr. Xia is currently serving as director of the Division of Plant Production and Protection, FAO at Rome. His division is coordinating global actions or celebration of the International Year of Millets 2023 with our members and other stakeholders. Mr. Xia, the floor is yours. You have five minutes, please. Mr. Xia? Ms. Xia, are you in, are you online? Yes. Okay. Please unmute yourself. We cannot hear you. Okay. Mr. Xia, are you ready? Can you hear, uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. please. Okay. You have five minutes. Okay, good. <clears throat> Can I start or not? Yeah, <laughs> please, please, it's your time. Okay, I, yeah. thank you, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, moderator, dear chair, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you so this side events on the International Year of Minutes 2023. During the 36th session 
of FEO Regional Conference for Asia and the Pacific for hybrid events held in Dakar, Bangladesh. It is well known that next year we are going to celebrate International Year of Minutes, which should be once a lifetime opportunity for all of us. The International Year of Minutes was proposed by the government here, endorsed by the members at FBO conference body, 26 session of COAG, 170 session of EO Council, and the 41st FEO conference. And then finally, by the 75 sessions of a UN assembly. Minutes have a high nutritional content and are compared to other serious minutes are hardy, being able to grow in a relative poor soil and adverse and arid condition with the input. Minis are among the first and domesticated plants and have surfaced as a traditional stable for millions of people in South Saharan Africa, Asia, for over 7,000 years. Today, minis are cultivated all over the world. However, the cropland and the minage cultivation is declining in many countries. And then their potential to address food and the nutritional security, particularly in the region threatened by climate change, is not being fully utilized. Also, responses to a challenge the celebration of International Year of Minutes was proposed to advocate their importance and to promote the diversity, nutritional, and ecological benefit to producer, consumers, value chain actors, and the decision makers in order to improve agro food system. The major objectives of this International Year of Minutes are first, increase awareness and the contribution of minutes to food and the nutritional security. Second, inspire all stakeholders, including national governments, work towards improving sustainable production and the quality of minis. Number three, draw focus on enhanced investment in research and development, technical network and extension service. So therefore, in the national year of minutes, we're contributing to <coughs> achieving <coughs> UN sustainable development goal particularly SDG1, no poverty, SDG2, zero hunger, SDG3, good health and well-being, and SDG13, climate action. The Plant Production and Protection Division, NSP in the FAO, is coordinating the second and of International Year of Minutes and also providing support to its steering committee. So this activity, uh, and this P is promoting minutes for sustainable production and consumption in framework of transformation to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agro-food system for better, production.
for this end, and this is working on inclusive, resilient, and sustainable plant production and protection to maximizing yield through optimizing of a cropping system, promoting innovation and the green technology, and minimizing application chemical fertilizer and pesticides input, and of course, minimizing crop losses. Dear colleague, building on experience previous UN observance and the international year led by FEO, uh, such as International Year of Plant Health, IFIPH 2020, the International Year of Fruit and Vegetable, IY. FV 2021. Also, during committee will be established at FAO SOSP to oversee the development and improve implementation of a global action plan for celebration of International Year of Minutes 2023. In this framework, an opening ceremony on I. International Year of Menace will be hosted by FEO in December year. And then a series of collaborate activity and events will be organized during 2023. We will count on collaboration of each of you to ensure the proper advocacy on all relevant platform among the public, private, technical, research, society, and policy demands to ensure the International Year of Minutes achieving impact at the global, regional, and the national level. With this a few remark, I wish you all fruitful discussion and a successful side events. Thank you all over to you, moderator. Thank you very much, Mr. Xia, for your inspiring and very informative message on the significance of millets and objectives of the celebration of the International Year of Millets. FAO's warmest invitation for collaboration with public, private, technical research, civil society, and public domains to ensure the proper advocacy of the year has been well heard and much appreciated. Thanks again, Mr. Xia, for your excellent remarks. Now, I would like to invite our second speaker, Honorable Ms. Shabaha Tucker. She is currently serving as Joint Secretary, Crops, Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, India. Honorable Ms. Tucker, before you start, please allow me to ask my colleagues, Jane and Devin, to share the PowerPoint. <laughs> Okay. Now the floor is yours, Ms. Joint Mr. Joint Secretary. You have 10 minutes. Thanks. Uh, a very good morning, afternoon, and evening to all the delegates present here today. I thank the FAO for organizing this very important meeting in the 36th APRC. And it is my pleasure to represent India for this very important topic of bringing back the glory of millets. As the topic suggests, we have forgotten the benefit of millets. And as already pointed out by the distinguished speakers ahead of me, how important millets are from not only the nutritional point of view, but also from the point of view of climate change and having the sustainable development goals. So I will take you through the journey of what India proposes to do for bringing back the glory of millets. Next slide, please. So as already mentioned, uh, uh, India took a lead role in the declaration for the International Year of Millets 2023. And I must place on record my gratitude to the FAO for steering this and for taking it forward. And before this uh, declaration also, in the year 2018, India had uh, declared the year 2018 as a national year of millets. And 
during from the time of 2018 to 2023, we have taken a number of steps to ensure that the millets are brought back to their glory. And we took a number of interventions on all sides involving all the stakeholders from the year 2018 till the, till the present date. So our journey has been a very consistent one and we will continue on this journey and uh, take forward it to the next year of 2023. Next. So I don't need to mention to most of you, but millets are a collective group of small seeded annual grasses, and they can be grown on marginal lands and in dry areas and in subtropical and tropical regions. So this is their benefit. They can be grown in very, very hardy conditions, in uh, rain-fed conditions where there's less water. So it is a very good hardy crop. In India, we have a number of millets, the barnyard millet, little millet, kodo millet, finger millet, jowar, pearl millet, foxtail millet. The variety is enormous and the, the, uh, the scope is enormous for increasing the production in India and also around the world. I would like to inform the distinguished delegates here that the earliest evidence for millets was found in the year 3000 BC. And it is one of the most ancient food grains which was domesticated for food. So the glory is from that time itself. And it is now our challenge and endeavor to see how we can bring it back on the plates and on, on our dining tables of the modern people, of the millennials, of the future generations. And it is grown in 131 countries and it is a traditional food for 59 crore people in Asia and Africa alone. So this is the potential of the millets. Next. Basically, I just, uh, in 2018, uh, India had also uh, taken out a notification where we declared millets as nutri cereals. So we use the word millets and nutri cereals in the same uh, uh, length and breadth. So the millets or nutri cereals, if you see the global scenario, the area under millets uh, in the Americas is around 53 lakh hectares. The production is 193 lakh tons. The area in Africa, of course, is much, much higher, 489 lakh hectares, and production is 423 lakh ton. And in Asia, it is 162 lakh hectares, and the production is 215 lakh tons. So it is spread all over the world. And in Australia, it is a 9 lakh hectare, and production is 12 lakh ton. Next slide, please. Coming to the Indian scenario, India has many agroecological zones, but millets are grown mostly in, uh, in, the, in the states of Rajasthan, Haryana, UP, Maharashtra, Karnataka. So all these states are rich, the top five millet producing states in India. And out of those millets which are produced in India, the, the most popular millet is the bajra or the pearl millet. And this is grown in the Kharif season, which is the season uh, after the monsoon rains where the sowing will take place in the months of July. So bajra is the most grown millet in India and it has a production of 10.86 million tons. And this contributes to 60.5% of the total millets produced in India. So in India, we will uh, focus on a large uh, campaign and a large uh, effort to increase the area under Bajra even more, increase the area and also the productivity of Bajra uh, in, for pearl, pearl millet in the, in the coming season of Kharif, for which the plans have already started. The next important millet in India is Jawar or Sorghum. And this is the production of 4.78 million tons. And it contributes to 26.6% of the total production. This is also a very good millet, which is produced in India. The next is Ragi or finger millet which is 1.96 million tons. And this contributes to 10.96% uh, uh, of the total production. We have a number of small millets, which I also showed in the last slide. Uh, they are uh, kodo, kutki, very minor millets they are called, which the production is 0.35 million tons, but they have their own uses and very, very high nutritional values. But I, I'm pleased to inform all of you that India produces 80% of Asia's and 20% of the global production. So, and the, uh, why the global average yield is 1229 kg per hectare, but the Indian yield is 1239 kg per hectare. So that is why in, India is poised to take forward this millet revolution. And I'm thankful to all the countries who supported the uh, resolution for India, a resolution to declare the year 2023 
as International Year of the Millets. Next. So I just wanted to show you how the uh, area of millets declined over the uh, period. Uh, earlier, uh, before the, the Green Revolution, as all of you know, the Green Revolution in India, which was basically the revolution for rice and wheat, where we started producing more rice and wheat for the country for food security purposes. So before uh, the Green Revolution, the millets uh, area was, was much, much more. And now it has in fact decreased uh, to a great extent. And, and now the millets is only 6% uh, uh, of the uh, 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 total food grain basket. So up to, up to 1965-70, it was 20% 20, 20 of the total food grain basket. And now we are just at 6% of the food grain basket because now our food grain basket is mostly rice and wheat. So this is something which we have to uh, uh, address and which we are, we are addressing. We are taking it very seriously. And our challenge is to take, take back some areas, back to millets from the rice and wheat areas in, under crop diversification. And because it, it is equally important for food nutrition. Next. So what has India done uh, so far for uh, uh, taking forward uh, the, the International Year of Millets? So this is being uh, monitored at the highest level in India. And uh, we have basically made seven themes or seven sutras as we call it in Hindi. So the seven themes which we have identified, the first and foremost important theme is the enhancement of production and productivity because unless and until we increase the production productivity, the rest of the things cannot uh, take place. So it, for this, India has a large number of programs, starting from uh, assistance for seed production, ensuring that the right seeds reach the farmers, the high yielding varieties, the seeds as per the zones, and the seeds which the farmers can uh, use again and again to increase their productivity. And we also undertake large number of demonstrations we have a very robust uh, research mechanism in India. We have the Indian Council of Agricultural Research who help us in researching the latest varieties and suggesting which varieties are best for which regions and which states. We have a very uh, robust cooperation with them. And uh, of course, for millets, what has been uh, felt that value addition is the most important thing to make them more popular because millets have a large number of users you can make them into pasta, you can make cookies, you can make pizza bases, you can make so many things. In fact, we have taken out a, a book also on uh, recipes which can be used around the world. And I will be happy to share that book with the FAO and uh, through an e-version and, and also send some physical copies. So you can see how versatile the millets are, but our challenge lies in the value addition for the millets. So the food processing will pay, play a very, very much important role in this. We need to develop uh, good machinery and equipment which can take care of the processing. So this is one, the second theme which we have uh, focused upon. Recipe development, we have spoken to the um, my biggest chefs in India. They're very much excited about this, uh, uh, this venture of the Indian government and, and, uh, and of course internationally. And recently in the Dubai uh, Expo, we showcased the millets, how they can be eaten. We had special millet dishes in the India Pavilion. So a, a lot of awareness was created in that uh, Dubai Expo also. Entrepreneurship and startup and collective development is very important. As all of you know, India uh, has a large number of small and marginal farmers. So we need to, uh, have these farmer producer organizations working collectively. And in fact, we already have a very, very uh, uh, good number of startups who are uh, producing their millets, who are uh, value adding, who are making ready to eat and ready to cook dishes so that they can be used not only in the Indian domestic market, but also uh, can be used in the uh, markets for export because millets uh, are getting more and more popular. So the next, which brings me to my next theme, which is nutrition and health benefits. Uh, it's already been mentioned that it's highly nutritive. It has high fiber. It has a, a very, very uh, low glycemic index. Uh, they are free from gluten. So the, the, however much I say, the, it cannot be denied that the millets are very, very nutritious and very healthy. And so this is one part, but we need to educate the masses about this. So that is one thing which is lacking. 
um, many foods have gained popularity, quinoa and so many others. But millet somehow uh, that popularity is yet to reach to the masses. Uh, a large number of people are aware of it. A large number of very, very fancy restaurants and five-star hotels are, are also aware. But our challenge is to bring this awareness to the masses about the nutrition and health benefits of millets. This is one of our major challenges. So we will undertake a lot of uh, studies. We will put the literature out there for everybody to read what is the benefit and how uh, you can use millets in your daily diets to, uh, to uh, combat uh, uh, nutritional deficiencies also, and also the health benefits of combating heart disease and diabetes. So awareness creation is, I think, the most, most important uh, role which all of you can play, FAO uh, as an organization, the uh, UN, uh, the all the And uh, so this awareness creation is the next theme which we want to uh, uh, reach out. Of course, international outreach, the whole uh, International Year of Minutes will focus upon uh, various uh, conferences, seminars, workshops, uh, road shows, and how uh, we can, as, as a collective effort, uh, reach this uh, uh, to the whole world because of uh, the important role which Minutes plays in in the tackling the uh, in tackling the environmental issues also and of course india will take a policy interventions wherever necessary to ensure that uh, the international year of millets is a huge success next please i'll just finish in 2 minutes so investment in the millet ecosystem is very important so we need to increase the acceptance of the millets uh, as a nutritious food uh, the relative water requirement is very low and uh, in, as compared to cereal crops so they are the future to ensure sustainable supply of grains. This, this message has to go out there. And of course, the investments in the millet ecosystem will, will largely impact the small and marginal farmers. It will increase their income. Next, please. So already 500 startups are there in the millet value chain. We have, a, uh, we have interaction with them on a regular basis. We listen to their problems and we try to address them. But of course, we have a long way to go and we are tackling these. And uh, by the uh, 2023, once it is there, we will have a lot, lots of new uh, interventions in place. We'll have uh, many uh, policy decisions which will help the millets. We have a very, very uh, um, uh, good institute in India, which is a dedicated to millet research called the Indian Institute of Millet Research. And they help the startups to a great extent. They have lots of machinery and equipment and uh, they handhold the millet ecos, uh, the millet startups uh, to po popularize the millets. And we've already, uh, uh, we fund these uh, startups from both the government of India and also the private sector too is showing a lot of interest in the millet uh, uh, startup regime. And uh, I hope that they will support the millet startups. They showed a lot of interest in the Dubai Expo also where we had the, uh, the investors, they listened to the startups and uh, we, we saw some very good results over there. And as I mentioned, it, the, millet, the value chain of millets is the potential is enormous, uh, right from primary, progress, primary processing to ready to eat uh, breakfast cereals, millet coffee, pizza flowers, porridge, flakes, puffs. So many things are there which millets can be used in. Next. And of course, uh, I'm very grateful to the FAO to set up a steering committee for this. And uh, uh, we, we, will, we are looking forward to the, uh, uh, to the formal notification and how the steering committee can guide the international community to take uh, to uh, address the issues pertaining to millets and how the, the whole world can come together and make the International Year of Millets a great success. I look forward to the role of the FAO steering committee. Thank you very much. Next. Uh, so I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Ms. Taka, for your inspiring message. We also would like to extend our high appreciation to the government of India to sponsor the resolution of the Declaration of the International Year of Millet 2023, which aims to advocate the globalization of this humble crop to maximize its myriad of values to benefit people in the world. As exactly you highlighted, let us work together to bring back the glory of millets. Thanks again for your excellent presentation, Honorable Mr. Taka. Now 
let's us let us move to our next speaker, Dr. Jacqueline Hugh, Hughes, Director General of International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics. Dr. Hughes, Hughes has vast experience in leading multidisciplinary teams in Asia and Africa. She is a recognized leader in international agricultural research and, and management. Dr. Hughes, the floor is yours. You have five minutes, please. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Xia, Ms. Takuo, Mr. Li, distinguished colleagues, it's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to talk about millets and what needs to be done before, during, and after the International Year of Millets 2023 to ensure that millets are strongly positioned in sustainable agriculture and our diets. Millets and many other cereals, such as Fonio, Teff, and others, were and still are a part of the diets of many communities around the world. But with the rise of industrialized agriculture, the food diversity on our plates has reduced, the crop diversity in our agricultural systems has reduced, and only the crops amenable to large scale industrialized farming, as Shubhat Kako said, rice, wheat, and maize have come to dominate our diets. So forgotten crops, traditional crops, also known in our literature as neglected and underutilized, cover the huge spectrum of food and industrial uses. While they're called forgotten crops, this whole range of crops are not forgotten by those who grow and eat them. These crops, such as millets, are characterized by six things, which Ms. Thakur touched on. Underfunding for research and development. Two, little attention from agricultural extension services. Three, weak and underdeveloped value chains. Four, a lack of awareness about their nutritional value. Five, a perception that they are a poor farmer's crop. And six, low interest among farmers and industry due to the lack of consumer pull. So the neglect of these crops, millets in this context, continues in today's landscape, where there's limited funding within countries for these crops in terms of the agriculture and nutrition budgets. Millions of dollars of venture capital funding are pouring into agri-tech startups, focused on the big three, wheat, rice, and maize, or on high value crops, vegetables, fruits. It's easy to see how millets have been overlooked. They grow in the semi-arid or dry land regions, usually, away from where the industrialized agriculture started. ICRISAT, the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, based in Hyderabad, India, develops millet varieties for Asia and Africa, resistant to insect pests and diseases, that limit the production, as well as improve, with improved tolerance to abiotic stresses, heat, drought, poor soils. Icrisat develops millet varieties that are high yielding, early maturing. Develops millet varieties with a higher level of mineral micronutrients, iron and zinc, which are naturally found in pearl millet, and develops millet varieties that have the appropriate characteristics for increased use as feed, fodder, and for industrial use. To see a resurgence in demand, millets require action at different levels, a simultaneous top-down, bottom-up approach. It needs specific policies by national governments to mainstream these crops as part of the food and nutrition strategies. These policies could include subsidies for farmers because we have to stimulate the supply side. Maybe subsidies for the agri-food industry because we have to stimulate the demand side so that the crop can then settle in the value chain. We need to look at productivity. If you saw the map earlier, there was a huge discrepancy between land area under cultivation and yield. So, we need to improve crop management and make sure we have the right varieties for the different environments. 
Agricultural research institutes have a role in genetic improvement of the crops and to develop hybrids and varieties that give higher yields, greater resistance to pests, tolerance to diseases, and they must have market and consumer preferred traits, such as increased shelf life. For example, pearl millet, we need to delay or eliminate flower rancidity because on the shelf, after a while, the flower becomes rancid. We also need to make sure that the crops we produce are suitable for machine processing, amongst other things. We heard just now about agri-food processing. The research institutes with the startups can develop, use the developed varieties, and then invest in R&D of ready-to-cook, ready-to-eat products for our changing lifestyles. The entrepreneurs need to be encouraged with technical backstopping and funding, venture capital perhaps, to support them. And we need to improve the value chains, and they're not linear, so I tend to say value web of millets. With appropriate positioning and information, there will be an increased demand for millets when the consumers are made aware of the nutritional and ecological benefits of growing and consuming them. The narrative of food and nutrition security has to be expanded in the International Year of Millets to include millets, which will hopefully no longer be a forgotten crop, so that we can move to a more nutritious, sustainable diets and sustainable agriculture, particularly with the impact of climate change. What crop is more appropriate in the semi-arid areas? So this all calls for fresh thinking around transforming our current food production with millets before, during, and after the International Year of Millets 2023. We can't stop at the end of 2023. With millets, we can move towards a more healthy, nutritious, sustainable, climate resilient, diverse, and profitable food system. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you very much, Dr. Hughes, for your very comprehensive and informative, informative lecture. We are very much appreciate for ECOSAT's ambition on the research development program on millets to promote sustainable agriculture and nutritious and healthy diets under your leadership. We envision tremendous collaboration opportunities with your institute in the celebration of the International Year of Millets 2023 at global, regional, and national levels. Thanks again for your excellent talk. Now let us move to our last speaker of the event, Mr. Warren Lee, Senior Nutrition and the Food System Officer at FAO Regional Office for Asian Pacific in Bangkok. Mr. Lee coordinates food systems and nutrition related policy program and research in the region. He serves the regional focal point of UN decade of action or nutrition. Before you start your presentation, allow me to ask my colleagues, Jane and Devin to share the PowerPoint. Now, please take the floor, Ms. Lee. You have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Paul. Can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Great. Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon, good uh, evening, and also good morning to uh, colleagues and dis distinguished guests from different parts of the world. Um, I enjoy listening to the presentation from the previous speakers on the importance of uh, minutes. Uh, for food security and nutrition, and also for the climatic resilience. Uh, in my presentation, I'm going to uh, focus on the topic of the nutritional values of uh, millets. Next, please. Uh, millets are cereal crops for many people's diet. So our previous speaker, uh, Dr. Taka, has already mentioned and uh, millets are stable crops in giant zones of uh, many countries in Asia and Africa. And um, there are many types of millets and uh, Dr. Tucker also uh, 
uh, described in her, in her previous uh, presentation. And we know, all know that 97% of the minutes are produced in developing countries. And minutes uh, is very resilient. It can grow in land with limited inputs like uh, limited water resources, uh, limited uh, use of uh, fertilizers. And so also millets has been used as human food for over thousands of years. And now it's uh, mainly consumed in low and medium income countries. Whereas in uh, industrialized countries, millets are only used as animal feeds. Um, there are many important sources of um, uh, macro and micronutrients uh, in the millets that are very important for the poorest people in the low and medium income, income countries. And uh, millet, because of its uh, texture, is also called coarse grain or poor man's crops. But it has a lot of uh, nutrition and health benefits that we need to promote. So as the previous speakers said, the consumption of millet as human food has declined significantly over the world in the past 30 years. It is due to the fact that uh, most government policies have been to incentivize farmer cereal grain production, for example, maize, wheat, and rice um, as subsidized price. And also there's a lack of awareness of the consumers on the nutritional benefits of um, millets. And because of the time used to cook millets take a bit longer. So food preparation is a bit, you know, the um, uh, inconvenient. So we need to offer we need to address this issue. And there's also lack of processing technologies and diversity of uh, millet products available for the consumers. So next, please. Here are the nutritional, nutritional benefits of millets. So the protein, iron, carbohydrate contents are somewhat comparable to, to those of wheat, rice, and cereal, and maize cereal. And millets contain good sources of B complex vitamins, vitamin B1, B2, B3, and also folic acid. Um, it's also a rich source of a dietary fiber. However, the phytic acid content and the tannin content in the millet might reduce the bioavailability of this mineral absorbed in the gut. For example, iron, zinc, and copper might be affected, but when we remove phytic acid and tannin, from the uh, outer uh, layer of the uh, minutes that would have to reduce you know, the, uh, the content of phytate and tannin, thereby increasing bioavailability of mineral absorption. Millet also contains a lot of bioactive compounds like phytochemicals, antioxidants, for example, polyphenols, nicknin, uh, phytosteroids, phytoestrogen, so on and so forth. It has health promotion effect, and it also has been proven you know, to prevent non-communicable diseases, including cancer. And more research needs to be done you know, in the millet, and it's a health benefit in human being. Millet is almost gluten-free, so it suits people with gluten allergy and also celiac disease. And it's true that the millet is also low in the uh, glycemic index. It's also good for people with uh, diabetics and glucose intolerance. Next, please. So here, I try to compare the nutrient contents of millets and sorghum with those of uh, commonly uh, consumed cereal products like wheat, rice, quinoa, and also maize. So I try to compare sorghum, uh, uh, little millets could do uh, millet uh, to those of the um, wheat, uh, whole wheat, brown rice, polished rice, quinoa, and, and maize uh, with respect to the energy content, protein content, dietary fiber content, carbohydrate content, and iron content. When you look at the orange color columns and compare to those um, in the uh, same column, but in blue color, you find that uh, the no matter energy, protein, dietary fiber, carbohydrate, and iron contents, uh, these 
uh, nutrient contents of minerals are comparable to those of uh, wheat, brown rice, polished rice, quinoa, and maize. Next slide, please. Again, for vitamins and uh, for vitamin content, uh, I also compared, you know, millets against, you know, wheat, brown rice, polished rice, uh, quinoa, and maize. Um, these nutrients are thymine, vitamin B1, fibrofathrin, B2, niacin, B3, folic acid, or total folate in this case, and also beta carotene, which is a precursor of uh, vitamin A. Um, so thymine, fibrofathrin, niacin, and, fol and uh, niacin are comparable to those of wheat, brown rice, polished rice, quinoa, and maize, and even higher than polished rice because polished poly rice is highly refined. And all the uh, good content, you know, the endosperm, sperm, uh, endosperm, and the sperm part of the uh, seeds have been removed. However, for folic acid and beta carotene level, uh, millets and sorghum have higher uh, contents of um, um, folic, uh, folate and beta carotene when compared to other uh, cereal products. So you can see that uh, uh, millets have nutrient contents more or less similar to uh, those, you know, the common cereals, but with some nutrient content like folic acid and also uh, beta carotene, they are higher than that of uh, um, other cereals. Next, please. So how to improve, you know, consumption of millets? I will look at this issue from the um, supply side and demand side of millets. From the supply side, as the previous speakers already mentioned, uh, although millets are being used uh, in the world, but the using rate is pretty low. In many countries, uh, millets are underutilized. So we need to promote millets as a, as a underutilized crops in their country's agricultural diversification program in order to diversify the stable crops uh, production and a variety of stable crops to supply more nutritious food for all. And also the government needs to provide incentives and support to the farmer to encourage them to um, uh, grow more millets for food and also for uh, generating income, for example, by means of uh, price subsidies and also to work with uh, farmers and the government need to work with the SMEs for value addition of processed millet products. We need to diversify the products so that you know, it will be more appealing to the consumers. On the demand side, uh, we have to uh, increase awareness of consumers on the nutritional benefits of millets. And not just the healthy consumer, even people who are sick, like people with uh, uh, um, uh, disorder of diabetics, um, uh, celiac diseases, right? uh, gluten uh, intolerance, you know, they need to be aware of this option of stable that can be included in their diets. And also we need to improve the recipes and cooking methods like what um, Dr. Thakka from uh, India has already mentioned. This is very important you know, to improve the recipes so that you know, people would like to enjoy this food in a new, uh, in a new look and a new uh, taste and texture. And also to improve the convenience of cooking of this uh, uh, stable food in order to suit the modern day lifestyles. Um, and also the government should consider to use you know, social protection and public procurement schemes. For example, you know, school feeding program uh, and also the social protection uh, programs, for example, cash transfer or conditional cash transfer to um, promote you know, this uh, food uh, for those uh, vulnerable people so that you know, it would be able to um, in, uh, improve their nutrition at the same time to uh, uh, increase the awareness of, um, of these um, very uh, nutritious foods. Next, please. So in my conclusion, um, we all learned that uh, millets are traditional stable crops in the world, in many cultures. Its con consumption as uh, human foods has declined over the last 30 years. And the millets can be promoted as underutilized crops for, for the country's uh, aqua, um, agricultural diversification 
in order to supply more nutritious food. And the nutrition profile of the millets are comparable to those of whole grain, wheat, rice, and maize. And also we need more research on the benefits of millets on health and nutrition, and also on the environmental impacts in midst of climate change. And more work is needed in the public and public sectors to improve millet supplies, consumer awareness, and the demands for millets as human foods. So this is timely that uh, next year, the UN has uh, named uh, 2023 as the International Year of Millets. So we would have a year of time to promote uh, consumption and production of millet. As Dr. Hughes mentioned, you know, the, um, the work uh, for the International Year of Millets should not end at uh, in December 2023. We should continue the momentum into the future so that we can add one more stable crop into uh, people's diet so that you know, they can enjoy uh, better food and also more nutritious food for their families. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Lee, for your ex excellent talk. Uh, also, thanks very much for, for you to have a very good conclusion. So with this, I would like to invite, <coughs> I would like to invite all of us to give a big applause to all our four distinguished speakers for their excellent lectures. And I would like to conclude our event now. Ms. Do, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, yes, thank you very much, Bo. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for participating in this very important event uh, to increase awareness of the International Year of Millets 2023. We value your participation and we hope this was interesting for all of the listeners out there. Uh, the next two side events are on the UN Decade of Family Farming and the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022. Uh, given that we're running behind time, I would like to kindly ask the speakers, all of the speakers at both of those events uh, to keep, if possible, to keep their interventions uh, very succinct. Um, so thank you very much. With, with that, I will turn it over now to Pierre for the, um, to moderate the event on the UN Decade of Family Farming. Pierre, please go ahead. Thank you, David. Uh, Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and all participants, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pierre Ferrand. I'm an agriculture officer and the regional focal point for the UN Decade of Family Farming for FAO in the Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific in Bangkok. So a warm welcome to all of you for this side event on the UN Decade of Family Farming, UNDFF in short. It's my great pleasure and honor to moderate today's event, which will provide an update to member countries of the Asia and Pacific region about the progress in the implementation of the UNDFF. The event will feature different national and sub-regional action plan and will give the opportunity to share some of the most relevant achieved results and plan activity at the global level. It aims at reiterating the critical role of family farmers in both facilitating effective response to the pandemic and transforming food system into healthier, more resilient and more sustainable ones. Now to start off the event, it is with great honor that I invite His Excellency Mr. Batsuri Gombo Dorge, Vice Minister for Food, Agriculture and Light Industry of Mongolia to deliver his opening remark. He will be speaking in Mongolian, so I encourage you to switch to the English channel for the translation. Excellency, the floor is yours. Ирхэм өндөд сайд нар засгийн газрын гүшүүд ийч төлөөлөгчтэй эрхэмсэг очд ноёд хатагтай нараа та бүгдээ энэ өдрийн минь төгшүүл яа. Миний би Монгол улсын засгийн газрыг төлөөлж нөхөө уралд оролцож уг хэлж байгаа нь нэр төрийн хэрэг юм. Энэ хурал нь хөгжиж буй болон хөгжингүй улс орнуудын хүн сүтэй чухал салбарт толгондож буй нэн жихэл уцуудлыг хөндөж байгаад би баяртай байна. 
эд хамтын үчээр хамгийн хүнд хэцүү нөхцөлд ажиллаж нөөц болцоогоо дотмо байдлыг даван тоолж улсын хүнсний аюулгүй байдлыг хангаж ард түмнээ хүнсээр тасралтгүй хангах нэн чухал үүргийг хариуцсан гүйсдэгдэг жижиг аж ахуй өрхлөгчд малчд болон тариалмжтын амжиргаа аж ахуйг дэмжих нь нэн чухал юм нөөбийн өрхийн тариалангийн 10 жил санаалт нь өрхийн аж ахуй өрхлөгчдийн өнөөгийн нөхцөл байдлыг өвчмтэй сайжруулахад нэн чухал төлхөц болох нь гарцааг юм бид хамтдаа доорх асуудлыг шийдэх боломжтой өвөнд хөдөө аж ахуй инновац технологи нэвтрүүлэх түүний салбарын бүтээмжийг сайжруулахад ашиглах зах зээл илүү сайн нэвтрэх жижиг дунд үйлдвэрүүдийг сайжруулахад дэд үцийг бий болгох өрхийн аж ахуйд үзүүлэх тусламж зүйлгээ өөрчлөхийг сайжруулах институцуудыг бэхжүүлэх доктортой орлого байгаль орчин дээлтэй үйлдвэрлэлийг хангах бодлогын орчныг сайжруулснаар өрхийн аж ахуй шин илүү доктортой сайн төвшөнд авчрах боломжтой юм өгч бие орнуудын хөдөө аж ахуйг шинжлэх өөрчлөх үйл ажиллагааны явцсан зөвхөн агар бизнес төвлөрч өрхийн аж ахуй хөдөлгчдөг орхитуулж эрхэвч болохгүй бид хөдөө аж ахуйг томоохон бизнесийн зааг уртаа зэрэгцүүлэн өрхийн аж ахуйч мөн дэмжсэн хөгжлийн загваруудыг хэрэгжүүлэх нь зүү тема Монгол улсын засгийн газар нөөбийн хүнс сэтэй аж ахуйн байгууллага болон бусад хөгжлийн төнш байгууллагуудын хамтын ажиллагааны үр дүнд хувийн бизнес болон өрхийн аж ахуйг хамтын ажиллагааг дэмжсэнээр бүтээн дээшлэх зах зээл гарах боломж нэмэгдэж өрхийн орлог нэмэгдсэн олон сайн туршлагуудыг бий болгосон. Үүнээс өрхийн үүнээс бид аливаа санаачлах төслөлтүүдийг засгийн газар болон хөгжлийн төнш байгууллагын үр дүнтэй сайн хамтын ажиллагаа дэмжсэнээр хамгийн үр дүнд хүрч болохыг харсан. Бидний хөсч буй ирээдүй бол залуучуудын сонирхлыг татхуулж өөрчлөлт чадвар сайтай өндөр орлогтой хөдөө аж ахуйн салбарыг бүтээж үр хөөхд маань сурч боловсрон эрүүл байх нөхцөлийг хангасан сайн хоол хүнс тэжээлээр өргөн хангацсан хангатгана ирээдүй юм. Ной татагтаа нараа хэрвээ бид өрхийн аж ахуй хөдөлгчдийг илүү бүтээмжтэй өөрчлөлт чадвартай болгоход нөөц болцоогоо төвлөрүүлвэл бидний хөсч буй ирээдүйд хөрөх боломжтой. Бид үүнийг гарцаагүй хийж чадна. Өрхийн аж ахуйг шинжилхийн тулд хөдөө аж ахуй чиглэлсэн олон улсын сайн туршлагуудыг ашиглах яа анхаарал тавьсан тавх нь баярлалаа хурлбанд амжилт хийсэн яа Thank you excellency for your very important message in regard to the urgency to transform the situation of smallholder farmers and support sustainable food system to better attract the youth. I now invite Dr. Marcela Villarreal, director of the Partnership and UN Collaboration Division in FAO headquarters. She will frame the UNDFF with the new strategic framework of FAO and provide an overview of the general result of the UNDFF in Asia. Dr. Villarreal, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Pierre. Uh, excellencies, uh, Mr. Gombodorj, uh, Vice Minister of Food, Agriculture and Light Industry of Mongolia, Dr. Hossein, Director of the SARC Agriculture Center, Ms. Leonora from the Department of Agriculture in the Philippines, and Ms. Benunia, dear Esther, Secretary General of the Asia Farmers Association. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Rome. It's a real pleasure to participate in this very important side event of the 36th FAO Regional Conference for Asia and the Pacific. Since 2019, under the umbrella of the UN Decade of Family Farming, FAO has been successfully assisting the development and implementation of a comprehensive and family farming-centered public policies to support a transition towards more sustainable agri-food systems for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life. In the last three years, approximately 185 policies, laws, and regulations were approved worldwide, promoting family farming-centered approaches to mitigate the impact of COVID-19, to address challenges in agri-food systems, and indeed, to support family farmers in achieving the huge potential that they have. In the decade, 
FAO has been working with thousands, literally thousands of stakeholders, including governments, parliamentarians, producer organizations, and civil society to design and implement contextualized frameworks of action, national action plans to support family farming. To date, we have 10 national action plans officially endorsed at ministerial level, including three in the Asia and Pacific region, in Nepal, Indonesia, and the Philippines. In this region, we're also looking forward to the finalization of the regional action plan for family farming in South Asia. This sub-regional plan demonstrates the important role that international and intergovernmental entities, such as the SARC Secretariat and the SARC Agriculture Center can play by giving clear orientations for national processes. I'm also pleased to announce a very recent result. Uh, so similar to the SARC Action Plan, uh, the Central American uh, Council of Agriculture, which is also an intergovernmental body of eight uh, countries, um, two weeks ago approved the Subregional Action Plan on Family Farming. Such intergovernmental platforms are instrumental in advancing family farming since they offer an inclusive space for multi-stakeholder policy dialogues and cooperation. They also provide a very relevant framework to foster experience sharing between member states and other stakeholders. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, there are very concrete linkages between the Family Farming Decades Reference Document, the Global Action Plan, and the new FAO Strategic Framework 2022-2031. First, pillar number one of the Global Action Plan, which is on developing an enabling policy environment to strengthen family farming, cuts across the programmatic areas of the FAO Strategic Framework and the overarching dimensions of governance, institutions, and human capital. The Decades Global Action Plan has two transversal pillars. Pillar two, which is support youth and ensure the generational sustainability of family farming. And pillar three, which is promote gender equity in family farming and the leadership role of rural women. FAO's strategic framework has analogous mechanisms to systematically mainstream these important cross-cutting dimensions in all of its activities and initiatives. With its action, with its national action plans, the decade provides an innovative mechanism that leverages already existing resources and capacities of FAO and of the different countries to catalyze and reinforce the work of a number of program priority areas at the country level. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, FAO stands ready to support actions for the implementation of the decade, working together with all of you to strengthen family farmers' capacities, roles, and contributions. This will go a long way in transforming agri-food systems to be more inclusive, healthy, resilient, and sustainable. I wish you all a very successful regional conference. Thank you very much. Over to you, Pierre. Thank you very much, Dr. Villarreal, for your intervention and for this great overview of key achievements of the UNDFF so far in the region and beyond. Uh, this is a strong encouragement to pursue our effort and to continue developing regional and national action plan, putting family farmers at the center. So now we would like to shed light on some of the results achieved over the past years from regional to local level. First, I would like to invite Dr. Mohamed Bokhtiar Hossein, Director of the Sark Agricultural Center in Dhaka, Bangladesh. He will present in particular the successful development process of the sub-regional action plan for family farming in South Asia. Dr. Hossein, you, the floor please, is yours. Please allow me to share. It's okay, we okay. are sharing on our side. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. You can start. Excellencies, yeah. excellencies, respected participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from SAC Agriculture Center, Bangladesh. SAC Agriculture Center, uh, before starting my talk, 
I would like to. It would be better if I, I yeah, yeah. Before starting my talk, I would like to share a few words about the Sarge Agriculture Center. The center starts its journey in 1988 uh, as Sark Agriculture Information Center. And in 2007, it renamed as Sark Agriculture Center. And over the years, the center has been worked as an ex as a center of excellence in South Asia. The overall goal of the center is to promote the agricultural research and development as well as technology dissemination initiatives for sustainable agricultural development and poverty elevation in the region. And there are six objectives and I am not going to read all the objectives here. Next, please. Now I am <clears throat> sharing today's topic, the development process of the regional action plan for family farming in South Asia. Next, please. Overall objective of the Regional Action Plan for Family Farming in South Asia, it aims at facilitating and accelerating the process of developing national action plan through inclusive multi-stakeholder process, not only putting family farmers at the center, but recognizing them as critical partners it provides contextualized regional priorities for each of the seven pillars of the global action plan for family farming. Next, please. And the critical role of intergovernmental organizations, the intergovernmental agencies like the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, are instrumental in advance seeing family farming since we offer the right platform to encourage multi-stakeholder and inclusive policy dialogue and cooperation. It also provides a very relevant framework to foster experience sharing between SARC member states and other stakeholders. Next, please. The importance of partnership and inclusivity. Under the relationship of SARC Agriculture Center, the Regional Action Plan for Family Farming in South Asia was developed in close collaboration and active participation of the Asia Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development, the International Cooperative Alliance Asia and the Pacific, and the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. This ensured a participatory and inclusive process engaging with all key stakeholders from the region. And a first virtual regional consultation meeting on even decade of family farming, formulating strategy and action plan to strengthen smallholder family farming in South Asia was organized in November 2020. And it gathers 150 participants and experts from SARC countries and with engaging all the efforts to make a national action plan for the UNDFM. Next, please. And here, this is the, some pictures of this uh, uh, expert consultation meeting. Next, please. And the importance of partnership and inclusivity. This initial regional consultation meeting marked an important step in elaborating jointly a draft regional action plan. It contributed at defining the key priorities, strategies, and actions to implement the UN DFF in South Asia. And this led to a first publication highlighting family farmers' constraints, challenges, opportunities, and government policies to contribute on attaining the targets of sustainable development goals at country and South Asian regional level. A follow-up consultation meeting was also organized on the 29th of July to July uh, 2021 to present, discuss, and validate this draft regional action plan. And uh, the book pub, uh, published uh, with the uh, cooperation with FAO and FAA by Sark Agriculture Center. Next, please. Plan for family farming in South Asia. Uh, sharing the regional action plan with the Sark member states 
through organizing consultation meeting, including parliamentarians for endorsement, sharing the final SAC regional action plan with the respective ministries through issuing note verbal and encouraging elaboration of national action plan on family farming by issuing note verbal from SAC secretariat, selection of country focal points and allow follow up meeting for operationalizing the regional action plan of family farming and finally organizing meeting at policy level among the SAC member states to discuss the priority policies on family farming. And with this, I conclude my, my talk. Uh, thank you everyone for your patient hearings. Over to uh, Perry, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Hossein, for your intervention and for sharing this great participatory, multi-stakeholder and inclusive process, which could inspire other similar regional initiatives in the future. Moving on, communication is a key element to advance family farming in the Asia-Pacific region and to support countries and stakeholders across the region in promoting the UNDFF and raising awareness about the key issues and challenges faced by family farmers, FAO supports the Comdev Asia initiative. It is facilitated by the College of Development Communication, University of Los Banos in the Philippines, and includes family farmers organizations like CIWA and AFA, and communication entities like Digital Green and Amark Asia. So we will now play a short video to present the Comdev Asia and highlight how it works. COMDEV Asia is a regional initiative that promotes communication for development, or COMDEV, in the Asia-Pacific region. It seeks to build COMDEV capacities and support rural communication policy and services. COMDEV Asia supports the implementation of a regional participatory communication plan within the framework of the United Nations Decade of Family Farming. It encourages participatory communication and the local appropriation of information and communication technologies to advance family farming. The COMDEV Asia Initiative is promoted by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, or FAO. Family farmers in the Asia-Pacific are the backbone of food systems and biodiversity management and conservation but they continue to face economic and social challenges due to emerging crises such as the COVID pandemic and climate change. To address these challenges, COMDEV Asia is geared to support resilient families along three priority activities identified in the UNDFF communication framework. These include participatory communication, inclusive rural communication services and policies, and enhanced communication capacities of farmers and producers' organizations. ComDev Asia includes a web platform, comdevasia.org. The platform intends to be a dynamic and interactive community of practice that facilitates dialogue, strengthens collaboration, and advocates for the role of communication in agriculture and rural development. It is an interactive hub, helping institutions and professionals in Asia-Pacific to connect, share lessons learned, document impact, explore new partnership opportunities, or strengthen existing alliances. On the ComDev Asia web platform, users can learn about regional experiences and good practices on family farming, rural communication services, enhanced communication capacities, and activities or events of ComDev Asia. Get news and updates on what's going on in ComDev in Asia Pacific in times of COVID-19 and beyond. Access useful resources and multimedia materials to support local initiatives and communication campaigns, such as UNDFF. Submit and share stories on resilient family farming and related topics. And interact with other members of the community. 
ComDev Asia is governance based on a steering committee that includes communication entities and networks, academic institutions, family farmers organizations, and the UN. It partners with the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Development, World Association of Community Radio Broadcasters, Digital Green, Self-Employed Women's Association, UP Los Banos College of Development Communication or UPLBCDC, and the Food and Agriculture Organization or FAO. ComDev Asia supports a network of communication practitioners from academia, government, non-government organizations, and regional or local community media, as well as a network of producers organizations with designated focal points who will contribute content to the web platform. CDA is being facilitated by UPLB-CDC. So now moving to the national level, I now invite Ms. Rose Ann Leonor, Officer in Charge, Chief of the Partnership and Accreditation Division of DAATI, Department of Agriculture of the Philippines, to present the Philippine Action Plan for Family Farming. So Ms. Rose Ann Leonor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Pierre. To our excellencies, partners in advocating for the transformation of farm families, good afternoon to all of us from the Philippines. Today, I will be presenting the inclusive process of the crafting of the Philippine Action Plan for Family Farming, or as we call it, the PATH 4FF, its overall goal and ongoing initiatives and plan of actions. Next, please. For the past three years, and even prior years, Philippines, through the different government agencies, non-government organizations, farmers and fisher folks organizations, civil society organizations, academia, among others, has been very active in promoting the well-being of farm families. In August of 2019, Secretary William Dorr, Philippine Department of Agriculture Secretary, issued a special order creating the National Committee for Family Farming and designating Agricultural Training Institute as a chair of the committee. Thus, the start of the national government agency-led crafting process of the 10-year path for FF following the inclusive, consultative, and participatory approaches. It should also be noted that during the prior years of 2019, several activities initiated and led by the Agriculture and Rural Development Knowledge and Policy Platform, or ARDKPP, was conducted for the Filipino family farmers. Next, please. During the initial steps of the crafting process of the path for ff a triangular approach was employed, a series of organized participatory and inclusive consultation sessions was conducted. Alongside these consultations, a review of related literatures and key informant interviews was also employed. To further reiterate the participatory approach, this slide also presents the number of agencies and institutions who participated and contributed in the crafting of the path for ff Three sectoral and one multi-sectoral national conferences and a multi-stakeholder right shops were conducted. Next, please. This picture was taken during the celebration of the Farmers and Fisher Folks Month culminating activity held last May of 2021. In this activity, the path for ff was formally signed and launched. Also, last July of 2021, another launching of the path for ff was undertaken, which was led by the ARDKP crew. Next slide, please. With these actions, the path for ffs overall goal is a resilient family farmers with zero hunger and poverty, sustainable agriculture, fishery, and forestry by 2020, characterized by improved productivity and competitiveness, secured land tenure, increased productivity of soil and water resources, food self-sufficiency, and well-being for all at all ages. This statement is also synonymous to reaching towards a state where no Filipino farmer is hungry, vulnerable, and dissatisfied. 
to achieve this overall goal, three strategic action pillars were identified. And these are the policy and program, people and partnerships. To further streamline the proposed efforts, the seven global pillars of the UN's decade of family farming was carried down. These pillars are also aligned with the DA's new thinking for agriculture, including the 1DA reform agenda. A spark, next slide, please. Next. As part of the ongoing initiatives and plan of actions, this is the path for ff 10-year campaign and implementation plan. This year, series of capability building and policy review efforts, advocacy campaigns, and knowledge exchange activities will be conducted. Also, a continuous series of multi-stakeholder consultation meetings will be conducted to further firm up the committee and its corresponding thematic action focus task forces. Further, one of the important deliverables is the conduct of the baseline study of family farmers, fishers, and upland dwellers in the country, which will be conducted this year with the help of our partners. The baseline study aims to establish a complete and comprehensive vision of the identified actions and know even more the current situation of the farm families, and from there, plan more definite actions to address and uplift them in their current situation. Next slide, please. From year 2024 to 2027, support to the creation of a digital agriculture infrastructure, monitoring and evaluation, mechanisms and feedback in sessions will be conducted. And as we wrap up the decade for family farming, year 2028 will be dedicated in the documentation of earnings and milestones promote and celebrate our successes and work towards sustaining the partnerships and programs. With this, we are very glad to be part of this momentous event. Thank you, Tol. Thank you very much, Ms. Rose and Leona for your intervention and for sharing the great achievement of the Philippines with such an inclusive and participatory process leading to a very comprehensive national action plan. So now staying in the Philippines, I would like to invite Ms. Esther Penunia, Secretary General of the Asia Farmer Association for Sustainable Rural Development, AFA in short, to share the engagement of farmers' organization of the UNDFF implementation at national, regional, and global level. Ms. Penunia, the floor is yours. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Pierre, and thank you for inviting us in this side event. Our first slide. Why are we strong? Uh, the second slide, please. Why are we strongly engaged in the UNDFF? AFA is a farmers, family farmers association. So our members are family farmers, and experience has showed that family farmers are key solution providers to achieve the SDGs and food systems. Second, we see UNDFF as an effective framework for rights-based multi-stakeholder processes in developing policies and programs to support family farming. And third, the advocacy for a UN declaration for family farming and the formulation of the Global Action Plan was largely a participatory process, which has involved us, and this participatory process gave us a strong sense of ownership and responsibility. Next slide, please. How are we engaging the UNDFF? First, at the global level, we are a member of the International Steering Committee of UNDFF, the Farmers Forum Processes of IFAD, and the Multilateral Funding Facility GAPSP. We are likewise a member of the coalitions on agroecology and family farming, which are results of the UNFSS processes. We are maximizing these platforms to get support for family farmer friendly policies and investments. At the regional level, AFA hopes to have a new MOU with FAURAP to strengthen partnerships. We have the following partnerships ongoing as well, FAO, SARC Agriculture Center, and International Cooperative Alliance Asia Pacific for the development of the UNDFF Regional Action Plan, which can accelerate the formulation of the national action plans in South Asia. With Comdev Asia to provide content to the platform 
and with World Rural Forum as its focal organization in Asia Pacific, coordinating and communicating with family farmers organizations and civil society in the region about UNDFF. But it is at the national level that you are most strongly engaged. Our partner FOs have initiated the formation of national committees on family farming in Indonesia, Philippines, Japan, Bangladesh, Nepal, India, Kyrgyzstan, and Fiji. We hope to have also in Cambodia, Laos, and Mongolia. We have participated in the formulation of national action plans in Indonesia, Nepal, Kyrgyzstan, and Philippines. The latter we regard as very good model of multi-stakeholder process with CSOs led by farmers' organizations as a key partner and co-driver together with the government. We have also developed case studies and materials on land rights, sustainable climate resilient agriculture, cooperatives, women empowerment, and youth engagement in agriculture. Also, we have conducted policy consultations and learning exchanges on UNDFF in partnership with FAO, IFAD, and WRF. Next slide, please. In conclusion, we see UNDFF implementation as part of our journey towards empowerment. Family farmers can and will provide solutions. Within the UNDFF framework, we ask FAO to make family farmers organizations and cooperatives your direct and equal partners. Invest in our agency's empowerment processes and together we will make a difference. Thank you and back to you, Pierre. Thank you very much, Ms. Benunia, for your intervention and for the important messages that you shared on behalf of farm organizations across the region. We cannot have uh, an event about the UNDFF without giving the voice to a farmer. So now we would like to play a video about an inspiring family farming story from Indonesia, highlighting that agricultural transformation starts in the backyard.
So we are now reaching the end of our side event about the UN decade of family farming, and I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I did. To conclude and to move forward, I would like to take the opportunity to share some of the upcoming activities planned across the region in the coming year. So maybe if I can have the PowerPoint. So at global and Asian level, okay, next one, please. Okay, at global and Asian level, first, we'll, uh, a, a global forum on UNDFF will be organized in September 2022, co-organized by the FAO and IFAD as uh, the UN Secretariat for the Decade, and with the aim to take, take stock of three years of implementation of the UNDFF to share and better understand successful experiences, main challenges faced in dealing with implementation in different contexts, and priority policy areas and key topics that emerge as priority to focus on for the next period of implementation. In order to prepare for this global forum and focusing on the Asia-Pacific region, we'll organize also a regional dialogue on family farming, likely in May or June 2022, and we'll inform further later on. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> in the framework of Comdev Asia, as uh, introduced earlier, a radio magazine and fact sheet on the status of the UNDFF in the Asia-Pacific region will be released very shortly, and a regional consultation and forum about rural communication services for family farming in Asia-Pacific will be organized with the support of Digital Green. You can find more information regarding these topics on the website of Comdev Asia. FAO will also continue to support countries in the process to develop a national action plan for family farming and will focus its effort on two, three specific countries yet to be determined during this year. Following its launch in December, in last December, the regional technical platform on family farming will also be further developed. This offers a place for all relevant stakeholders working in uh, rural development uh, to find innovative, innovative tools for exchange of experience and specialized knowledge on family farming. Next. Focusing on the Asia ASEAN region, uh, six case studies led by CIRCA and ASEADRA will be conducted about policies, strategies, in initiatives and programs successfully supporting family farming. Uh, the focus will be on Laos, Cambodia, Indonesia, Philippines and Thailand. They will complement four case studies that were developed uh, over the past two years by CIRCA and the China Academia, Academy of Agricultural Science in China, Indonesia, and Philipp Philippines, and Vietnam. This case study will be used for a regional modular training program on policy cycle for family farming, which will be first virtually pil pil piloted in the region. Next, please. Focusing on the SARC region, uh, very soon, we'll have a virtual consultation meeting on promoting healthy, sustainable and inclusive food system in response to COVID-19 in South Asia. This will be at the end of March, on 29th and 30th of March, co-organized with the SARC Agricultural Center, AFA and IFAD. And we strongly encourage you to join us for this uh, important event. Uh, additionally, as presented by Dr. Hossein, the Regional Action Plan for Family Farming in South Asia will be published very shortly, and we expect to have meeting with the SARC Secretariat for the SARC member state, including parliamentarian, in order to endorse and operationalize the action plan. Next. Lastly, focusing on the Pacific region, we'll have a survey on family farming in the Pacific, conducted in close collaboration with the Pacific Island Farmer Organization Network, PIFON, to better understand the role of family farmers in sustaining local food system. So as you can see, we have a well-packed agenda for the coming year, which will require strong multi-stakeholder and inclusive partnership. To conclude, on behalf of FAO, we would like to deeply thank all our distinguished speakers for their award and great collaboration, and the audience for being here with us on this occasion. So let us put family farmers at the center of our food system to lead us to the transformation we need toward a new, more inclusive and sustainable new normal for this decade and the one still to come. Thank you very much again, and we wish you a very good day. Now I will hand over the floor to uh, Mr. Sridhar for the next side event. Over to you, Sridhar. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. 
Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we do know we are delayed. Uh, we should have started actually 30 minutes ago. Uh, but as you can see, we've had a very intense morning of side events with many countries eager to contribute their experiences. So we thank you for your kind patience and we apologize for any inconvenience that this may have caused. We have one more side event. Uh, this is on the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022. So we will have that event now. And at 3 p.m., we will start the plenary session uh, and start with the next day uh, item on the agenda. So I thank you again for your patience. And it's over to you now, Susanna. Please finish by three o'clock Dhaka time. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sridhar. Distinguished guests, panelists, participants, good afternoon and welcome to this side event on the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022. The United Nations General Assembly has declared 2022 as the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. FAO is the lead agency for celebrating the year in collaboration with other relevant organizations and bodies of the United Nations system. We organized this side event with three objectives. First, raise awareness about the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022. Second, present highlights from ongoing initiatives in support of small scale fishers and fish farmers. And third, encourage member countries and partners to undertake concrete actions to support small scale fishers fish farmers, and fish workers toward sustainable and secure livelihoods. To set the mood for this side event, let us watch a short video, small in scale, big in value. I kindly request Devin to play the video. Our small actions can have big impact, like a ripple effect. Small-scale fishing and aquaculture can bring food to one family and provides healthy nutrition to millions more. It brings value to all. Small-scale fishers and fish farmers also know what it means to preserve the balance in our ecosystem. But our livelihoods are at risk. Now, more than ever, we need to be resilient, include us in decisions that affect us, and we will adapt and innovate with the changing tide. We may be small in scale, but our way of life will keep on making a difference and spread like ripples in the water. We hope you enjoyed the video. Let us now move on with our first speaker, and it is my honor to introduce Dr. Thawan Thanjai, Deputy Director General, Department of Fisheries of Thailand, who will talk about why IAFA 2022 is important. Dr. Thanjai, you have the floor. Thank you, Susanna. Good afternoon from Thailand. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, this year is the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. On behalf of Department of Fisheries, under the Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives, Thailand, I have a great honor to take part of the APRC side event in order to raise awareness and understanding about how artisanal fisher and aquaculture farmers contribute to sustainable development in the context of food security, poverty, alleviation, reduced income, inequality, and conserving environment. Thailand would like to express its gratitude to the United Nations General Assembly, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and other parties 
who are working together to celebrate Ayafa 2022. As we are well aware that aquatic animals from artisanal fishery contribute about 40% of total global capture production. According to FAO stat statistics, Asia and Pacific is the world's largest supplier of farm, of farm aquatic animals, accounting for more than 90% of the total global farm aquatic animal production. These farm aquatic animals are the primary source of protein for human cons consumption. Thailand consider the artisanal fisheries and aquaculture involved in the way of life in many aspects, as they are the source of income to support their families, which will help reduce income inequality. Additional fishery and aquaculture also reflect gender equality with the distribution of responsibility between men and women while assisting each other in, fishery, in fishing or cultivating, processing, and selling their fishery products. They also contribute to the sustainable ecosystem resulting from cooperation in sustainable use of local resources. Additional fishery and aquaculture are also key sources of protein production, which is one important component of food security. They play a, criti a critical role in ensuring the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Thailand has promoted and supported aquaculture project activities in communities such as the village fish pond development project, school fish pond for fish farming project, aquaculture training project to educate and support fish protein and nutrition in their family and communities. Therefore, Thailand has amended the Royal Ordinance for of Fisheries 2015 for artisanal fisheries and aquaculture to encourage them to establish community cooperation and participation. Finally, Thailand is pleased to join the celebration of the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022 by conducting a seminar to promote artisanal fisheries and aquaculture among the government and private sectors as well as stakeholders. The seminar will provide an opportunity for participants to discuss and share their experiences on artisanal fisheries and aquaculture. In conjunction with the seminar, an exhibition showcasing fisheries products produced from aquatic animal obtained from artisanal fisheries and aquaculture will be held in August 2022. And I would like to take this opportunity to invite you all to join us in celebrating the Ayafa 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thanjai, for your inspiring intervention. Now it is my privilege to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Tureka Temari, Director of Coastal Fisheries Division, Kiribati Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources Development who will be making an intervention through a video recording. Devin, please play the video. Good afternoon and good evening from Kiribati. I am Dora Katemeri and it is an honor to deliver a short intervention on behalf of the Pacific on why we should celebrate the International Year of Additional Fisheries and Agriculture, Yafa, for the Pacific this year in 2022. We have heard the great presentation from our friends in Asia and we from the Pacific are also importantly asked, why should we also celebrate the Alpha? In my humble view, we should also celebrate the Alpha in the Pacific, with the Pacific and for the Pacific. We as the people of the Pacific live in the largest ocean in the world, known to be the home 
to extensive, diverse coastal and nearshore fisheries areas and seafood resources. In fact, Pacific people's life evolve around these vital resources for our day-to-day -day livelihood. Although we are many small islands, we are indeed largest oceanic states and the ocean remains an integral part of the Pacific culture and heritage. For centuries, coastal fisheries and small-scale fisheries continue to play a critical role in food security and nutrition in sustaining our livelihoods and income generation. Majority of estimated contribution to, to the local population nutrition is mainly from coastal fisheries and small-scale aquaculture compared to offshore fisheries. The average consumption of fish per person is, is much larger than the global average and up to 50% of households in the Pacific depend heavily on small-scale fisheries for, for primary and secondary income. With the growing threats to coastal and nearshore fishing areas such as climate change, impacts and pollution, aquaculture will continue to importantly contribute to local food security and sustainable livelihoods in the Pacific. I wish to also share or highlight with, with you a few ongoing initiatives undertaken in the Pacific to ensure the sustainability of small-scale fisheries and aquaculture. There are many, but to name a few, in recognition of the important uh, role of local communities in, the, in this sector, the region is working towards the scaling up of community-based fisheries management program, which is all about empowering our small-scale fishers and farmers across different gender groups to take an active role in managing and caring for their resources. With the help of SBC, the Pacific Community, a CPFM framework has been developed. There are other regional programs in encouraging and strengthening sustainable fishing and aquaculture practices, such as through pro programs run through post harvest and value adding, development of national and regional policy and legal instruments advocacies during national and regional dialogues and meetings, risk planning, and COVID-19 response supports. We are pleased that the AFA celebrations in the Pacific will be coordinated with the support of the FAO Sub-Regional Office for the Pacific, the Pacific Community, SPC, and InfoFish. We look forward to working with our countries and other regional partners in this celebration. I also wish to share a few upcoming plans on the AFA celebration for the region that evolves around promoting awareness and advocacy for the small scale fishers and farmers, which include the Pacific Yafa Network. The Pacific Yafa launching virtual events, national Yafa events, and the Pacific Yafa awareness materials. Before I conclude, I would like to leave with you these two important take home messages Sustainable small scale fisheries and aquaculture means sustainable development and healthy lives. The voices and concerns of our fishers and farmers must be heard and addressed. I would like to call upon my fellow Pacific members, partners and everyone listening in to please join me in celebrating the International Year of Additional Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022 this year and to continue our dedicated efforts to secure sustainability of this important sector for many more generations to come. I thank you for your attention. 
come up and I bestow the kiddibas blessings of the Maori, health, the joy, peace, or the double moi, and prosperity to us all. Thanks to Ms. Temari for the encouraging intervention. We move on to the presentation by Ms. Nicole Franz, Fishery Planning Analyst at the FAO Fisheries and Aquaculture Division in Rome on the Illuminating Hidden Harvest Study. Nicole, you have the floor and Devin, please share Nicole's presentation. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, I will share some results of the Illuminating Hidden Harvest Study or as we call it, IHH. Next slide, please. The IHH study looks at the contributions of small-scale fisheries to sustainable development in line with the sustainable development goals and the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries. Next slide, please. We conducted 58 country and territory case studies. And as you can see here, a lot of them in Asia and in the Pacific. Next, please. In addition to the country case studies, we also used, next please, an ad hoc questionnaire on small scale fisheries, existing global and regional databases, and thematic studies to highlight issues that are difficult to quantify at the global level. Next, please. We tried to answer some questions, starting with how much fish comes from small scale fisheries. Next, please. We estimated that at least 40% of the global fisheries catch is from small scale fisheries. Next, please. Small scale fisheries account for 47% and for 31% of total catch in Asia and in the Pacific, respectively. In absolute terms, the production volume from small scale fisheries is the highest in Asia. Next, please. Almost 34% of catch in Asia is coming from inland fisheries, while it accounts for only 5% in the Pacific. Next, please. Now we look at the people behind this catch. Next, please. 60 million people are employed in small scale fisheries value chains, the bulk of them in Asia and the Pacific. Next, please. This accounts for 90% of all capture fisheries employment along the value chain. Next, please. An additional 43 million people engage in subsistent fishing or in, in uh, processing. Next, please. These 113 million people are estimated to have 30, uh, 379 million additional household members. Next, please. That means that almost 500 million people globally depend at least partially upon small scale fisheries for their livelihoods. Next, please. And in terms of economic value, the average annual total revenues of small scale fisheries were estimated to be 77 billion US dollars, 58 billion US dollars from marine small scale fisheries and 19 billion US dollars from inland small scale fisheries. Next, please. This places small scale fisheries among the largest industries in the ocean economy. Next, please. Now, how do women contribute to and benefit from small scale fisheries? Next, please. An estimated 45 million women participate in small scale fisheries globally. Next, please. This means that for every 10 people in small scale fisheries, four are women, either working for pay or fishing for home consumption. About half of them engage in post harvest activities. Let's now see how small scale fisheries contributes to nutrition. All fish provide diversity of nutrients, but there are differences. Here, you see the estimated potential contribution of a 100 gram portion from different species groups to the recommended intake for six nutrients for women of reproductive age. Small pelagic species have the best diversity of nutrients and are often the most available and affordable fish to rural populations. With these predicted nutrients values, we estimated regional nutrient yields of small scale fisheries catch expressed as number of people 
for whom small-scale fisheries catch could meet recommended nutrient intakes. Small-scale fisheries catch could provide 20% of the recommended daily intake across the four most abundant nutrients to, 700, uh, to 271 million women in Asia. Next, please. To maintain and build these critical nutrition functions of small-scale fisheries, they need to be considered in management approaches, and that needs, means we need to look at governance. We tried to understand the relevance of policies in terms of the catch such policies influence by looking at the amount of catch under co-management provisions. Next, please. For 55% of the global small scale fisheries catch, we estimated that for every 10 metrics ton of catch, four of them are formally co-managed. And two tons, experts, and for two tons, experts confirmed the perception of high participation of fishers. So for every 10 tons, there are four for which there's a formal co-management provision and two where implementation of these provisions is supposed to be really happening on the ground. Here you can see that the Pacific is really the co-management champion, but much more remains to be done to increase the participation of fishers globally. Now, this was only one example of many existing and possible connections that really illuminate the contributions of small-scale fisheries to sustainable development. Further exploring these connections will help reshape the narrative around small-scale fisheries and related policy recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole, for giving us a flavor of the findings of the Illuminating Hidden Harvest Study on small-scale fisheries. It is now my pleasure to call on Ms. Tiparat Pongtanapanich, Aquaculture Officer at the FAO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific in Bangkok, to tell us about the Regional Technical Aquaculture Platform. Tiparat, you have the floor, and Devin, please share Tiparat's presentation. Thank you, Susana. Thank you, everyone, for this opportunity to introduce Regional Technical Platform on Aquaculture uh, in support of aquaculture transformation. This is a new initiative of FAO. Next slide, please. Small-scale aquaculture by nature uh, uh, is a diversified of species and culture system, and also culture environment and scale of operation. Next. Um, the role of uh, small-scale aquaculture is significant. Global aquaculture accounted for 50 52% of fish for human consumption in 2018 and will, be, will provide nearly 60% in eight years time from now. Fish farming is not dominated by Asia, uh, which produce 89% of global total in volume terms and allow 20.5 million people were engaged in aquaculture in 2018. Therefore, in Asia, the majority of farms are still small, medium scale. And so the law, the law of SSA is significant. Next slide, please. In the challenge of small scale, small scale aquaculture has uh, in several ways. Uh, first, increasing demand on higher quality food, but no or low premium for small farmers to offset the ad additional costs. The SSA are small and fragmented in terms of area, so often inefficient and lack organization. Um, then the last, increasing competition with large scale operations who usually have better access to high technology, innovation, capital and market. Uh, but uh, small scale aquaculture are just small, but it doesn't mean that they, are, they cannot innovate and improve. Next, please. Now, what the main features of the platform. The platform aims to share innovation to improve efficiency and competitiveness, and uh, also uh, present the showcase of best practices 
to increase the quality and improve benefit for small scale aquaculture. Uh, the platform will also build network uh, uh, in order to pool the resources and improve the communication among the stakeholders. And the last uh, feature is to uh, create investment opportunity to improve synergy and improve the mutual gain among uh, people engaged in aquaculture. Next slide, please. So what would be the opportunity for small-scale aquaculture through the platform? First, improve access to knowledge, new technologies, and innovation to transform the sector for a more resilient business. Second, support countries on compliance to good aquaculture practices, guidelines, and standards. Third, facilitate the formation of small farmers' organization and linkages of actors across the value chain. Fourth, connect countries with the network for better communication, share experiences, and resource pool. Fifth, explore investment opportunity for strengthening the entrepreneurial capacity of SSA. FAO is looking to work with countries to explore opportunity, especially on chip aid. Please contact us. FAO. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tiparat, for giving us a glimpse of the Regional Technical Aquaculture Platform. Distinguished guests, panelists, and participants, thank you very much for being with us in this side event. We hope that we have inspired you to organize activities and events in support of the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022 and champion the cause of small scale fishers, fish farmers, and fish workers in your respective countries, localities, institutions, and organizations. Goodbye and over to you, Sridhar. Thank you, Susanna. And thank you to all those who participated in the intense side events that we saw this morning. Uh, they were very, very engaging and very fascinating. And I think we covered a whole range of issues as well as participation from countries right across the Asia and Pacific region, and which represented the membership of FAO in this region very well. So we thank you all and thank you all again to all the organizers of these side events. So distinguished delegates and the excellencies, distinguished delegates and ladies and gentlemen, so we will now start off the plenary session in a few minutes. I think anyone, if um, all the audience who have been on Zoom since morning, as well as others, if they need a short uh, hygiene break or a quick coffee or a quick drink of water, they can do that right now. And then we will, as soon, you will start off again in five minutes at um, 3.05 Dhaka time.
защото за мен не е да имаш една свята джан. Мястото са една дърска да не е много. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience uh, while, we were, while the side event was going on, but now we are all set and ready to proceed with the proceedings of the plenary session, which starts right away. Uh, already in the morning, we have read out all the logistical issues related to attending the Zoom meeting, as well as all the good practices. So we will not repeat them again, but just to assure you once again, that interpretation is available in Chinese, French, and Russian. And these are accessible in the interpretation button or the globe in the Zoom toolbar and through the equipment that is, um, that is here available in the plenary hall. <clears throat> and interventions again in, the in, the, in this session this afternoon will be on a first come first serve basis. So please raise your electronic hand on Zoom and we will also be watching the nameplates of the delegations who are present here in person. And the chair will then accordingly uh, call each country or each delegation to make sure that they get uh, their perspective in. So if there are any breaks in the meeting, which we do not expect, you even if you do step away, please stay connected to this Zoom link. You can also send any questions on technical issues to aprc36 at fao.org, which is an uh, email that is monitored constantly. Thank you for your collaboration and cooperation. And this afternoon, the Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we will now first take up agenda items 24 on the date and place of APRC 37, item 25 on any other matters. And finally, item 26, which is the adoption of the report of this senior officers meeting. I now pass the floor to the chair, the Honorable Mohammed Saeedul Aslam, sir, please. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back uh, to our day second uh, agenda item. Today we have to discuss about agenda item 24 and 25. The conference shall now take up agenda item 24, date and place of 37th session of the FA Regional Conference for Asia and the Pacific. As you are aware that the 37th session of the FA Regional Conference for Asia and the Pacific is scheduled to be held in the year 2024. It's give, it gives me great pleasure, therefore, to request the distinguished delegations to consider offering the venue and the proposals regarding the date and place for the next gathering of the ministers of agriculture from our region. I now invite the speaker on this topic of date and place of the 37th session of the FAO Regional Conference for Asia and the Pacific. The floor is now open for comments and discussions. Sri Lanka, raise their hand. I see Sri Lanka raise their hands. I recognize the hands of Sri Lanka. They have yes. offered, so the floor is for Sri Lanka. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Secretary. I wonder whether uh, my video is on. Is possible? No, it's not on. Not yet, Excellency. Okay, anyway, uh, I am an additional secretary uh, to the Minister of Agriculture. So I regret actually 
uh, not be able to participate physically even though i am uh, in the hotel now uh, and uh, once again thank you very much secretary for giving the opportunity and as this is the first time we are intervening uh, so let me thank the bangladesh for organizing this uh, event wonderfully and uh, uh, very well uh, uh, conference so uh, as you know uh, however tomorrow in the ministerial session we are expecting our honorable minister and so we will have a full intervention in the ministerial session so as you know sri lanka has almost all the favorable factors required in agriculture so agriculture is an important part of the socio economy of sri lanka and accounting about 70% of uh, gross domestic domestic products and 50.9% of the total exports and 25.3% uh, of the national labor force is engaged in the agriculture and also it covers the land area of 36% of the total land area therefore uh, so uh, our minister and the secretary of minister of agriculture has shown the keen interest to host the next uh, uh, aprc meeting uh, in 2024 so i propose that uh, uh, it should be a uh, you i propose that uh, other delegate support to hold this uh, next meeting in sri lanka uh, in 2024 thank you very much now i would like to know whether any other countries like to second sri lanka's proposal thank you thank you chair excellencies uh, distinguished delegates ladies and gentlemen the delegation of maldives Uh, supports sri lanka to be the host of the 37th session of the fao regional conference for asia and the pacific which is scheduled to be held in 2024 thank you thank you a uh, distinguished delegation from delegation of maldives uh, may i now uh, like to invite distinguished delegation of bangladesh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Bangladesh is supporting the proposal of Sri Lanka to be the host of 37th APRC. Thank you. Thank you. Distinguished delegation of India, it is your floor. You can make the intervention. Well, thank you very much, Chair. India supports uh, the proposal of. Uh, government of sri lanka for hosting 37th aprc thank you mr chair over to you thank you very much distinguished delegations may i now ask whether any delegation wish to make any further comments on this agenda item i see no other offerings no other comments therefore we thank sri lanka for its generous offer and look for the official confirmation of their offer in writing to the director general of fao therefore as there is no further comments we can conclude the agenda item 24 now we can move to agenda item 25 for deliberation of 25 any other matters it is about any other matters distinguished delegations from the member countries are can raise their hands or in person here or in digitally
distinguished delegation of Republic of Korea. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair. On behalf of the Republic of Korea and Korea for Service, I'm honored to take the floor and share the preparation status of the 15th World Forest Congress. The Congress is the world's largest gathering of the forest sector, and it is to be held under the theme, Building a Green, Healthy, and Resilient Future with Forest, on May 2nd to 6th in Seoul, Korea. The Congress will play a vital role as a venue to discuss comprehensive and cross-sectoral forest issues, including climate change, SDGs, circular, circular economy, and others. Uh, when it comes to the current quarantine measures of the Republic of Korea, I'm happy to inform you that all participants attending WFC in person are eligible to exempt from the mandatory quarantine. The official website will be updated uh, consistently to reflect the latest safety guidelines. Uh, so we welcome you to visit the website for more information. The 15th WFC Secretaries invites you to Korea and firmly believes that your participation will contribute to uh, creating a protective Congress. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, distinguished delegation of South Korea. Is there any other comments? I see no comments. Therefore, I now declare that the de deliberation on agenda item 25 is concluded. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we now will undertake the final day, final and the very important segment of the regional conference agenda item 26 the adoption of the report of the senior officers meeting. The relevant document is the draft report of the senior officials meeting prepared by drafting committee. The document and its translations of the report has been circulated to all distinguished delegates. In this respect, I would like to ask the reporter, Mr. Dr. Rajendra Mishra, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Agriculture, Federal Republic of Nepal, to present the draft report for your consideration. Dr. Rajendra Mishra, you have the floor, please. Okay. Uh, Honorable Chair, Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, now I would like to introduce the draft report of the senior officers meeting. Good afternoon. I am pleased to present the draft report of the senior officers meeting convened at 9, 8 to 9 March 2022 in a in hybrid format. The report of the senior officers meeting was developed based on the pre-draft of the regional conference report circulated to members on the 3rd March. This second draft was revised and updated during the SOM based on members' interventions and deliberations. The drafting committee was convened on the 8th March from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. and comprised of representatives of nine members. The drafting committee proceeded paragraph by paragraph and each paragraph was agreed by the consensus of the drafting committee. The third draft of the report Senior officers meeting is presented before you today for adoption and is the outcome of this in intensive but collaborative efforts. Now I'd, I would like to thank the member of the drafting committee for their hard work in finalizing this draft report and their support to me as the chair in this whole process. Thank you, chair. I sincerely thank Mr. Dr. Rajendra Mishra for his clear and concise presentation of the report of the senior officers meeting. I also express our gratitude to the members of the senior officers meeting for the hard work that they have done in the past two days in deliberating on the important issues identified for this conference. As I said, 
over the last two days. The senior officers meeting report was forced by consensus among the representatives of the ministries at the highest level. We have gone through an extensive and iterative process that commenced before the conference started. The draft senior officials meeting report from yesterday has already undergone intensive consultation and was agreed upon by the drafting committee on day one. Overall, about 43 countries joined the drafting committee. I don't know, can you give me the exact report of how many countries uh, they actually take part in drafting? By nine member countries joined the drafting committee. And I am informed that the members led the robust and intense discussion on conclusions and recommendations under each agenda item, especially the technical papers. Members would have noted that as chair, I made multiple requests for the de designation of focal points for calculation of the reports. The draft report in English and translations in Chinese, French, and Russians was then circulated after the proceedings on day one. Well advance of the start of session next day. All those who registered for the drafting committee, regardless of whether they are able to attend the committee meetings for the full duration or not, and the designated country focal points for circulation received the report. Therefore, the text before us reflects the consensus of members. As the meeting progressed, the reputier and FAO secretariat incorporated points from the real-time proceedings into the report. And drafting committee then ensured that these points are correct and accurately reflected the proceedings of the is day. Please note that the senior officials meeting report forms a substantial part of the full conference report and that will be adopted by the honorable ministers on day four. Your consensus is very important. I therefore propose that the senior officers meeting endorses this report en bloc by acclamation. Editorial changes and language corrections, if any, will be made by the secretariat before this posted on the website. If there are any comments at this point, the floor is now open. Distinguished delegation of Thailand, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Actually, I didn't uh, raise my hand, it just only uh, as you request uh, to to adopt the report by exclamation, and that's why I grab my hand. Okay, thank you. Thailand endorses this report. Any further comments or any further? I see hand raised by distinguished delegation of Nauru. The floor is yours. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> I just want to to seek um, some clarification um, um, for uh, late interventions. Um, uh, I assume that you know the the drafting committee met kind of um, yesterday and and finalized the um, the uh, the report for the meeting. Um, for any interventions that were provided. Um, uh, after after that, um, is there any way to in, in include those? Or um, I'm just asking this because I I did submit um, some uh, comments 
on, on, on some of the agenda items um, in the first session. Just seeking your clarification, um, Mr. Chair, thank you. Dr. Rajendra Mishra, do you have any comments? Uh, thank you, thank you for your uh, feedback. Uh, your points has been taken in consideration during uh, yesterday uh, discussion. Uh, thank you. Any other comments from distinguished delegations? I see consensus on the report and it is hereby adopted in block. I thank the reporter, members, and the drafting committee and distinguished delegates for your excellent collaboration. The senior officers meeting is now about to close. I now request Mr. Changjin Kim, Assistant Director General and FO Regional Representative to give his concluding remarks. Mr. Kim, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. We have had uh, nearly two full days of very useful discussions and uh, interventions. There has been very good and insightful dialogue, both among those here in this plenary hall in person and those participating virtually. And we now have an adopted report in consensus. I'm most grateful to the delegations who stayed late into the evening in the Pacific and the far eastern areas of this region. And to our drafting committee and the rapporteurs for their hard work yesterday evening. The report will be reviewed during the ministerial session over the next two days for the consideration of ministers and heads of delegations prior to the final adoption of the conference report. I would like to thank all the members for your very thoughtful interventions during the sessions and for those comments and the questions we received in advance in the members dialogue area of the conference website, which were very, very helpful for us. I would also like to thank FL Secretariat team here in Dhaka, including the presenters and the FAO technical officers who joined us from the FAO regional office in Bangkok. And of course, those who have been helping from home, uh, from Rome, particularly those in the conference service group and the interpreters and the colleagues who have been webcasting these proceedings live. Some of these colleagues are starting work at very early morning in Rome each day, as we have five hour time difference. Also thanks to the technical teams here in Dhaka that kept the show on the road and have to keep us all on track. And in particular to the senior officials and the staff from the government of Bangladesh as well as the colleagues from the FAO representation here in Dakar that made all this possible. This has been an extraordinary session and our first regional conference held in hybrid modality. Your interventions and the report of senior officials meetings will greatly inform the proceedings and the report for the ministerial session of the regional conference that will commence tomorrow. Again, thank you very much to all the participants. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kim. I invite all assembled delegates to show their appreciation to Mr. Kim by using the clapping hands. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, 
With your permission, I will now make some closing remarks before concluding the senior officials meeting. It has been an hour. It's been really it's a great honor and privilege for me to hold the chair and to the People's Republic of Bangladesh to host this meeting. In the two days, we have deliberated on several critical areas in agricultural development and heard the grave impact of the current COVID-19 pandemic on the agricultural, trade, economic, and natural resource management sectors. There are four technical papers, each on relevant and current issues. There was also discussions on FAO's multi-year program of work, MYPOW 2022 to 2025. We also have had the opportunity to discuss important concerns of this large and varied region under the agenda item 25, any other matters. Mr. Takeyuki Hagiwara, FAO Regional Program Leader for Asia and the Pacific, introduced the papers on the results and priorities of FAO activities in the region. Where, had the, where we heard of FAO's leveraging of technology, innovation, data, governance, human capital, and institution to operationalize the priority of leaving no one behind. We learned about the new FAO strategy on climate change and the update on the strategy on science and innovation. In the debates following the presentations, we noted that we are now faced with the challenge of how to eradicate hunger in the context of declining and deteriorating land and water resources, the adverse impact of climate change and the increasing occurrence of natural disasters and genocides. Sustainable agriculture and rural development are certainly the key to addressing these issues. Innovations and creative partnerships may be a large part of the way forward. I'm greatly impressed by the richness of comments and suggestions provided from, from the floor. The deliberations showed that there was great understanding and a strong belief among countries that many win-win situations would arise in collective actions, especially through regional cooperation and networking, resource mobilization and capacity building in addressing the poverty and hunger issues in the framework of sustainable development goals. The spirit of cooperation so characteristics of this forum has prevailed. We are able to come up, in my opinion, with a report of findings and recommendations that is insightful and far raising For this, I must thank distinguished delegates. Your wisdom, flexibility, and perseverance made my responsibilities as chairperson lighter and my tasks easier. In short, I thoroughly enjoyed my role as chairperson and take great pride in senior officer's report we have turned out. In this regard, credit must go to the drafting committee and the Rapporteur, Dr. Rajendra Mishra. I appreciate the good participation, consensus, and efficient drafting of the report. The Rapporteur and Drafting Committee work hard and resourcefully to craft the excellent report. Allow me also to thank the Secretariat, led by the FAO Assistant Director General, Deputy Regional Representatives, Mr. Jong Jin Kim, your competence and efficiency in organizing this meeting is outstanding. Your expertise in preparing the agenda papers and presenting them clearly truly reflects FAO's position as a knowledge organization in food and agriculture. I can say on behalf of the People's Republic of Bangladesh that it has been a valuable experience and we look forward to continue work with FAO. Furthermore, I would like to express my gratitude to the heads of the delegations of all regional members in attendance and for the assistance of all the vice chairs present here in conducting the procedure. I sincerely thank Dr. Mr. Dharmapuri for his all out support in conducting uh, these sessions. I sincerely thank 
the many people behind the scenes in the APRC National Committee in Bangladesh for their tireless work of preparation of this meeting. It is because they spent long hours organizing this conference that it ran as smoothly as it did. Thank you. I thank the interpreters for their tireless and excellent interpretation that has been fundamental to our successful communications. I wish you a productive and fruitful ministerial segment of the regional conference. The senior officers meeting of the 36 sessions of the FAO regional conference for Asia and the Pacific is now closed. Thank you. I now request the conference secretary to make any announcement. Mr. Secretary, you may take the floor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, Honorable Secretary of the Ministry of Agriculture for your kind words for everyone and for your leadership at this session, which has guided us to this outcome of having adopted the SOM report unanimously. So we thank everyone for the great work that they have done over the last two days. There are uh, two or three announcements that I want to make. So I beg your attention for a few more minutes. So as you all know, the ministerial segment of the regional conference will convene tomorrow here at the plenary venue. The director general of FAO will be here. He, he's already here in, uh, in the hotel and he will be here in attendance and uh, to deliver a statement at the ministerial segment. Uh, we will also have ministers from other countries and of course, the, His Excellency, the Honorable Dr. Mohamed Abdul Razak, who is the Minister of Agriculture of Bangladesh. So uh, there are a couple of announcements. First, for all the heads of delegations, especially all the ministers who are here or will be are expected here tomorrow, uh, we will have a photo session with the FAO Director General and we will announce the time. We are still determining based on everybody's arrival schedules as to what would be the best time and place to do it, but we will let you know. So please inform your delegation, your, your minister, that this time uh, we will communicate directly with each of you on the time and place of the photo with the FAO Director General. Uh, second, to the, this evening, uh, the, the government of Bangladesh has very graciously organized a cultural event and dinner at the Bongabandhu uh, International Convention Center, which is a short drive away. Guests, all those, all delegates, uh, all in-person delegates and everyone has been cordially invited to this event. Vehicles are arranged, so you do not need to make any arrangements yourself. You're all requested to be at the main entrance of the Hotel Intercontinental at 6.30 p.m. today. So you have about three hours, so I think that's plenty to get ready for that. So 6.30 p.m. today, there will be vehicles leaving from the main entrance to go to the BICC for the cultural event and dinner, and you're all being invited by the government of Bangladesh. The third announcement will be about the inaugural ceremony, which will take place tomorrow, 10th March, at the Bongabandhu International Convention Center, the same venue where we have the event today. So tomorrow morning, there will be again be transport arranged from outside the hotel at the entrance, and you can um, take these vehicles starting from 8.30 a.m. 8 to 8.30 a.m. These vehicles will be available at the entrance. You can go with them to the BICC. Now, uh, ministers and delegations will be assigned to a numbered car that you will use to go and return from the BICC, the venue for the inaugural ceremony. From 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., the Honorable Minister of Agriculture of Bangladesh, Dr. Mohammad Abdul Razak, will lead the ministers and the director general of FAO through exhibits that showcase achievements, innovations, and technologies in Bangladesh. And the inaugural ceremony itself will start at 10 a.m. Dhaka time. The host government the will also organize 
uh, on this occasion, we will of course hear from Her Excellency, the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Madam Sheikh Hasina Wajid, and on that occasion, and you will also hear from the FAO Director General. The departure from the BICC will start at 10.40 a.m. So again, just to recap, we start the program, we leave at eight by between 8 and 8.30 a.m. The program starts at 10, and by 10.40, the same car which you went to, to BICC will bring you back here at the plenary. Following the inaugural ceremony, the ministerial segment will convene promptly upon return of all the in-person delegates here to this venue. During the ministerial session for heads of delegation, which is the ministers, we will capture your intervention on camera and it will form part of the overall APRC group photo which means that we will make sure that everyone, all heads of delegation, all ministers who are on Zoom online will all be included in the group photograph. If you have any questions, the members of the APRC secretariat will be happy to assist. Please contact us by email. You know the address, it's aprc36 at fao.org. We are constantly monitoring this email. So, I take this opportunity to thank each of you on behalf of the APRC Secretariat for your attendance and your participation and your cooperation and collaboration. Uh, we all know we live in the times of the pandemic, so we all had to follow many rules and restrictions to ensure that we have a safe and healthy event. And we thank you all for your understanding in this regard. Thank you and have a great evening. And we will again meet tomorrow at the ministerial session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you.